Recording in progress. Uh, good morning, everyone. I won't take much time. Uh, uh, welcome to the uh, session on uh, uh, psychiatry. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to this uh, pre-intern training session. Today is for the, we have allocated for College of Psychiatrists. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kishan Abhayvardhan, who is the president of the College of Psychiatrists, and the secretary, Dr. Chamara Vijay Singh, uh, both of them and the members of College of Psychiatry and the Psychiatry and Resource Personnel who are uh, doing this training program. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to coordinate with uh, the Directorate of Medical Services uh, for the Directorate of Medical Services. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I would like to welcome all the participants. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention that uh, with uh, each professional college, we are going to have some uh, MCQs uh, as a part of training evaluation. So those who are successfully completing the those uh, set of MCQs will be awarded a certificate signed by the Ministry of Health as completion of the pre-intern training program. So I would like to tell all the participants, pre-intern doctors, uh, to uh, actively participate in these sessions so that you can get this certificate. Uh, at the same time, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Roshan for organizing these tasks. Uh, he's uh, doing enormous coordinating and uh, organizing these lectures. At the same time, the Technomedics uh, for giving us this uh, Zoom link. Uh, we had to accommodate actually more than 1,000 uh, in this instance. Without their kind sponsorship, we wouldn't have uh, been able to get the uh, this uh, enhanced Zoom link for maximize the uh, participation. Uh, then uh, uh, at the same time, uh, finally, I would like to thank all the uh, our two DDGs who is uh, guiding us to this event, uh, uh, Dr. Lal Panapati and Dr. G. V. J. Surya. Uh, also, uh, uh, so. Uh, Th that is the few messages I just want to deliver you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. And I would like to hand over, yeah, hand over this uh, forum to Dr. Gihan Nabevardhana, President, uh, College of Psychiatrists. Uh, uh, secretary. Uh, to the Chamar who is the uh, secretary to the, of the College of Psychiatrists, that he will. Uh, carry on from this uh, onwards. Thank you very much to all the resource person. Great. Uh, thank you very much, sir, and thank you uh, the Ministry of Health for organizing this very important session. Uh, first of all, to the all the pre-interns, congratulations. Uh, you have come a long way in your careers, and you have done really well to come to this uh, place. I'm sure uh, I certainly, when I was a medical student, when I was struggling with anatomy or during the final year exams, I didn't think I would make it. And you all also might have felt that you all would never uh, become to this place and almost become a uh, start internship. So you've done really well, come through a very difficult system. So all of you all are very capable and talented individuals and about to embark on a long and successful career. Uh, we are well aware that psychiatry is not an internship subject. Uh, and don't worry, we are not going to teach you psychiatry today. Uh, the topic selected today actually have been selected by physicians, consultant physicians, consultants and surgeons, uh, BOGs and pediatricians on what they felt was needed by their interns to successfully help their units and help their patients. These are very important areas. If you look at the topics, it's suicidal risk assessment, delirium, substance misuse, counseling patients, how psychiatric problems in a pediatric ward, uh, psychiatric issues in a uh, genobs ward, 
uh, emergencies and liaison when to refer. So please uh, listen to it carefully. If you all have any questions, type on the chat and I will take them. We will start off with possibly the most important thing which every doctor should know, how to do a suicidal risk assessment. And I will hand you over to the consultant psychiatrist of National Hospital Kandy, Dr. Gihan Abevardhana, who is also the president of the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists. All the best. Over to you, Gihan. Chamara, sir, you might have to stop sharing. I think then uh, have to get. Yes. Yeah. All right. Hi, Gihan. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, you can start, Gihan. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? No. Can you hear can, me? Can hear and can see the screen, Gihan. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, right. Thanks. Might have to make the screen full screen, I suppose. Can you hear me now? Yes, Gihan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chamar Vijay Singh and the medical services uh, for giving me this opportunity. I think it's a very uh, important topic that uh, all doctors should be aware of um, because of the high prevalence of suicide in Sri Lanka and the fact that it's not the psychiatrist who comes across this kind of patients, um, the first contact is usually the physician, the emergency physician in the ETU or the physicians at the medical wards or sometimes even the surgeon or the gynecologist. So um, as house officers, it's a very important task or skill that all of you all should master during your internship. Um, I'm sure most of the time, I mean, most of you all may be already aware of this and quite familiar with the suicide risk assessment. So uh, all the doctors, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, where we deal with, um, do deliberate self, have this skill or master this skill of uh, what to do when you come across with a uh, patient who has attempted to commit suicide, what to do, when to refer to a psychiatrist. And these are very important areas that we need to discuss today. Okay, so um, let's quickly go through uh, what is uh, suicide and you all know that there are two terms when we talk about um, harming yourself one is dsh or deliberate self-harm the other one is suicide and the most important thing is uh, a suicidal act is an act that is deliberately initiated and done by somebody uh, with the expectation that he will die he or she will die and most of the uh, completed suicides are being planned prior um, to the attempt and most of the time the important thing is that in most of the cases a warning sign is given so it's very important to be vigilant 
and take it seriously when a patient says that he or she wants to commit suicide. So it's, um, it's quite prevalent. It's the second most common cause of death in men aged uh, 15 to 44 years. And about 1 million people commit suicide each year all over the world and 15 times more people. So it's all, uh, 10 to 15 million people attempt suicide every year. So that is as common as that. And uh, you all may be already aware that uh, it's more men who, although three times more women attempt to commit suicide, it's three times more men than women actually complete the suicide. So, um, and we see that uh, mainly high rates are seen in the elderly and who are unmarried uh, and unemployed and among the prisoners. So, um, you may be already, I don't know whether you're aware that it has been it's the leading cause of death among medical students all over the world. So, so you're lucky that you have passed that time now. You're not anymore a medical student. So, so this is quite an old slide, um, uh, 2002, about the suicide rates in the world. So I'm uh, giving you old slides as well because... Um, in red, it shows uh, the rate of suicide in Sri Lanka or all over the world. Um, the countries with high suicide rates in a percentage, but one in 100,000. So among, if you take one lakh of people in a, or 100,000 people in the general population, how many people do commit suicide each year? So it's more than 13 is considered as a high suicide rate. So Sri Lanka is the only Southeast Asian country in 2002 which had a high suicide rate, which as a nation, probably that we should be ashamed of this fact. And uh, this is 2008. Again, the colors have changed, but still yellow means more than 13. And Sri Lanka stands out as the only, the pearl in the Indian Ocean with a high suicide rate. And um, Australia has become better than us. Uh, but still Russia and China are with us. And again, this is 2015. Now, earlier we didn't have much data for Africa. So, um, but now we have data for Africa and even African countries are better than us. But uh, India has become friends with us. Now they are also having a high suicide rate and Russia still remains high with a few African countries only. So, uh, and this is the latest that I could find. Uh, Sri Lanka is a bit better here, where they have some um, Iceland with the highest suicide rate in the world. Okay, so um, so fortunately, although we say that Sri Lanka has a very high suicide rate, fortunately the suicide rate is coming down. So um, the these three slides, the total male and female together is on the top. So the suicide rate in the country is coming down. Um, and um, this is a very important slide. Um, where the, the uh, now the trends of suicide in Sri Lanka, uh, it was earlier, hanging was quite high uh, in prevalence. And uh, then towards after 1975, uh, the main mode of suicide in Sri Lanka became pesticide and weedicide poisoning. So in 1996, Sri Lanka recorded the highest suicide rate in the world. So 46 per 100,000 people died of suicide in Sri Lanka in 1996. Where that is the year that we got the World Cup cricket in cricket. So, um, but then uh, the president at that time, uh, Mrs. Chandrika Kumartunga, appointed a special presidential task force to combat suicide in Sri Lanka. And this task force recommended so many very important recommendations in um, 1996. And you can say that um, after the recommendations were implemented, how the suicide rate in Sri Lanka has drastically come down by means of um, pesticides and insecticide poisoning. So they banned most of the lethal um, pesticides like Paracot, Paratheon, um, and reduce the lethality of most of the other pesticides and weedicides and um, implemented a law that nobody under 18 years of age um, can purchase pesticides from a store. 
So uh, although all these recommendations are, or rules and regulations are not implemented, but it made a huge impact of um, getting down the suicide rate in the country. Uh, but you may see that uh, the trend is changing again a bit. Now, hanging has become again quite common, unfortunately. And um, so people who are the, the doctors who are going to be surgical house officers, you may find um, come across quite a lot of people uh, who come after hanging attempts who get admitted to uh, surgical wards rather than medical wards. So... Uh, this, I think I already mentioned, about 1 million people commit suicide and more than about 15 million people attempt suicide and the people who are affected by suicide. The whole families are affected. It's almost around 50 to 120 million people in the world. So these are the causes of suicide. We will not go through all of them. Um, so social factors, psychiatric and medical factors, biological and psychological. And this is a very important statement, although it's quite an old statement, 1974. The large majority of those who die of suicide have some form of mental disorder at the time of death. So that's a very important thing to bear in mind, out of which about almost half can be personal disorders, about 15% can be attributed to mood disorders, 7% to schizophrenia, and alcohol and substance misuse, 7 so this slide shows very clearly that uh, this is not uh, Sri Lankan statistics, but uh, world in general. So uh, mood disorders is the main culprit or 35.8% of people with mood disorders do commit suicide or can commit suicide. Substance, 22%, schizophrenia, 10 and personal disorders, 11, just above 11% and all the other disorders, uh, not so much. Uh, yeah, we'll skip this. Um, so there's a strong association between suicidal behavior and impulsivity and aggression. And we know that uh, people with suicidal behavior have, have uh, low levels of serotonin in their uh, central nervous system and uh, genetic factors also can be responsible for suicide. Yeah, and these are the protective factors that we all know of, the strong family support, having uh, dependent children, strong religious beliefs against suicide, and cultural sanctions. Again, a slide probably that uh, as Sri Lankans, we should be a bit unhappy about, uh, the religion, and countries, I mean, uh, the atheists who don't believe in any religion have high suicide rates. Um, now, the total is the yellow bar, not the yellow bar, so the orange bar, sorry. And uh, according to the religions, Buddhists are the people who commit suicide more than the other religions. So, Muslims, uh, Islamic uh, faith, Hardly any suicides at all, which is great. And these are the risk factors for suicide. So in, um, in short, being a white old male is a risk factor. So being a widow, having poor, Ill, um, uh, having ill health, and not having much of social support, and having antisocial and impassive traits can lead to suicide. And it's a very important thing to ask from all your patients whom, whom you come across when you work as house officers in medical or surgical wards. Just get into the habit of asking about um, childhood sexual abuse, which may be, which may have gone, um, which may have not been addressed at all for a long period of time. And uh, when you have a history of childhood sexual abuse, as a child, if you are sexually abused, the odds of a sexually abused patient attempting suicide when he or she is an adult is 10 times more than a non-sexually abused person. So it's a very important thing to ask when you come across a person who has attempted to commit suicide. And this is a very, the, the first statement is a very important uh, one, uh, the, the best predictor of future suicidal attempts is having a psychiatric disorder and a previous history of suicidal attempts. So if a person is 
already on treatment or having a psychiatric disorder and if that person has attempted to commit suicide in the past the likelihood of him or her attempting suicide again is high so those are the best predictors of future suicide attempts and um, the greatest risk is during the first week after hospital admission so after a person comes to your hospital after an attempt during the first week of uh, inpatient stay the, the chances of him attempting again is very high so you have to be very vigilant and um, tell your nurses to be on the lookout or give him a bed that is um, visible to the nursing station and uh, be vigilant whether he will do it again in the ward and uh, the other thing is that the first month after getting discharge also because we don't we permit to discharge sometimes before the patients get completely cured and um, so again uh, about suicide in sri lanka now you may see that there's a drastic um, increase in the suicide rates in sri lanka after 1980 and luckily in after 2000 or 1986 and 2000 then it's gradually coming down now and uh, as i mentioned in the in an earlier slide now um, you can see the method of suicide in sri lanka yes um, 80% the main reason for suicide uh, that's in sri lanka in 1995 was self poison but in 2016 it has changed come down to 29% and hanging has become the main method of committing suicide in sri lanka unfortunately so uh, so that's why it says that the so this was a study done by the university of bristol in collaboration with sri lanka and uh, this last statement uh, states historically the main method of suicide in sri lanka was by pesticide poisoning now the most common method is hanging so as i told you uh, uh, we have we recorded a very high suicide rate in 1996 and we set a world record in 1980 as having the, no now we have to be happy that although we set a world record in 1996 as the country with the highest suicide rate now it, we are lucky that uh, it has come down now it's we it said that we are in the fourth place and some statistics say that we are way down in the 30th place but uh, we think it's we are in the fourth place now but we set another world record in 1980 as having the highest female suicide rate in the world and this is probably the only world record that we still hold on to we still have the highest female suicide rate in the world and um, we have recorded more deaths by suicide in the last 15 years of the of the civil war that we had we had a war going on for 30 years and all are talking about how many lives that we lost during the war but we have lost more lives to suicide than due to the ltt or the whatever the ethnic conflict that we had so that's as bad as that but nobody talks about how many people we lost due to suicide but all are so concerned about the war victims so this is the slide that i talked to you about this is 2008 um the top female suicide rates in the world sri lanka has the highest 16.8 yeah so uh, causes of suicide in sri lanka it's quite a lot of causes as you know poverty unemployment social deprivation and it's sometimes unfortunately it's one uh, mode i mean one main cause of suicide in sri lanka can be just learned helplessness and cry for help having no other means to solve their problems and going to the easy resort of committing suicide and so in other words escaping from an intolerable situation and uh, having a low value for life probably is a problem in the southeast asian part of the world and um, social learning of suicide as a means to solve problems and another very important thing i would like to highlight here the the fictional reporting of suicide by sri lankan public media and uh, glamorizing suicide making it a hot news and uh, 
sensationalizing and glamorizing suicide by a public media like the papers or the sometimes the TV channels depicting in cartoons and showing how they committed suicide as if it's a heroic act and which can lead to copycat suicide, especially in the youth. Okay, so the most important thing that we need to talk about today is how to assess the suicide risk. Now, when your house officers in medical, surgical, gynecology wards, um, now pediatrics, they have increased the rate from the age to 16. And uh, so quite a lot of uh, the children also can be uh, admitted to pediatric wards. So the, these are the three main suicidal risk assessment tools that we have. Uh, the sad person's suicide scale, which is not a very good scale. It's mainly for the primary healthcare staff, not for the doctors. Uh, it's uh, it's a filtering uh, tool which can be uh, used in the community, like to find out out in the community the people with the high suicidal intention. But the most important thing that I would like to stress here. Or mainly highlight uh, during my discussion today is the second ball of you as house officers should be aware of and should be uh, familiar with and have the skills to do it within about five to seven minutes you can complete that and come to a, an agreement this led to the clinic or whether straight away after the medical or surgical problem is sorted out to send to the psychiatry ward for inpatient psychiatric care okay so uh, for the the sake of completeness, we'll go through the sad persons, which I told was not a very good scale. Uh, you just uh, write the first letters of sad, I mean, persons. And then if the if the age is, um, if you are a male, uh, you get one point. Uh, if you're younger than 19 or older than 45, you get one point. If you are depressed, you get one point. And if you had previously attempted, if you're using alcohol, if you have hallucinations or delusions, which means that you have a rational thinking loss. And if your social skills are lacking, and if you have an organized plan of committing suicide, not having a spouse, and um, suffering from a chronic debilitating illness, all of these causes, um, reasons may give you one point each. So there are 10 questions to ask. And if the candidates or the people um, you score more than five, then you have to take it uh, seriously and refer for further assessment and care. So it's a filtering uh, rating scale, which can be used out in the community. Why I told it's not a good um, scale uh, is because now, as we are giving this to the primary health care staff, like the nurses, um, midwives or public health inspectors, um, we can't expect them to uh, detect depression and the R, rational thinking loss in the community. So it's a, it's a specialized skill to detect depression and to elicit hallucinations and delusions or in other words, rational thinking loss. So that's why the, because of these two, it's, a not, it's not the best of scales that we have. But now they have modified this. Uh, it's called the modified sad person scale. Uh, where sex and age remains the same. D, because of the fact that people find it difficult to detect depression in the community, they have added hopelessness, which is easy to detect or ask from clients, uh, which they have increased the point to two. And, uh, and P, the previous suicidal attempts or psychiatric care. So if you're on the treatment for a psychiatric illness, again, that has been added. And R remains the same. And they have taken out the chronic sickness altogether and added another one instead of that as stated future intent. Now you have done it once, you think of doing it again. Um, that has been added and given two points. So this is the modified sad person skills. And according to the score that you get from the scale, as I told you earlier, if you score more than five, if the client uh, scores more than seven, then you have to commit even against the will of the patient to get him admitted and uh, having inpatient psychiatric care. So what I wanted to uh, highlight today is not the sad persons, but this one, um, the Beck suicidal intent scale. 
Okay, so um, um, can you hear me now? I, I don't know whether uh, can hear you, Gyan. Okay, all right. So, so this is uh, um, this is the most important thing um, that I wanted to um, highlight as house officers in medical, surgical, and other wards. When a person comes to a ward after attempting suicide, let's take an example of the, uh, an 18 years old A-level student, female, uh, taking 25 tablets of paracetamol and coming to hospital. So what to do if you are a doctor in the emergency tree, let's say, now quickly because of the high turnover of patients and high workload that you have in a medical world, you have to quickly do an assessment and come to a decision to tell the physician what to do with this patient. Can we send him home, her home, or uh, do we send her to the psychiatric clinic after discharge or straight away refer to the psychiatrist because of the high suicide limitation? So this is a very good rating scale um, that uh, we can administer within a few minutes of time. Uh, to assess the suicidal intention of that patient for that particular act. Now, this is one setback in this scale. Now, in the sad person's earlier scale, we could uh, look at the holistic picture where we can uh, assess the suicidal risk uh, and ask about the risk factors like uh, previous attempts and taking alcohol and all that. But here, in this scale, we are assessing only the current suicidal attempt, what was the intention, whether it was mild, moderate, or severe. So you divide this current suicidal attempt into three parts. First one is before the act, second one is act per se, and the third one is after the act. So before the act, we have asked three questions. Very quickly, you can get into the habit or develop the skill of asking this question. Have you planned this act in advance? Was there any prior planning? If that was there, you give one point. Did you leave a suicidal note? So suicidal note does not mean that you have to have a piece of paper and in pen that you have to write. Uh, you can give that one point even if the patient had uh, sent a message, Twitter or Facebook or SMS telling that uh, he or she is trying to want to commit suicide or at least verbally telling somebody that I want to commit suicide. That also is taken as a suicidal note. And the, if the patient has done any final acts in preparation of committing suicide, like writing the last will or settling your loans, debts, or saying goodbye to your loved one. So all those are taken as final acts. So these are the three questions that we have to ask quickly, whether there was any prior planning. So in this case, she has taken 25 tablets of paracetamol. How did you get that? Whether she bought it from the pharmacy and kept it? and whether she hid it before taking so that other people not will not find it. So all those are prior planning and telling somebody and uh, doing any final acts before the suicidal attempt. Then you come to the act per se and ask these three important questions, whether she was alone at the time of the overdose. And the second one, whether, the in, whether it, she took precautions so that the interventions were unlikely that uh, now let's say that her parents are both teachers and she has a brother. So she would uh, make it a point when the two parents are not at home, they're at school and the brother is also at school. So they are coming back home at about 2.30. So she will select a time at about 12 to take it so that nobody will be there and interventions will be unlikely. And the third one is whether she took any active precautions so that she will not be found after taking an overdose, whether she locked her room and whether she disconnected the phone, the land phone, and uh, or if she's uh, from, let's say, if she's from Kandy, whether she went to Anuradhapur and took an overdose and went into the jungle so that nobody will find her. So all those are active precautions against discovery so that nobody will find her after taking an overdose. And the last one, after the act, there are four questions to ask, whether she sought help after taking paracetamol. Now, if this girl of 18 years old uh, of age, uh, if she took an overdose of 25 tablets of paracetamol and quickly called her boyfriend and told, darling, please, um, I took 25 tablets of paracetamol. Please take 
me to hospital by ambulance, that is not a serious suicide attempt. That is just attention seeking behavior. So you don't get, she doesn't get one point there. But if after taking paracetamol, if the, her, her mother found out that she's vomiting, and when the mother comes and asks, why are you vomiting? If the girl says that, no, 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 just don't worry about it. I'm just having a headache. When I have a headache, I have vomiting. And then they didn't uh, seek help at all. Then that's a serious thing. And she scores one point there. And the next question to ask is whether, why she took that overdose. So not all people who take overdoses or pesticides do want to die. Some may be just taking it just to attract the attention or just because of impulsivity. So whether they wanted to die and whether the intention was there is also important to ask. And the third one, believe the act would result in death. That's a very important question to ask. Um, why did you uh, select 25, number 20, I mean, 25 tablets of paracetamol? Then the, she will say that I went online and find, found out that the lethal dose of paracetamol is 20. So to be on the safe side, I took five extra. So then it's a serious thing because she believed that taking 25 tablets of paracetamol will actually result in death. Or even if a small boy, let's say a boy of 10 years, uh, took 10 tablets of paracetamol and thought that uh, it will uh, kill him. That also should be taken seriously because uh, he was not aware and he thought that taking 10 tablets will uh, kill him. So the last question to ask is uh, regretting its failure. Now you have tried to commit suicide once. Do you, are you happy about it that your life was saved or would you have preferred to be dead? So if they regret the failure and say that uh, it's in vain that you saved my life, I would have been better off dead, then she scores one point. So these are the 10 questions that we have to ask very quickly. So I will repeat it. Uh, just divide the particular act into three parts. Before the act, the act per se, and after the act. Before the act, asked three questions whether there were prior planning involved. The act per se, whether she was alone, whether the interventions were unlikely so that she will be found, or whether she took active precautions so that she will not be found after taking an overdose or pesticides. And after the act, um, you ask four questions. Did she seek help? Did she want to die? Did she believe that taking 25 tablets of paracetamol will kill her? And whether she regrets the fact that she is alive now. Okay, so um, coming to the last uh, few slides. Um, now, when you come across a, a patient who has attempted suicide in your ward, in the medical or surgical ward, it's very important as a house officers that you master the skill of not being judgmental. And uh, we find that now, uh, when we have become, when we were house officers, um, we have come across so many people who have attempted suicide, who are so frustrated and so unhappy that they ended up in the medical wards because um, they get blamed by all the staff in the ward, starting from the minor staff or the attendant, then by the nurses, then by the doctors, then by the consultant. And uh, it's worse than um, being at home or worse than dying that uh, you have a prolonged agony when you come to the medical wards because you get blamed right, left and corner. So it's it's a very sad thing that happens in um, some other hospitals or most of the hospitals in Sri Lanka. So it's very important that uh, you should not be judgmental and uh, you should be kind to them and talk to them in an empathic manner. So validate the, now it's very important uh, that you, as I told you earlier, empathize in the patient, with the patient. And um, now when you are asking about suicide, now this may not apply to patients who have already come after suicide attempts, but when you come across a patient whom you think may have suicidal ideas, but who is not coming out with suicidal ideas or not, not, not opening up, 
it's uh, this is a good way of uh, getting it out or eliciting suicidal ideas like normalizing so making the patient at ease to come out with suicidal ideas with the doctors so it's always better to normalize it and say that now when someone feels really upset and frustrated they may have thoughts that life is just not worth living anymore so have you had any thoughts that you didn't want to go on without mentioning the word suicide or cdv nasaga anima you can say that when people are really stressed sometimes they feel so frustrated with their lives and they feel that they can't just go on so now you have gone through a lot of problems in your life have you ever had thoughts that you didn't just didn't want to go on so then the person may think that this is some, not something really bad that the doctor is asking then he or she may be a bit more comfortable in coming out with suicidal ideas uh, with you and uh, on a scale of 1 to 10 how strong is your desire to kill yourself may give you the intention um, and the patients may feel a bit more easy to come out with questions of this sort and uh, what would it uh, take to move you one point point down the scale and is there anything that would stop you from killing yourself and the last question you may laugh at this question uh, but it's a very important question that psychiatrists usually ask from all their clients who have attempted suicide if you were to die what would your funeral be like so this is although you may think that this is an odd silly question to ask that's why i told that you may laugh at this question but it gives us a lot of information about the the thinking pattern of the patient and how long contemplating on suicide so i usually ask this question from most of my clients and we get a lot of information from that um because the patients will say that um, uh, yes i thought of commit uh, thought, thought thought of committing suicide and even i thought of how my funeral will be like and then what prevented you from that and uh, how how strong did that they have uh, planned their act of suicide so this question or this answer to this question will give us a lot of information all right so um, we will uh, quickly go through the last slides um, so to uh, there is primary suicide prevention as well as uh, secondary which is not very important at this moment i think and uh, secondary is what is more important to have better and more available psychiatric care and crisis uh, hotlines and uh, we need to detect and treat depression quite vigorously in sri lanka and um, control the disinhibitory factors like alcohol now i forgot to mention that um, always now as i told you always ask about childhood sexual abuse in suicide attempts and always don't forget to ask about alcohol and other drugs drugs because um, when a person is depressed and uh, along with that the person is having substance misuse issue, issues if the patient is alcohol dependent or heroin or other cannabis dependent the chances of him or her committing suicide is very high so always ask about substance misuse in a person who um is depressed or whom you think will be harboring suicidal ideas okay so yeah we'll skip this slide so there are may two main medications that help us with suicidal ideation one is uh, in mood disorders the lithium carbonate it has strong evidence to say that um, long term maintenance treatment with lithium reduces the aggression as well as the suicidal intention so it's a very good medication uh, to be given for people with mood disorders and um, as i told you personal disorders also is a major problem and uh, we give this combination usually of olanzapine and fluoxetine uh, to reduce the impulsivity and to help in the mood swings and sometimes mood stabilizers and for people with psychotic disorders clozapine is a wonder drug uh, which reduces again the aggression as well as the suicidal intention and significantly decreases the rate of suicidal attempts and perhaps suicide for patients with schizophrenia 
and schizoaffective disorder. And uh, for patients with um, high suicide intention, uh, who are neglecting themselves, who are not eating and drinking, and who strongly voice suicidal ideas with strong suicidal plans, uh, ECT or electroconvulsive therapy is a very uh, important treatment strategy. And there are psychological treatments as well. And we'll end up with the take-home message. Um, the, it's very important that as house officers, you all should be empathic and not judgmental towards the patients who come, um, come to you. Because always remember that it's a quite a devastating situation for the patient to be uh, thinking of wanting to end his or her life. They have gone uh, uh, through a lot of hardships and they are already in... Um, emotional turmoil and severely distressed. So for a person, person to even think of ending her or his life, it's a very hard decision to make and they must be really uh, very distressed, depressed and in emotional turmoil. And uh, they have attempted and luckily they have not died and they come for help to you, to the hospital. And it's very important that you be non-judgmental and not just laugh at them and um, not take them seriously and um, just sitting down with them and talking to them in an empathic kind manner and just go through the circumstances which made them uh, perform this act will be much more helpful than your medications and sometimes uh, before you refer to the psychiatrist or counselor, that's the most important first treatment that you can give. So don't laugh at them. Don't um, say that, oh my God, why, why, why did you take uh, uh, an overdose of paracetamol for such a trivial thing? And uh, uh, just show that uh, you're serious about them and you take it very seriously and that this patient is very important to you and uh, not a hassle. Uh, for you for you, and um, say that uh, because some patients uh, may be laughed at and um, some healthcare staff members may say that you are just wasting our time when we need to uh, concentrate more on our serious patients like the myocardial infarctions and you're occupying a bed and um, troubling you, troubling us. So don't come again with this sort of silly uh, attempts. So that kind of message should not be given. Just be empathic and be kind and just um, always remember that they have gone through a lot of problems in their lives. It's not easy for a person to come to hospital after a suicidal attempt where they have gone through hell and they don't want to be treated as shit and uh, they want to be treated as human beings in your words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abhay uh, there's one question from the uh, audience. They have asked, uh, as the house officer, do we only consider psychiatry referral after assessing the scores you mentioned? Or do we refer all attempted suicide patients to psychiatry? Okay, so that's a very important question. Thank you for asking that question. So now, in a small hospital... Ideally, all, psych all patients who attempt suicide should be referred to psychiatry. But uh, although we say that, we know, know that it's not practical in hospitals like, say, Colombo or Candy or, let's say, Ragam or Kalubovila, because they are very busy wards. And, and the turnover of patients. Now, for instance, Kurunagala Hospital, uh, uh, the daily admission rate of uh, patients to a medical ward is 150 to 175 with only about, say, let's say 40 beds. So you can't be um, referring all the patients uh, because of the practical issues. So in that case, it's always better to use this BEX suicidal intense scale in, on all the patients who attempt to commit suicide. And if they score more than five, um, refer them to the psychiatry uh, uh, unit. So that they will take a decision whether to whether to admit this patient to the psychiatry ward or uh, whether they, they need the outpatient care. So for people who score less than five, you can take a decision of referring them to the psychiatrist clinic after they get discharged after about one week. 
So as I, I will repeat the answer, ideally all patients who attempt suicide should be referred to a psychiatrist. But in the Sri Lankan setup, sometimes that may be not feasible because of practical reasons. In that case, it's better that you administer the Beck suicide intense scale on all patients and refer the people who score more than five to a psychiatrist to be practical. Hope you got the answer. Any more questions? No, Gihan, uh, that's all. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next lecture. And uh, it's an, another very important area. Uh, everybody working in medical and surgical wards will come across, and even uh, in the Ginobs maybe, a ward, uh, patients with delirium. Uh, which is a very important and life-threatening condition to treat and all of should, you should be aware of the symptoms and how to manage it along with other organic or physical conditions which can manifest uh, as psychiatric illness. So to do the next lecture, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Dulshika Vaz, who's a senior lecturer and consultant psychiatrist at the University of Sri Jayavadhanapura and Kalubovil Hospital. Many of the Japura students here would know her well. And uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Vas. Thank you, Chak. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Am I, oh, am I audible? Uh, you're audible, Dushika. Can my screen be seen as well, uh, Chamara? Uh, yes, yes. OK. Thank you. So. Thank you very much for that introduction, Chamara. And um, as you mentioned, these are very important topic because um, everyone here will be working either in a medical ward or a surgical ward, and probably Gina Nobs also. And you're bound to come across a patient with delirium at some point in your, uh, during your internship or even during your career post-intern. So um, now I just want to stay at the beginning of this talk. Oscar, can you make us? So, sorry? Ah, oh, screen share, okay. Yeah, the, can, okay. can you make us? Sorry? Yeah, that's fine, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so it is important to be able to diagnose delirium and not miss it. I'll talk about this, and this is not a comprehensive lecture. In no way is it going to substitute the lectures you all did during your undergraduate days, but this is more or less to help you uh, to jog your memories a little bit, and also um, to help you with your clinical, with the clinical aspect of uh, uh, diagnosing delirium. Okay, so at the end of the talk, I hope you'll know what delirium is, or at least remind you, importance of diagnosing delirium, the types of delirium, symptoms and signs, and management. And I've also been asked to talk about organic, uh, organic disorders, psychiatric disorders. I probably I'll have just a little bit of time to touch on that, because I understand Dr. Sajivan Amarasinghe will also be talking down those lines. OK, so why is it important to diagnose delirium? Well, prevalence is high. Admi people are admitted on admissions. There are about 10% of admissions who are uh, patients who are delirious. And in the wards after admission, about 10 to 30% of patients, this is uh, in the surgical and medical wards, 10 to 30% of uh, patients go into delirium. Sorry, this is post-op. Post-op surgical, it's higher. And apparently uh, after hip replacement, about 50% of patients go into delirium. ICU, is, uh, the rates of delirium in ICU is also very high. But for you all, I suppose it's the wards and post-op, which is important at this time. It is a medical emergency. So it is vital that you identify patients who are delirious. 
because mortality is high, it's about 10 to 20%. And also the adverse outcomes, there are severe adverse outcomes. Uh, if you don't diagnose delirium and we have also to take measures of preventing this. So with that, we move on to what is delirium? I suppose you might be more uh, comfortable with the term acute confusional state, easier to understand. So here we find an impairment of consciousness resulting in a um, in reduced level of alertness. So patients are less alert. They are not able to pay attention as they did before. The perception of the environment changes and their cognitive performance also uh, changes. So I'll go into detail when I talk a little bit more about the symptoms and signs of delirium. Now delirium is not a syndrome. It's, sorry, it is a syndrome. It's not a disease that you have to remember, okay? So main idea in telling you this, uh, talking about delirium is the moment you identify any altered level of consciousness or someone uh, has hallucinations, it's for you to think of delirium first before informing the psychiatrist on call, okay? Because it is important for you to be able to, <coughs> sorry, identify this and not think first of all, this is a psychiatric patient and uh, immediately make the call to the psychiatrist. So there are generally three types of delirium, the hyperactive one, hyperactive one, and the mixed. So when you talk about hyperactive delirium, the patient is agitated. So they'll try to run off, they'll try to remove their tubes, catheters are removed, if there's an NG tube, um, lines are removed, it's difficult to manage. And they may also, uh, they do that with good reasons. And uh, they may also present with hallucinations. So we have to be, now this type of delirium is not missed because they cause um, difficulties for the uh, staff members. Patient is agitated, now you're not going to miss it. But hyperactive delirium, that is when the patient isn't agitated and presents with lethargy. This is the patient we miss because the patient isn't causing too much of too many problems for the staff. However, the prognosis is poor in these patients. So this is the patient which we don't want you to miss and where the prognosis is poor and the mortality is high. We are bound to miss the diagnosis of delirium and then the uh, patient is bound to die. And of course, you have the mixed states. The, uh, it's a mixture between hyperactive and hyperactive. So sometimes they're very agitated then they're uh, in a corner. So it's a mixed type. So hyperactive, you're not going to miss, but hypoactive delirium is what you have also to consider. Okay, this is the patient, um, the hyperactive delirium is the nurses will tell you about it and everyone else, but the hypoactive delirium, as I mentioned before, people are not going to talk about it, right? It's easy to miss and because they are not causing much trouble. Okay. So talking about delirium, when should we suspect delirium now? I said roughly about one third of patients who are elderly going to delirium. So old age, they say 55, some people say 65, basically older the age, suspect delirium. That's important. They may come in uh, very lucid, but uh, down the line, they may get delirious. So suspect. If there's a previous episode of delirium, it could happen this time as well. And suspect delirium if there's pre-existing brain damage. If there's a history of dementia, CVS, tumors, then because there is, uh, uh, you, you should be suspecting delirium. If there's functional impairment, like history of falls, patient is immobile, again, you should think this person could get delirious whilst on the ward. Anyone with coexisting medical conditions, diabetes, 
elect, uh, electrolyte imbalances, that type of thing. Again, yes, delirium should be suspected. Now, uh, you also know the aged population is getting, is increasing proportionately or disproportionately. So we are going to have, a, we are going to see more patients who are older than we did before. So delirium will be seen in more, uh, quite a number of them. And along with longevity, we also have seen they are on a lot of drugs, medications basically, because of other comorbidities. So certain drugs and interactions between drugs also can cause delirium. So if they are on a number of drugs, yes, think of delirium. Now, something else we forget is alcohol. Uh, people take alcohol, both male and female. So again, alcohol has to be considered if they have been on alcohol, uh, have been taking alcohol, well, consider, think that they could go into delirium tremens. Now, delirium tremens will be touched upon by Dr. Amila Isur when he talks about substance misuse disorders here. Um, yeah, so key is old age, older the person, uh, be prepared that the patient could get delirious on the ward. So we suspect delirium, we think delirium could occur in someone. So the next thing is, what are the symptoms and signs uh, that tell us a person is delirious? Clouding of consciousness. So level of consciousness <clears throat> is reduced. Sometimes they may even go into stupor states. Disorientation, time and place is very common. So how do you assess disorientation, whether a person is oriented or not? You ask them roughly what time it is. And without looking at the clock, they should be able to tell you whether it's half an hour plus or minus. So if it's um, 9.15 now, between 8.45 and, uh, um, 9.45, okay, this is without looking at the clock, but they can look outside and tell you what time it is. Um, yeah, other thing is place. You'd assume they know they are there, but check whether they know where they are. Sometimes they may say they're in a police station or uh, in some relative's house or in a supermarket. So assess time. Time is what goes first. So time, place, and person. Person is it goes last, but time goes off first. So assess that. And the duration is also very brief. It can occur suddenly. So that is also something which you need to think of. They could present with psychotic symptoms by the time you see them. That might be why they're agitated. Um, so they could have delusions, persecuted delusions, so because of that, they could get agitated and uh, <coughs> they could try to run off. Uh, so just because they have psychotic symptoms, think of delirium. If there's no past history of uh, any psychiatric illness disorder per se, before you refer to the psychiatrist, okay? Perceptual disturbances are also very common, especially visual hallucinations. That is very common in uh, people who are delirious. And delirium tremens, Dr. Amila Isri will tell you, has also very specific uh, uh, visual hallucinations. In addition to visual hallucinations, they could also have illusions. Okay. Mood might be altered. They might be a little, they're very placid people coming in. They might get irritable towards the end. They might be dysphoric or even euphoria can present. So suddenly someone who doesn't, you know, who generally talks very little might start to talk a lot. And the mood will be slightly elated. It will be a nice feeling because then the patient who hardly talks is talking to you and is very chatty. But identify this could be one uh, symptom of um, or sign of the patient being delirious. Sleep cycle can be reversed. So they're sleeping more uh, during the day and they're up at night. One other thing is there is fluctuation of consciousness over, the, over 24 hours. 
and their level of consciousness gets worse towards evening. Might also, or you might have heard of the term sundowning. So that's also something which you have to think of. Now, um, so these are certain symptoms and signs which you might need to pick up on someone whom you suspect might get delirious or who's admitted in a delirious uh, fashion or else might get delirious. That's old age and all that, as I mentioned before. So fortunately, just last week, this patient, uh, I spoke to this patient and he was happy to tell me about uh, what he went through. Uh, I haven't covered his eyes or anything. He said that was perfectly okay. So, yeah. This is a can, you, can you hear uh, Shamara? It's What's not. It's not clear. It's. I mean, we can hear him talking. Yeah. Let me try once more. If you can increase the volume by any chance in your, on your. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It's audible. Oh, sorry. Uh, that was clear for me. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll start again. Sorry about that. Uh, building <laughs> अ <laughs> Right, I have to Sorry about that. Um, so this is a man, generally people are not able to recall how it was during a period of delirium, but this person was able to do that. So you can see how he talks about uh, being disoriented to where he was. And then he had uh, 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 psychotic symptoms. He was paranoid about the people and he sort of misidentified uh, who the people there? They th he thought they were coming to kill him. Um, yeah, so his mood was also getting altered there. This was a person who was after COVID. He got COVID after a, a while he was in hospital and then transferred to a COVID ward. It was in that ward that he developed this. So first time round, he actually um, escaped from hospital because he was delirious. And then he was brought back to hospital to a different hospital. So that's what yeah, he's that's what he's talking about. Um, yeah. So that's that. So when we suspect delirium, what we have to think of the causes. So there could be multiple causes. It wouldn't be one single cause usually. So there's a mnemonic. I watched death. I think this is quite a very relevant mnemonic because. If you don't do anything about delirium, 
it's actually death that you're watching death of the patient that you're watching. So what I put in red are the most commonest things, um, causes for one to get delirious. Uh, it could be infections, <clears throat> any form of infection, even a simple uh, urinary tract infection in an elderly person could cause uh, delirium, in, including chest infections and all that. So withdrawal again, uh, alcohol, or drug withdrawal is also is common, one of those common forms of uh, delirium. Think of acute metabolic states. So again, you have to think of um, whether it's the diabetes causing the, uh, anything at all. Uh, CNS pathology, again, infections, hypoxia, uh, deficiencies in um, uh, but nutritional deficiencies also can cause uh, forms of delirium, vascular things, toxins, or drugs. Again, are drugs the drugs we give them? Sedatives are very common. Sometimes you give them um, the anticholinergic drugs we treat. Uh, treatment with multiple drugs can also cause delirium. So we have to have all this in mind and look for a cause for the delirium. Okay, so deficiencies wise, B12, folate, those things can also cause uh, delirium. So when someone present, uh, you think the patient is delirious and then you wonder is this person, uh, uh, what, what are the other differential diagnoses you could think of? So one is dementia, but how do you differentiate dementia and delirium? Uh, it's the onset. Person with dementia, you might need to get a history from a bystander. We'll have memory problems uh, for a while. So you have to get that history. History is important here. And then you have to find out, now patient who's demented could also have dementia, uh, delirium, could also get delirious. Um, so delirium could be superimposed on someone who is demented or who has dementia. Same way, uh, you have to differentiate it from schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety. One key feature is the past history and, of course, commonly, the level of consciousness and uh, whether they are oriented. A schizophrenic patient will be oriented. Someone with schizophrenia who's depressed or who has anxiety disorders will be generally oriented to time. They may have delusions, uh, florid delusions, hallucinations, but they will always be oriented to time. So that is one key feature of di uh, differentiating. And of course, the, the time course, right? Severe dementia, sometimes they, uh, very uh, severe dementia, of course, you might, they might not be knowing the time. Okay, so those are things you have to keep in mind. So now we come to management. Prevention, they say, is key. Preventing dementia is actually better than uh, managing dementia. Uh, Identify, and next thing is to identify and treat the underlying cause. So non-pharmacological uh, treatment methods are better than pharmacological treatment methods. And of course, you have to think of post-discharge management. So I put it here, prevention, identification and treating underlying cause, environmental factors and support, pharmacological factors and post-discharge management. So how do you prevent dementia? People are susceptible. So we suspect or we think this patient could get delirious. So we have to make sure we target risk factors. So optimize medication and things like that. Ensure they have sleep. The sleep fake cycle doesn't go haywire. Now that is important. And keep reorientating them. Tell them the time, where they are, who you are, all that is important in preventing dementia. How do you assess? One thing is the cognitive assessment we do. 
So assessment of uh, uh, time, place, person, attention, concentration, their mood, um, basically to, uh, to do a MSc, right? And there's also a scale, which is, uh, which we don't use, but it's a simple scale to sort of use in someone who has, um, it's called the Confucian assessment method. Not, I haven't seen people using it here in Sri Lanka, but in other countries they use this. So that actually does what the mental state assessment does basically. Okay. Um, so it uh, assesses inattention, um, the onset, whether it's acute or not, inattention, whether there is disorganized thinking, altered level of consciousness, whether they are disoriented, whether there is memory impairment, perceptual disturbances, uh, like that. But just do a mental state examination and you'll be able to find out instead of looking for these skills. Other thing is active management of the patient. Manage them quickly. Don't take time in managing people who are elderly because they deteriorate very fast. So this next step is non-pharmacological management. Now we find that the person is delirious, what do we do? Number one, when someone gets delirious, inform the family and the caregivers because when they come in to see the patient and patient is quite disturbed, um, it can uh, actually uh, cause a lot of uh, difficulties and embarrassments to the uh, embarrass the family. So educate them, tell them what is happening and get them involved in the care. If you if you allow, if some hospitals allow them to be on the ward, that is the best thing because the patient is familiar with that person, with the family member or the caregiver. If that some hospitals um, um, give, uh, give are okay with that, but some hospitals don't allow that. Have clear communication with the patient. Don't talk a lot. Just be brief, very clear, and be loud. Uh, other thing is to have environmental, uh, changing the environment a little, have reminders, have a calendar, have the time, and keep identi identifying yourself. If you're a medical person, say who you are and say, I met you a few minutes back, I'm Dr. So-and-so. And it has to be the same with the other staff as well, nursing officers and the other healthcare assistants. And it's also, so they, it's very important that they keep reorientating the patient. Tell them that I'm so-and-so and all that and ask them their name and the date and the time. Staff consistency, as much as possible, have the same staff. Now one st staff member can't be with the patient 24 seven or even 48 hours at a stage. So have the, the same staff members doing the shifts. So I have about three staff members uh, rotating. That staff consistency helps the patient. And of course, preventing sensory deprivation. Someone wears specs, make sure the patient has specs, is wearing spectacles even on the board. If they use hearing aids, make, you, make sure they have those. If they have walking aids, that they use those things. So those are things which you have to think of. When it comes to environmental factors, again, this is very important. Sorry. Uh, when it comes to environmental factors, what is very important is, uh, if possible, nurse them in a separate room. If you don't have a separate room, generally most wards have a separate area for them, but that doesn't mean the patient has to be at the end of the corridor and not to be observed by anyone. In a less busy area, most patient, most wards have this type of thing. Uh, ensure there's adequate space and the patient gets adequate sleep. Patient shouldn't be overstimulated. Neither should the patient be understimulated. So being in a busy ward is not going to help the patient. But being put into the corner of the ward is also not going to help. 
patient has to be, it's a bit of a difficult thing in our setup, but you have to try and strike a balance here. Because, peer, because physicians and surgeons recognize the need for this. There's now a separate area, uh, not very close, but close enough that the nurses can observe the patient and where the patient has a bit of uh, privacy and there is, it's a little more calm than a crowded nursing station, than right next to a crowded nursing station. Single rooms, if you have, that's fine. Again, control lighting and sound. Now it's important to have adequate lighting. Too much uh, lighting also can uh, upset the patient. Lighting, especially in the night, is important, which means you need, it has to be dimly lit in the night because it's towards evening or night that the patients generally get more um, agitated because of the sensory uh, deprivation. So have, I, what is ideal is to have a blue light, dim light, where the patient is able to fall asleep. But if the patient gets up, is not disoriented. Uh, maintain competence. So like walking in patients who are ambulant, uh, patients who are ambulant, make sure they walk. Make, and uh, uh, don't keep them on the bed for a very long time. Finally, if they get uh, some people use restrictive methods, that is, in other words, they restrain them. Avoid that as much as possible because that too is a cause for increasing delirium. Okay, so supportive and environmental methods play a huge role in managing patients who are delirious, much more then managing someone, uh, someone pharmacologically. The easier thing to do is give a drug, but the better thing to do is to manage giving support and managing the environment of someone. And most of the time you're able to do that. So when it comes to pharmacological management, pharmacological management is not to treat the delirium. It's actually to control the agitation and help them with their sleep. So when it comes to controlling agitation, generally we use antipsychotics. Um, haloperidol is something which we use or quetiapine. Uh, uh, the best evidence is for these two uh, drugs. So haloperidol, as you know, is a first generation antipsychotic. Uh, quetiapine is a second generation one. Haloperidol, very small doses, not doses we treat um, people who are psycho, who have schizophrenia and all, such as 0.5 to two milligrams. BD dose will help them. Anything above three, you have to be cautious that the patient could develop extrapyramidal side effects, which is going to be even more difficult then right, haloperidol orally 0.5 to 2 milligrams twice a day is going to help the patient. Um, so you assess over 24 hours and you can also give them PRN doses of haloperidol. Like every four hours, you can put in a dose of haloperidol if needed. Other option is quetiapine. Uh, quetiapine 12.5 to 50 milligrams uh, twice a day again is good. You can go up to 200 milligrams, but the issue with quetiapine is it's more sedating and also can cause postural drops. So patients feel dizzy when they sort of walk and when they have to be very careful when they get out of bed. Haloperidol, on the other hand, doesn't cause too much drowsiness, so which is important to us. Sometimes it's difficult to assess when they're too drowsy especially if they have um, uh, respiratory symptoms. So sleep has also to be uh, good sleep. This ensures good sleep. We recommend not using benzodiazepines because that interferes again with respiration and benzodiazepines are kept for the management of delirium tremens. In delirium tremens, benzodiazepines 
uh, are needed. And we tend not to use any antipsychotics, but in uh, delirium, other than delirium tremens, it's an anti a small dose of antipsychotic only if needed. You move on to IM uh, haloperidol only if the patient is not taking um, oral haloperidol. Okay. There's also a risk, they say, uh, with uh, patients with dementia, but something has to be used. So it's better to use a very small dose. Things you have to consider, you use one drug at a time and use small doses. Don't back the patient with big doses. Very small doses help because uh, their brains are very, it's generally the elderly who get agitated, who get delirious, and their brains are very, very sensitive. So small doses, but adequate doses. And you have to assess the dose. Now you, other than the regular dose, you give a PR in dose. And you assess the uh, dose, review it at 24 hours. So if someone's needed four milligrams of, uh, say four milligrams of haloperidol for 24 hours, then you divide the dose and give it to the person the next day. You titrate it according to the response, right? So that you don't over medicate them. Remember generally over three milligrams of haloperidol, they're, they're bound to get extra pyramidal side effects. And of course, someone who's delirious, it is important that you review them at least uh, twice a day, minimum twice a day, in addition to all the other observations you do, the nursing observations and all that are done, okay? Post-discharge is very important because symptoms last longer than the underlying condition. So you treat the condition, someone has a UTI, you treat the patient, patient uh, parameters come down and you send them home. But the delirium- Recording stopped. The delirium can last a little longer. So the symptoms of disorientation, the attention and things like that can last a little longer. And that you have to inform the family or the caregiver and advise them on management, and of course, give them support, tell them about it. And when you review them, when do you stop the medication? Once they are well, they are not delirious, you can stop the antipsychotics. You don't have to continue. Um, there is also another thing at review. You should be doing six monthly MMSs. That's the recommendation because there's a high chance of someone who's delirious getting dementia. So MMSCs are, you're expected to do MMSCs. Um, yes, so in a nutshell, delirium is a medical emergency, is a medical emergency. Mortality is high and we're bound to see more and more patients, uh, elderly people who are more likely to get delirious than others coming into hospital. So prevent delirium, be aggressive, be vigilant about patients who are delirium, treat them, uh, preferably non-pharmacological management to prevent uh, delirium and pharmacological only if needed. And more, more importantly, it is also, in, uh, you have to inform and advise and educate the family when one when the patient is delirious because it really upsets the family members and they feel bad that the, uh, uh, the whoever the family member is behaving like this because they attribute it to mental illness. So that aspect is very important. And then they may start scolding the patient that really upsets them. So tell them it's not a psychiatric illness, but this is commonly seen in patients who develop, uh, uh, elderly people who develop delirium. Okay, so that's all about delirium and I hope you'll be able to, uh, uh, you'll identify delirium early and manage them. And uh, think twice before referring to the uh, psychiatrist.
if you think you need more help with managing aggression and you need further assessment, by all means do refer. But at the drop of a hat, just because someone gets agitated, that doesn't mean you should be referring to the psychiatrist, but think down these lines. This DD should be high up in your list. Chamara, do I have time or? Uh, yes, Lushika, you can have uh, five more minutes to continue, yeah. Okay. Um, so when it comes to mental disorders due to general medical conditions, what generally happens is certain conditions mimic psychiatric disorders. So epilepsy is one, especially TLE. So they produce psychiatric symptoms similar to psychosis. They'll have hallucinations, uh, they may have depersonalization, derealization, um, uh, things like that. Then deja vu, jame vu, uh, like symptoms like that, and disorders of thinking and memory. But you have also to think of first thing is to think could this be an organic cause? So you have to try and differentiate, right? Again, brain tumors also can present with psychiatric um, um, symptoms and signs. Like frontal lobe tumors may present with depression. Uh, slow growing tumors may present with personality changes and then the rapid growing tumors may produce cognitive changes. Uh, again, temporal lobe tumors may present with anxiety, depression, hallucinations, um, are the psychotic features. So you have to always consider, could this, can this be, an org can there be an or underlying organic cause? Right? Again, infectious diseases like encephalitis, meningitis, infections can produce, can present with uh, symptoms of uh, uh, psychiatric symptoms. Endocrine disorders, especially thyroid disorders, present with depression or anxiety. Both hypo and hyper can do that. Same with Cushing's. So you have to think of organic causes in a, when they present with uh, uh, psychiatric symptoms. Next is metabolic disturbances. Again, hepatic encephalopathy. There is an alteration in the level of consciousness. Uremic encephalopathies, again, they'll complain about um, uh, crawling sensations on the limbs and a feeling of restlessness. So these things have to be thought of. Um, hypoglycemia also can cause, you know, there can be apprehension and restlessness. Again, they'll have sweating, tachycardia. You might have to differentiate it from uh, panic disorder, right? Nutritional deficiencies are also known to cause such cognitive uh, deficits, and they can also cause uh, new, like other neuropsychiatric symptoms, apathy, irritability, insomnia, depression, and all that. So you have to think of these. These are the main conditions you come across. And of course, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's, again, they present with depression that can present with dementia. So you have to be alert to the fact that there are organic causes underlying uh, psychiatric presentations. Uh, identify those and it's good to work with the psychiatrist. So it's good for you to investigate and liaise with the psychiatrist rather than just referring to the psychiatrist more about uh, other disorders that cause depression and anxiety, I think will be discussed by uh, Dr. Sajivana. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, are there any questions? Oh. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vaz. There are a few questions uh, from the audience. The yeah. first one is, uh, are all dementic 
dementing patients usually disoriented? No, um, sorry. Patients who are dementing are not disoriented. Early uh, stages of the disease, they, they are not disoriented. They're oriented to time, place, person. But uh, late, uh, towards the end of dementia, when it's profound, then they are uh, disoriented. They would know the time, place. You know. Then at that point, they're disoriented, but not early and uh, early stages of dementia, no. Uh, the next question, Dilshika, is if an elderly patient gets delirium at home, does he need hospital admission on all locations or can it be managed at home? Um, tricky question. Ideally, I think they should seek medical care because we have to find the underlying cause for the delirium. It could be an infection. Now, what generally happens is some people prefer home care where a physician or doctor visits them home. I don't think uh, non-medical uh, non people should, or lay people should be managing delirium at home if without any medical guidance. I think Dushika, it's probably, I mean, if it's the first time it happens, you definitely have to go to hospital, isn't it? But you might have a recurrent sort of thing where you know this is happening and you might have contact with the patient's GP or physician over the phone or something, then coming into hospital every time might be a hassle, isn't it? Yeah, if a cause can be found and then treated is the best thing. I mean, yeah. elderly people, they're best treated and managed at home because new environment, they have to, you know, they're very likely to get delirious and it's a new en environment. Uh, so it's bound to lead to further uh, deterioration. But a cause has to be found. It's not, yeah. I suppose, to ignore the fact, but yeah. Uh, treat, yeah. And if it's the first time, I would definitely take them to hospital. Uh, the second, third question, Dulshika, is uh, can you please, can you repeat the dose of quetiapine you mentioned? What was the dose she had, I think, uh, missed it. Yeah, quetiapine, very yes. small doses, like 12.5 milligrams to 50 milligrams. Uh, two to four times a day is adequate. Maximum dose should be 200 milligrams. But... Uh, as I said before, with cotapin, you have to be very careful because patients get very sedated and they could uh, result in falls. And there's also postural uh, hypertension. So you have to be very careful about that. It's a good drug to use. I think there is now there is more evidence for uh, in medical settings, they use more cotapin than uh, haloperidol. But this other thing is also that about uh, getting being sedated. Uh, one more question from the audience, uh, Dulshika. Do patients with hyperthyroidism also present with depression or is it just hypothyroidism? Generally hypothyroidism, but there are patients who are hyperthyroid who present with depression. But uh, more hypothyroid patients present with depression. With hyperthyroidism, it's more anxiety-related things. But you can't exclude. We have seen patients who are hyper also presenting with depression. Okay. Thank you, Dushika. I'll let you go after one more question from me. Uh, just uh, this, these interns will be working most likely with a lot of COVID patients. And we see a lot of COVID encephalitis and uh, patients who are uh, delirious with COVID. Would the management be the same as per your advice you gave? Or are there any differences? Um, with COVID, what we are worried about is also respiratory symptoms. So uh, I think the better thing would be to go along with a bit of haloperidol rather than very small doses, rather than going with cotapine, because again, the patient gets too sedated. Does that answer my question? Is yeah, it? yeah. I think that's important. Yes. Right. Okay. I'll, uh, we'll, uh, Dushika, if you don't mind... Uh, because of time, uh, we'll move on to the next lecture. But if you can go through the chat and type the answers to uh, the other questions, is that okay? Yeah, sure, I'll do. Yeah, on, if you go to the chat and you type the answers on the main chat, uh, everybody can see them. There are a okay. few questions we haven't taken yet. Right. Yes, we'll do that.
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vaz. Uh, we'll move on to, to a, another very important topic. Uh, when you do internship or you work as a doctor anywhere, in any stage of your career, you will come across people who misuse substances, alcohol being most common, but other drugs as well. The patients might get admitted primarily due to a substance-related problem, like something like delirium tremens, or it might be a patient coming for another illness like a fever, and you'll identify substance misuse. So either way, as an intern, as a doctor, it's a very important area to know about and know how to manage uh, the situations because there are emergencies as well. And Dr. Amila Isuru, a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, Rajaratan, who works at the teaching hospital, Anuradhapura, uh, will talk about this uh, topic now. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Amila Isuru. Thank you, Chamara, for your kind introduction. And uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'll take you through a uh, few important uh, situation and conditions which will arise in the context of. Amila, can you make your screen larger? Okay. The, right. the presentation, can you make it? Right. How is it now, Cham? A uh, bit better. That uh, thing in the at the bottom where it becomes full screen. Yeah. Can you yeah, try? Yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. It better. Now? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So I'll take you through a few uh, conditions which is related to substance misuse. Some and some of them are really medical emergencies and. Uh, so every one of you, it's really important and good to know these things when you are doing a busy job as an intern uh, house officer. Right. So we'll, uh, so during my presentation, uh, I will uh, talk about following topics. And at the end of the presentation, you need to be able to answer and uh, give uh, uh, answer following uh, questions. Why is it important to screen for substance use disorders? And what are the emergencies related to alcohol use? How to identify and manage delirium tremens? Alcohol withdrawal seizures and how to manage it? Identification and management of vernicase encephalopathy and identification and management of heroin intoxication and heroin withdrawal. And how to briefly intervene a person who use uh, psychoactive substances. Right. So my first question is, why are we so bothered about substance misuse? I'm sure you all know the alcohol and tobacco are the most important cause of premature death across the globe, not only in, not only in Sri Lanka, across the globe, it is the most important uh, risk factor for premature deaths. Right. If you take Sri Lanka, so because of the smoking annually, nearly 20,000 people are dying and nearly 40,000 people are dying due to substance misuse. And you know the annual health care cost. So large amount of uh, national income are spending on health care costs related to alcohol, tobacco and other substances as well. As a developing country, it is really difficult for us to afford this amount of money and in addition to that alcohol and other substances causes so many psychosocial issues issues with the issues with the family so it affects children's psychosocial development emotional and cognitive development and it affects uh, domestic violence it can it can cause lots of crimes and things like that so it's really important to understand the impact of uh, alcohol and other substances. And uh, so we have to do our best to minimize uh, this menace. Right. Most importantly, why we are intervening? Because it is effective, right? Drug addiction treatment reduces drug use and it's associated with health and social cost. It, it is beneficial in many ways. Right. Then what is your role as an intern house officer? Right. 
when you encounter patient with diabetes, hypertension, stroke or myocardial infarction or when you encounter patient with uh, uh, psychiatric uh, mental health issues, what is your role as intern house officer with regard to psychoactive substance misuse? I think most important thing is ask few questions about uh, substance misuse. For example, the alcohol consumption, whether they use alcohol or not, how frequently, whether they are dependent on, on those substances, right? And it is really important to understand the level of substance use in any patient. For example, if you take patients with diabetic mellitus, so how, however you However much you treat the diabetes. Yeah, they have written to me directly also. I'm just copying that and sending it to everyone. That's better, no? Hello? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if you treat patients with... That I don't need to read. Do it again, no? no? Right. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, that's what I start. I'm starting from the bottom. <laughs> okay. No problem. Thanks, right. Sorry, there's a few disturbances, right? Okay. So, if, for example, if you take Sorry. a patient with diabetes mellitus, now we are treating patients glycemic control and you are trying to prevent other complications. But if you are not addressing his tobacco misuse or alcohol misuse, now you are not doing probably the best job. The patient's outcome is not going to be great. So if you are treating a child with asthma, if you are not addressing the issue of the, the child's father is smoking inside the house, so you, you will not be able to gain a proper control of asthma. Similarly, if you are treating the patients with bipolar affective disorder, if you are not screening, if you do not ask few questions about substance misuse, the outcome of bipolar affective disorder, however much you treat with antipsychotics and mood stabilizers and however however you much you give psychological interventions and everything uh, but the outcome of the illness is not going to be great right so it's really important for you to screen the patients on the other hand so this is most important cause of premature deaths so it's really important to identify patients with substance misuse disorders and you can do a referral because now right throughout the country you have psychiatric services you can do a referral to a consultant psychiatrist MOMH diploma holder so the if you refer the patient the outcome is going to be good right the interventions are really helpful right now uh, this is the one of the commonest uh, thing you will encounter as an intern medical officer with regard to substance misuse, the alcohol withdrawal syndrome, right? For example, uh, patients admitted with pneumonia or patients admitted with road traffic accident, patient admitted to your ward because of the medical reason, after one or two days, you will, ex you will see patients become very anxious and tremulous and blood pressure going up and down, patient became tachycardic, sometimes confused, right? If you, did, if you didn't ask about the history of substance misuse, for example, alcohol use, you will be really confused. You don't know as to what is going on, right? But if you took, at least if you notice these symptoms, then you retrospectively ask about substance misuse and when you ask about the last consumption of alcohol, then you know this is this presentation is due to alcohol withdrawal symptoms. Alcohol withdrawal syndrome is a kind of a it, there are a range of symptoms. The some might present to you with poor sleep and bit of anxiety. Sometimes patients present to you with alcohol withdrawal fits or delirium tremens, right? Or severe autonomic disturbances. So it's really important to be aware of some of the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal syn uh, syndrome because if you detect alcohol withdrawal syndrome early and if, if you give the appropriate treatment then you can prevent further complications. 
right. So alcohol withdrawal, there are mild symptoms like tremulousness, insomnia, anxiety, hyperreflexia, increased setting and mild autonomic hyperactivity. You might see patients with patients present with tachycardia and blood pressure going up and down and GI upset. And these are some of the mild withdrawal symptoms and moderate withdrawal symptoms, the intense anxiety, you might see tremors, patient is not sleeping, excessive adrenergic symptoms, right? So it's really important to detect this mild and moderate stage and start treatment. If patient goes into severe recording in symptoms, progress, severe withdrawal symptoms, patients might experience very, very severe conditions like delirium tremens, mortality is high and alcohol withdrawal fits, right? And when case in cephalopathy and things like that. By all means, you have to prevent these conditions, right? So when it's become severe, you might see patients become profound the profound alteration of sensorium patient is very anxious and hallucinating patient is running around and severe autonomic hyperactivity blood pressure is going up and down patient is having severe tachycardia and fever like symptoms as well and sitting profoundly right okay now there are three conditions you must know and you must remember uh, when you are doing your interns with regard to alcohol right all these are medical emergencies and if you do not attend to that early and promptly and if you do not uh, start uh, proper treatment and interventions the outcome is not going to be great right the first thing is delirium tremens then alcohol withdrawal seizures and vernicase encephalopathy i'll take you through each of these conditions I'm sure you, 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 you know all these things and I will uh, discuss few important things uh, for you to practice as a house officer. And delirium tremors. So this happens, this is kind of a severe form of alcohol withdrawal or what we call the complicated alcohol withdrawal, right? So if you detect alcohol withdrawal symptoms early and if you start uh, chlorodiazepoxide and appropriate treatment, you want get this right so if you get these features like coarse tremors it's not fine tremors coarse bilateral hand tremors and patient is confused and perceptual dis disturbances for example patient is hallucinating and autonomic instability right so in this if you see these things this is delirium tremens right as dr dulshika was quite correctly said so this should be a kind of a this is a medical emergency this could be managed as delirium but manage, management is quite different right so when we talk about the management of delirium tremens we know if there is a history of alcohol use features of dependence and recently reduce or stop alcohol consumption now day two three if patient presented with these symptoms it is more likely to be delirium tremens so management has to be uh, you can you have to monitor the patients because of the autonomic instability you have to monitor the blood pressure pulse and temperature and everything right and then you have to keep the uh, patient in well lit area right the, there should be one-to-one -one observation as well. Patient can be very much distressed, agitated and running here and there because of the perceptual disturbances and agitation, right? Or patient can be kind of a just staying on the bed, patient is not responding well, like hypoactive delirium, right? So in this kind of situation, it is really important to start adequate dose of chlorodiazepoxide, right? If patient is hallucinating uh, a lot, usually with chlorodiazepoxide, those things will settle. If they are severe and persist, you can start very small dose of haloperidol or a small dose of olanzapine or cotapine as well. Right? So in the management of delirium tremens, once you start chlorodiazepoxide, once you start monitoring and once you kind of a, 
manage the patient in a kind of a, a favorable environment, right? At the same time, you got to see other causes of delirium as well, right? You might think this is delirium tremens, but patient might have hypoglycemia. Patient might develop in hepatic encephalopathy. Patient might have had a fall and there can be a kind of intracranial hemorrhage, right? There can be subclinical epilepsy, right? So these things should keep in mind. So this is if a patient with alcohol withdrawal comes to you with delirium tremens, it is not enough to start clodisopoxide and other monitoring and things. You have to take a proper history, proper examination and do appropriate investigations to exclude other causes of this presentation, which will help to save lives. Because I have seen some of the patients presented like this, but underlined they have hypoglycemia, underlined they have intracranial hemorrhage, sometimes they have hyponatremia. I have seen some alcoholic patients presented to us like this, but when, when we investigate, they have hyponatremia. So all these condition has to be treated promptly, otherwise outcome is not going to be great. Right? So another condition, alcohol withdrawal seizures, sometimes we call rum fix, right? So this is again severe form of alcohol withdrawal. So this alcohol, usually in day two and three, patient presented with uh, alcohol withdrawal seizures and these are most of the time, they do not last long time, right? So you have to manage as uh, alcohol withdrawal no, uh, usual seizure, but alcohol withdrawal seizures, you don't start conventional anti-epileptic medications like carbamazepine, sodium valproate, or things like that. Instead, we optimize the dose of clodisopoxide, right? So, you know, alcohol, alcohol stimulate GABA system and inhibit uh, glutamate system. So, we treat the underlying cause for this fit. So chlordisopoxide, long acting benzodiazepine will help this condition, right? So similarly, when the patients, if patient got fit, you optimize the, uh, you do the initial management and at the same time you take proper history examination and investigations, you exclude other causes for seizures, right? And then you can, if it is more likely to be alcohol withdrawal seizures, you can optimize the chlordisopoxide dose and monitor the patient, right? And, but it is always important to keep in mind, you don't wait someone to get deliric, you don't wait someone to get alcohol withdrawal seizures. The message is you identify alcohol withdrawal symptoms early on and you treat the condition then and there. Then you will be able to prevent these conditions from happening. Right. The next important uh, medical emergency is Wernicke's Koskoff syndrome. Right. And so this condition is caused by thiamine deficiency. We know thiamine, uh, patients with alcohol dependence or alcohol misuse, they sometimes they do not take adequate food and nutrition, so they are anyway deficient in thiamine. On the other hand, thiamine is stores, it stores in the liver, it adequate only for 24 to 48 hours. So it is very likely to thiamine depleted, right? And in alcohol dependence patients, the absorption is not that great. And this thiamine is converted to thiamine pyrophosphate in the liver, which is the active form. And alcoholic patients, alcoholic patients with alcohol misuse, they, their liver is functioning, not functioning optimally. So this conversion is not happening properly. So that patients with alcohol dependence are at a higher risk of developing Wernicke's Korskopf syndrome. And if you look, look at the symptoms, confusion, ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, peripheral neuropathy. So these are the main symptoms of uh, Wernicke's 
uh, Kosakoff syndrome. And you, you can see in patients with alcohol dependence and treated with benzodiazepine, right? So you might attribute confusion to alcohol withdrawal, ataxia to side effect of benzodiazepine and peripheral neuropathy to, uh, to complication, long-term complications of chronic alcohol misuse and ophthalmopagia if you do not properly assess, you won't detect it. So most of the symptoms, clinical features of one case encephalopathy all up with features of alcohol withdrawal, delirium and uh, side effect of benzodiazepine. So it is very likely that you miss these symptoms. What would happen if you miss this condition, right? So if this, if you left untreated these patients, there will be permanent brain damage, right? It is unlikely that patient will come back to his pre-morbid functional level. They will have lots of memory problems, anterograde and retrograde amnesia, patient needs lots of rehabilitation and all. So it is really important to identify Wernicke's Kosakoff syndrome early on and it is sometimes we miss this. Then what we do, then, then we prophylactically start thiamine. I parenterally, I M O I V, we start thiamine. So we give thiamine so that patient, you replenish the thiamine stores so that patient will not develop one case in Kosakoff syndrome and you can prevent further complications. So this is really important in the clinical practice. Sometimes patients with alcohol dependence presented with hypoglycemia. What you do is, you immediately give glucose solution. That is really important, otherwise there will be permanent brain damage. What will happen if you give glucose solution, parenteral glucose solution? The remaining thiamine also utilize. Then patient will go into acute thiamine deficiency, which will lead to one case encephalopathy. So keep in mind, whenever you replenish glucose, you have to give it with thiamine and if you encounter a patient with alcohol dependence syndrome if you are managing him always treat them with thiamine uh, preparations most probably IV or IM which you will be able to prevent severe consequences right because one case Kosakoff syndrome is a reversible condition Whereas Kosakoff psychosis is not reversible most of the time. Right, few important points to kind of a, how to prevent these conditions. Right, so as I have described and as you know these conditions are very serious medical emergencies. If you, if you left them untreated, there will be a very serious consequences. So how do we prevent them? It's not that difficult, right? So take a good history, substance history. If patient is dependent on alcohol, you observe for withdrawal symptoms and you start chlordiazepoxide, right? You start chlordiazepoxide, then you can titrate the dose of chlordiazepoxide to the symptoms of severity of the withdrawal symptoms. Then also what you can do is you can prophylactically start thiamine and at the same time you got to monitor the patient right you got to monitor the patient because of most of these conditions alcohol withdrawal and delirium tremens and all these conditions it involves autonomic instability right so it's really important to monitor them for vital signs and monitor their level of consciousness monitor whether they are uh, whether, whether they, they are going into severe form of alcohol withdrawal so like this you can prevent them having uh, the complications of alcohol withdrawal syndrome right so i have just put down some of the regimes of chlorized oxide so if you identify patients with uh, alcohol dependence, if it is moderate alcohol dependence, 
you can start chlorides oxide 20 mg QDS and if it is severe you can start chlorides oxide 40 mg QDS plus 40 mg PRN the total daily dose we can go up to 200 right so in this condition as well you have to be a bit careful why a patient with alcohol dependence are having chronic liver diseases sometimes they might be having compensated cirrhosis as you know when you treat them with chlorodiazepoxide or benzodiazepine what will happen is this compensated cirrhosis can be shift into decompensated cirrhosis so it is really important for you to look at the bigger picture right if they are having severe forms of uh, chronic liver disease it is really important for you to start short acting benzodiazepines in that conditions and you have always you need to get uh, your seniors opinion in the management right so i'll give you a, a case scenario we'll see uh, have you have you kind of a handle this situation right okay now uh, mr nimal pereira a 42 year old manual laborer he admitted to surgical unit following road traffic accident he sustained a fracture tibia and was kept in the ward following internal fixation of his fracture apart from all his phys all physical examination hematological investigations and radi radiological investigations were normal at the time of admissions all these were normal at the time of admission he was started on chlorides oxide 40 mg qds and he is currently on 10 mg nocte because it is been tailed off as he revealed that he has been consuming half a bottle of arak over last four years now nurses will come and tell you Mr. Nimal Pereira is confused and wandering around the world, especially he is confused at night. So what are the possibilities? I would really appreciate if you can uh, type in the chat box the possibilities that process your mind in this condition. Yes, delirium. Anyone else? Alcohol withdrawal. Hepatic encephalopathy. Very good. Delirium dose is not enough. Very good. Delirium tremens. Head injury. Superb. Fat embolism, very good. I really like the way you think. I'm sure you all are a really good house officers. That is why you need to look at the bigger picture, right? Now day day eight, right? So patient has been started on chlorodiazepoxide. It is true that the, he he might not have been given adequate dose of chlorodiazepoxide, so he is delirious. At the same time, you have to look at the other possible causes of delirium as well a head injury urinary tract infection don't know whether the patient is delirious having aspiration pneumonia as you said fat embolism hyponatremia hypoglycemia hepatic encephalopathy all these are possible so a good intern house officer will look at all these possibilities right very good and you have to take a proper history and examination and do relevant investigations to identify the cause because all these causes are really important to intervene early on to prevent further complications for example hyponatremia hypoglycemia you have to detect then and there and treat that right okay 
Now we are move on to other important topic. You will frequently encounter uh, this type of patients uh, when, you, when you are doing your internship. Right. The one is op op heroin withdrawal and heroin intoxication. What I want you to remember is opioid intoxication is fatal and you need to identify Patients with opioid, opioid intoxication or heroin intoxication just stay silent, right? They do not attract your attention. They might silently die if you do not intervene on time, right? But opioid withdrawal patients, uh, they are really agitated, they are shouting, they are moving here and pacing up and down. But opioid withdrawal is not fatal. You can treat them symptomatically right heroin intoxication these are some of the important features of heroin intoxication pupillary constriction drowsiness slurred speech respiratory depression arrhythmia and unconsciousness sometimes patients brought to the uh, etu with unconsciousness when you take the history the patient has been taking heroin inadvertently or advertently they have get a high dose of heroin that is why they are intoxicated so you have to this is a medical emergency you have to make sure abc is stable vital signs are stable then you can treat with naloxone then heroin withdrawal symptoms right you you will see pupillary dilatation my dress is there that is an uh, important feature to differentiate. Heroin withdrawal may resemble severe flu-like illness, rhinorrhea, sneezing, yawning, lacrimation, abdominal and leg cramping, right? Goosebumps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So these are some of the symptoms of heroin withdrawal and patients presented to, present to you with extreme distress, right? So they want you to do something. So in this situation, you have to educate the patient, right? The symptoms of heroin withdrawal last only one or two weeks, right? If patient can put up with these symptoms, they will no longer experience. But at the same time, with this, given this knowledge, you have to treat, uh, because these symptoms are really distressing, you have to treat symptomatically, right? You have to treat pain, you have to treat insomnia, you have to treat rhinorrhea and sneezing, right? All these things you can treat symptomatically, right? And it's really, really important for you to refer these kind of patients to uh, appropriate services like psychiatric referral and MOMH referral. You can refer to whatever the available services. Okay? Right. Right. So, any questions? Right, so there are a few questions. I'll, how can I? Yeah. Um, uh, if patient present with hypoglycemia without signs of symptoms of Wernicke syncephalus, do we need to start thiamine? Mean, yes, you have to because patient is all in an already depleted state of thiamine. It's really important to start thiamine with glucose to prevent uh, to prevent uh, Uh, 
Okay. Heliperidol IM vial available in government hospitals is 5 milligrams. So giving 2.5 milligram, okay. Uh, no, if delirium tremens, it is you don't have to give IM heliperidol in delirium tremens. Uh, sorry, so that is something else. Uh, any patient with heroin intoxication in medical or surgical ward, do we have to inform the authorities? Uh, I don't think so. You don't inform the directors and police officers, but you can do a psychiatric referral. Uh, time in dose as well. Usually we give 100 milligram BD, IV or IM. But there is no consensus as to kind of what's the maximum dose or something. The, I would say that if you can give 200 milligram BD, that would be better because they are in a depleted state. But it's the usual dose of IVI M thymine. We usually give 100 milligram BD, but it's perfectly okay you to give 200 milligram BD as well. Right. Uh, repeat the treatment for one case cause of all. it is thiamine monitoring the patient and so once you complete the IV thiamine uh, for, for if you say 100 milligram BD for five days then you can continue the oral thiamine after that yeah we can give IV thiamine for five days two times a day thereafter followed by oral thiamine Uh, Amila, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I mean, these interns will be very busy and they'll have a lot of medical and surgical things to attend to. What do you think is their role in uh, something like a brief intervention? Like if they identify somebody with alcohol misuse, is there a place for them to help these patients? Yes, Chamra. Actually, that's a really, really important question. So, so there is always, so people think Sometimes people think it is not effective to kind of talk to a patient with alcohol or kind of a heroin misuse or tobacco misuse. But research shows 10 second interventions are also effective, right? So you can talk to the patient, get their understanding and what are the problems of alcohol misuse, why you are taking alcohol, right? What are the problems of you taking alcohol? And patient might say a few things, it might affect my economy, it might affect my liver, then you can enlighten him with further information like it can affect all your organs, it can affect social, family, your job, finance, everything, right? So you can get him to think what you call decisional balance and you can have another chat with the patient, what would you like to be in five years down the line, right? Can you be achieve those targets with this uh, substance misuse, right? So if you want to achieve those targets, it's, is it good to kind of a quit tobacco smoking or alcohol, stop alcohol or something? And you have to always, you can say that there are services available and these interventions are really effective and we have to bolster the efficacy and we have to improve the patient's self-confidence that patient can come off alcohol or other psychoactive substances. I think Chamara, that is really important thing and which is very effective as well. Right. Uh, thank you, Amila. I mean, uh, sorry, I might have missed it, Mike. I had a connection problem. Did you take this question about heroin intoxication and informing authorities? Uh, yes, I did. Oh, yeah. And you I'm did, no? Yeah. Okay. Right. I didn't hear that. That's all. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amila Isuru. Uh, if you don't mind, if you could stay for a while and just scream through the chat. And if anybody else has any other questions, please put it to Dr. Amila Isuru, who will uh, type in his answer. Uh, then uh, we'll take a five minute break. Uh, Y'all can get a cup of tea uh, and uh, we'll start at 1030 with the next session. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Isuru. Thank you, Shandra.
Okay. Good morning. Uh, Y'all can continue to have a cup of tea while listening to the uh, next lecturer and the next topic. So it's a very important area, uh, different to the other topics. Uh, all of y'all are very clever and y'all have a lot of knowledge and to come to this level. Uh, but what really makes a good doctor is a bit more than a knowledge and ability, which y'all have a lot. And what we generally consider a really good intern or a good doctor is somebody who is able to communicate well with their patients make them feel at ease, show empathy. So with this in mind, uh, I'll invite the next speaker, Dr. Sayuri Pereira, a senior lecturer and consultant psychiatrist at Pera Denia. So all the Pera students will know uh, Dr. Pereira well. And uh, she will talk about counseling patients and breaking bad news. Uh, over to you, Dr. Pereira. Thanks, Chamara. Thank you for that introduction. Um, let me see if my screen works. Okay, I hope you can see a blank white screen at the moment. Can you? Yes, uh, we can see the white screen and you're very clear. Thank you. Right, thank you. So good morning to each and every one of you. And before I start, I must actually congratulate you all in finally completing your life as a medical student and now venturing out into the world as young doctors. And of course, the inevitable first step is the internship, which I'm sure all of you will sail through quite easily. <clears throat> now, in a few months time, this is you, right? This is you as a fresh new intern, very enthusiastic, very sort of ready with your skills and abilities and venturing out to treat all the patients who need your help, right? You'll be working in busy wards and, you know, interacting with patients and other healthcare workers, pretty much nonstop round the clock. So in, my, in your mind, you probably think, yeah, you'll be this smiling, happy, peaceful doctor. But in reality, it will be more like this. You'll be answering phone calls, you'll be clocking in patients, you'll be examining patients, you'll need to present at ward rounds, you'll need to go back and forth between theaters and clinics and wards, right? It's not going to be as peaceful as you imagine. You'll be in a constant battle against the clock uh, with a million things to cross off your list before the end of the day. Believe me, we have all been there, okay? So it'll probably be a very, very tough year. Now, in this day and age where robotics and computers are taking over pretty much everything that people used to do, what if we replace you, right? This busy intern who's running here and there having a million things to do, you're feeling tired, you're feeling sleepy, you're hungry, uh, there's no time to eat, hardly any rest. What if we replace you with, with a robot house officer, right? He will be able to, well, he or she uh, will be not in need of any toilet breaks, any meal breaks. He can break rest the whole night, right? He will be very, very fast. Um, and we'll probably do a good job overall because we have robotics in surgery as well now. So even skills are being handed over to robots. So what if we replace you interns with a set of robots, right? What is the one thing? Well, there are many things, but pertaining to what we are going to be discussing today, what do you think is the one thing that the robot cannot do, but which you can do. Do you have any idea? What will the robot not be able to do? I'll tell you this, right? The robot will not quite be able to 
imagine or understand how someone else may be thinking or feeling right and that is a very very important virtue that we as humans uh, possess and that i think chamar gave it away at, at the start and that is empathy right and for what we're going to be discussing today the topic that i'm going to be discussing today empathy plays a huge huge role in what we are going to be discussing today and that is counseling patients and breaking bad news i'm sure as undergraduates you would have had lectures on counseling and breaking bad news i'm sure you would have had classes you would have seen your seniors um senior cons the the senior treating team um doing this you would have experienced this you probably have been a part of this but let's just recap on what this is all about okay so the, for those of you who don't know me this is who i am uh, i'm sure you've had chamar introducing me as well so i'm from peradeniya i'm sure there are peradeniya graduates here in the audience today so let's focus on the first part which is counseling patients right um now if you if you look at the origin it it, it comes from a, the latin word consilium which means to offer consultation or advice it's basically giving advice to somebody that's how the term originated um but if you look at the dictionaries this is what it says so slight variations in the exact definition but it's the provision of professional assistance it's not just you having a friendly chat with someone it's a provision of professional assistance and guidance you're assisting and guiding someone who needs help with some personal or psychological problems now i'm sure you're thinking that even before this definition came about we have been doing this we have always been doing this long before there were psychiatrists and counselors and therapists in this world people have been doing this okay people have been there for each other helping and guiding the other person through their problems because i'm sure you've heard of this a problem shared is a problem halved okay if you share your problems it feels as if some weight of that is taken away from you okay i'm sure you have experienced this before and unknowingly you would have counseled so many of your friends uh during this period of time but this is what it actually is so a problem shared is a problem halved and it was i think only in the 1950s that this term counseling was officially given this name right it was introduced by certain psychologists and now it has very much formed a, a firm part of a solid part of our practice and it happens every day day in and day out we are doing this right so it's a therapy it's not really a skill it's more than a skill counseling is a kind of a therapy and it allows people to discuss and explore problems thoughts and any difficult feelings right this is just broadening out from the definition right right so they can discuss and explore with you their problems thoughts so any difficult feelings of course in a safe and most importantly confidential environment okay so this is how the counseling should work so why do we need to counsel patients is it a must right do we have to do this okay now don't think that patients or people have to have a mental health problem in order to receive counseling you don't have to have a diagnosis of a mental health problem to have counsel okay that's that's as kind of a mis misunderstanding that you all have okay see when people come to hospital for treatment or to a clinic even for you and me it's where we work 
right? The hospital is where we work and we're quite used to it. But for people, non-medical people, walking into a hospital, getting admitted is, is a nightmare, okay? They are helpless. They don't know much about the illness. They don't know what the outcome is going to be like. They're very much alone. They're missing their family, friends, right? You have people with pre-existing mental health problems who may need to come in for other issues. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty in the minds of patients who come into hospital. And you need to, you need to be aware of that. You need to remember these are non-medical people, right? With a lot of, lot of stressors playing in their mind, okay? Now, having said that, this, this, this process of counseling is not easy. I'll tell you why it's not easy, because it's not something you can just do in 30 seconds and finish it off with. It takes time. It takes a lot of patience. And some patients can be difficult, okay? They can be quite difficult. They can be distressed. They can be angry. They can be resentful. So you need to communicate well with them, right? You need to, you need to uh, develop your verbal and nonverbal communication skills. You need to speak calmly and clearly in a very non-judgmental way. I think I don't need to explain what, what I mean by being non-judgmental since people will be telling you a lot of personal things for which you cannot judge them. Right? And you need to ensure that you maintain confidentiality. That's part and parcel of what counseling is. And I think the most important thing is that you have to make them feel that they have been listened to. Okay? You have to make them feel that they have been listened to. That's vital as, as, as someone who is going to counsel patients. Right? Now, as a, as a young intern, you may feel that it's a bit of a waste of time because, you know, unlike blood pressure or your white cell count or your abdominal ultrasound scan report or your CT scan report or your LP report, you can't really measure it or really see the end result despite having spent time doing this thing, right? It's not something measurable in any way. But for the patient, for the patient, it has a huge impact because the mere fact that you are counseling, you are there for this patient, you are guiding them through their uncertainty, has a huge impact on the way he or she will feel thereafter. Right? It will hopefully help give some fresh perspective into their problems. And definitely, it will have a huge impact on the quality of life during their stay in this hospital and, and hopefully which will carry on thereafter as well. And research has shown that if you properly counsel your patients, right, whether it is about the illness or the outcome, whatever it is that you're counseling this patient about, in terms of the doctor-patient relationship, it has shown to improve adherence to your treatment program, right? So that is the outcome. Right? All of this, you are making a huge impact on the quality of life of this other person. Right? So please bear that in mind. Counseling is a huge part. And, and like I said, it's, it's beyond measuring blood pressure or taking bloods or doing an ECG or an ultrasound. It's, it's to do with this underlying empathy that you have to inculcate, all right? Okay, so then let's move on to the next half. So we've spoke about counseling. Is it similar to breaking bad news? Are there two different things or what is it all about, right? Now, this is, breaking bad news is also something that draws on your virtue of empathy. This is also an instant in your life as an intern and thereafter, even after your internship, right? The counseling and the breaking bad news need to be carried on throughout your life as a doctor. So it's very, very important that you understand the basics of this, right? 
So breaking bad news, let's see what that is all about. Now, breaking bad news is this. Any news that drastically and negatively affects the patient's view of his or her future. Drastically and negatively, any news is what we call breaking bad news. Of course, there may be slight differences in the terminology, but you get the idea of what it is, right? Do you know this person? Who is this? Do you know who this is? Anyone? Well, he's a cyclist, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Do they are know? typing in the answer. Sorry? Oh, have yes, they? Oh, okay. Can you read out the answer? My chat is a little bit. Oh, so, that's uh, Armstrong. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is Lance Armstrong. He's a, he's a world renowned cyclist, right? Um, do you know what happened to him? So, he was diagnosed with severe form of cancer. Right, he had a testicular cancer, which is pretty bad. And he said, the day he walked out from his home to the hospital, because the doctors said, you know, you need to come into hospital, we have some information for you about your illness. Right? Um, oops. So when he was asked to come into hospital by the doctors, because they need to speak to him about his illness, he said, um, I left my house as one person and came home another. You know, this news of his cancer made me a different person. Not that he has changed morphologically, but you get the idea, right? It, this bad news you have it has to happen to you for you to realize how bad it is the impact that it has on your life okay so he said that um, you know you may be world famous but it can still have this huge impact on your life so see i told you before when we spoke about counseling as well patients and family anticipate the worst when you're in hospital. What is the worst? What do I mean by that? Death and disability. Those are the worst things that can happen. And particularly when you are receiving treatment as an inward patient, they think invariably this is going to end up with death or disability, not only for the patient, but even close family and friends of the patients. So it's a very, very anxiety provoking, unpleasant time period. Right? And actually, the reality is, of all the patients that you will be seeing, some will have favorable outcomes. They will. Some will get better and they will go home. But the reality is that some will have undesirable outcomes. There will be under undesirable diagnosis, right? undesirable prognosis. This is the reality. Okay, it's not a bed of roses at the hospital. It's not all smiles and laughs. Okay, there are undesirable moments. And the patient and of course the family it needs to know about this. Right? Um, there was a lot of thought about this breaking bad news, whether you should tell only parts of it and you know, withhold certain parts of it. But then with time, uh, there was this a lot of movement about patient rights and what patients need to know because it is pertaining to them, isn't it? So it's unfair to withhold information. And actually patients, most patients request this to be so, you know, tell me the entire thing, tell me the truth of what this is. This is the general understanding of most patients. So giving this unpleasant news to this patient and the family is termed breaking bad news. And usually 
it is done by the most senior member of the treating team. So why are we telling you about it then? The reason we're telling you about it is because one thing is you will be part of this team and you need to know what's going on. The second thing is you will also be the most senior member of a treating team at one point in your life, all of you, right? So there's not going to be another lecture on breaking bad news when you are the most senior, most person. So, so try to inculcate these habits now itself, even though, are, even though you are starting at the very bottom of the ladder at the moment, okay? Right. Now, it is one of the most difficult tasks. Why? Because you're not sure how the patient will respond and how are you going to deal with the emotional response that the patient might throw at you and the family for that matter. There will be anger, there will be denial, there will be displeasure, right? And all of that is going to bounce onto you. And you are going to be the person who is taking away the hopes of the patient. Now, patient came to hospital with the hope of, you know, getting a few investigations and going home in a couple of days. But then you are coming to him with this bad news that that hope is going to be cut off because you are going to be here with this, whatever this complication that you have developed. And unfortunately, your hope of going home is no longer reality. And you are the one who has to go and tell this. See, as, 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 as sort of humans, we like to be in the good books of people. We don't like to be the bad person who brings this bad message across. Okay. Unfortunately, that is why it is one of the most difficult tasks. And unfortunately, I must tell you this, in certain places, because it is such an unpleasant task, this ta the, 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 the task of giving the bad news is handed over from the senior to the slightly junior people in the team. And it should not be that way. It, it, is, it is, should be the senior person who deals with it. Okay, but if you are unfortunate, we must be realistic now. There are units where these things happen. So bear that in mind also. So what patients have told us is that the attitude of the doctor, the clarity of the message, the amount of privacy that was given, and the ability of the doctor to answer the questions that the patient and the family had for them is what works. It really works, okay? So that takes away that unpleasantness. It takes away the, the hostile or the distressed response that the patient might give to you. Okay, so how do we do that? So you have to do it in a way that will facilitate acceptance and understanding. So the patient has to say, okay, right, I understand, I accept that, after you've spoken to them. Now I must tell you that there are various protocols, right? Various, um, various divisions of medicine have various protocols that they stick to. So, I mean, you can follow either protocol. It's not, there's no hard and fast rule that you need to stick to this protocol or that protocol. All of it pretty much have the same substance in it, right? But I came across this very easy to remember mnemonic, the ABCDE model, and let's just see what it means. So A is for advanced preparation. So you can't just walk into a patient and give the bad news the moment you receive the diagnosis. You have to prepare yourself for giving this bad news. So familiarize yourself with the clinical information. What is the diagnosis, right? What are the treatment options? Because you will be asked these things. What's the prognosis like? So, so you can't be sort of fumbling there in front of the patient. So have all the background stuff with you. Right? If it is a tumor, it's inoperable because of the location, or we can do this, and if the plan is this. So you must know a little bit about what is clinically available for you at the moment. Then you must ensure 
that there is a private and comfortable location with no interruptions. Please inform your colleagues not to interrupt you. Please either give your phone to someone or leave it on silent mode. Don't keep looking at your watch or at the clock on the wall. That's very rude. And before you actually go and speak to them, mentally in your head, rehearse how you will do this. It's very important that you appear to be prepared. Okay, you appear to be prepared. Okay, right. Then the next thing is build. Build a therapeutic relationship. This is not a new word to you. You know what therapeutic relationship or therapeutic envir environment means, right? You, you should determine how much they want to know, right? So after you have introduced yourself, of course, I think bullet three should come first. So you introduce yourself, you ask who, else, who the other people are, right? And the relationship to the patient. Right, then you need to say, you need to foreshadow the bad news. You need to be quite open and you need to say, I'm sorry to say this, but I do have some bad news. There's no point hiding it. That is what you have come for, right? And you must, you must clarify how much of it they want to know. And most people will say, no, doctor, tell us, tell us we are ready for it. So tell us what, what the problem is. Right? If the patient is alone, ask them to have some family members with you and that you can always reschedule if they want family members with you. It's always helpful. It's always sort of comforting for the patient to have their family or friends with them. And it's not a one-off meeting. So you must say that you will be available because this is a sudden sort of huge chunk of information that is not easy to digest for the patient. Right, so you can say you're available for a follow-up meeting and you know, you say when you'll be around so that you can meet up with them. Communicate well. C is for communication, right? You, are, you need to ask what they already know. So they may already know that there is something. Okay, we were told that there is a tumor in this particular part of the brain, but we were not told more than that. We were not told whether it's operable or not. So they know a little bit, but they don't know the whole picture, right? Try not to use medical terms, medical jargon. This is difficult enough for the patient as it is. Mm -hmm. So use simple language that patients can understand, that a non-medical person can easily understand, right? And you should allow for silence. You must allow time for silence and for tears. Okay, and, and it, it can make you feel very uncomfortable when the patient is very silent and the patient starts to cry and there's a huge void of silence there. Don't try to start filling up that void by talking nonstop. Leave the silence as it is, okay? And if the patient is crying, you, you should allow that, allow for that without cutting it off, okay? And proceed at the patient's pace. So you need to, you know, take it at the pace that the patient is comfortable. Of course, encourage questions. And like I mentioned before, summarize. So what we've spoken about is this, this is what it is. So you thought it is this, but it is actually this. And we have spoken to so-and-so. So the next step is this. I'll, I'll come back to you in two days time where we can. You know. So summarize and make up follow-up plans. Make follow-up plans, okay? This is the worst thing. So you must be ready. You must be ready emotionally for the emotions um, that may be hitting you. I told you there'll be a lot of anger and denial. Doctor, you must have got it wrong. There's no way that it can be this. How can this be this? You guys have made a mistake. This is all the doctor's fault. A lot of blame onto you unnecessarily. Don't retaliate and try to defend yourself and your team when the patient is overloading his emotions onto you. Just be silent and be attentive to body language cues. Some patients may not be um, very, very sort of outright 
uh, and obvious with their reactions. So be attentive to body language cues as well, right? And, you know, encourage and validate. Uh, see, what this means is offer a realistic hope. Don't paint a sort of a borrow picture of a fairy tale ending when you know that it's not going to be like that. So even if Kyo is not in the horizon, you can encourage them as to what we can do, right? Let's do this. These are the available options. And we are going to do the referrals. We are going to refer you to oncology. We are going to refer you to endocrinology. So I will take care of that, right? And some patients, you know, you can inquire and touch on the spiritual side. It's a very, it plays a huge role in, in, in our culture and our context. Right? People are very much close to their spiritual side and you can allow for their spiritual needs and be sensitive to the spiritual needs of the various ethnicities in our country. Okay, don't be rude and sort of say, oh, we can't allow for this, this is, this is a very difficult time for the patient. So you must, bring out the empathy that you have for this patient. Okay. So that is what the breaking bad news is all about. What I want to tell you is, in ancient Greece, there was this, you know what Greece is like, right? It's a country, not the Greece on the vehicles or in your food. But in ancient Greece, there used to be this sort of, how do I say, a ritual, not ritual, I would say a, a sort of a rule that if a messenger brings bad news, those days there is no phone calls and texts and stuff, right? So messages are brought by a messenger. If the messenger brings bad news, that messenger is killed. So be thankful that you are not working as a house officer in Greece back then. You are here in this day and age where the messenger is not being shot for bringing bad news. Okay. So it, you have to have to remember to uh, sort of be the bearer of bad news and that it, it is for the best interest of the patient, not, not that you love bringing bad news. It's part of the management and you need to be part of the team that is bringing this bad news to the patient. So you don't think that you will be shot or murdered, okay? Uh, but I've told you what to expect and how to prepare yourselves for that, okay? So what I want to tell you is good luck with your future as young doctors. I'm sure you will make your respective faculties very proud with your work. And just, just to take home message that I wanna tell you, um, you have many virtues as a doctor, right? You are able to, you have to interview patients, make diagnoses, draw blood, ECGs, present at ward rounds, endless things. Remember to, to keep the empathy alive, okay? Don't let the empathy inside you die because connecting with patients is a huge part of your job. So keep the empathy alive, not only during your internship, but throughout life as a medical practitioner. Thank you so much. I hope I haven't taken up too much time. Let's see what you all have. Yeah, uh, that's fine, uh, Dr. Perra. And uh, there are a few questions. Uh, one is, uh, if a patient, when a patient is dead, do we get to tell the family or should we wait until a senior comes on how to tackle? Oh, interesting question. Well, I suppose it depends on the context that you are in. If a patient has died at two o'clock in the morning and you know, patient, you, you're in a hurry to sort it out and the patient also, the family also requests this, then it is part of your job because I say the senior person should ideally do it, but practically, pragmatically, that is not always possible. Okay, so there may be instances. Madam, it's really nice to see you as para graduates. 
So, uh, so it's not always practically possible. Okay, there will be instances where it will be up to you, but generally, it 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 is done by the senior person. <clears throat> There's a, another very important question, uh, Sairi. Madam, if the relations ask not to say the bad news to the patient, how can we proceed? Yeah, so it's like this. Now, as doctors, we are working in the best interest of the patient. The patient is our is, is the best interest. But um, for the patient, um, you, your main interaction is with the patient. Right? The patient is the most important person in your dealing as, as your work as a doctor. Of course, there are many schools have thought about it and there are a lot of raised questions about this, should we not tell? Um, I think the latest understanding is that a patient has a right to know, right? A patient has a right to know about their condition um, because see, one relation will say, don't tell the patient. What if the next relation says, no, tell the patient, then what are you going to do, right? So you have to work in the best interest of the patient and move forward. That is, that is my suggestion. Right. Now, with the COVID crisis, how can we improve with the PPEs? Mm. Patients may not see our facial expressions. We might need to speak loud. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, COVID is a very new phenomenon. It's, it's very sort of an unexpected thing and PPEs are forced on us in terms of, you know, keeping this horrible pandemic at, at bay. So that is, of course, I don't think you can, you know, take off the PP and show your face and do this, but then we can remember that there is a lot of nonverbal body language cues that you can use. Right. You can your voice itself. You can be quite empathetic with your voice and your body language, even if the patient can't see your face. So let's move forward, uh, Rasika, isn't it, with whatever best way that we can. Right. OK, is that that? It, yeah, uh, that uh, that's that can I ask a question uh, when you're talking to a patient, uh, Dr. Perra, let's say you feel they are depressed and uh, you want to ask and you wonder whether they might be suicidal, but you're also busy. Uh, sometimes doctors prefer not to ask this. And there's also a sort of an idea that asking this question might worsen the situation. Uh, how would you deal with such a patient? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Vijay Singh, thank you so much. That's a very, very valid and important question. I think, so you have been trained, right? As doctors, you have had a very thorough training in psychiatry and you know how common and how prevalent things like depression are, and you have seen how many people resort to self-harm as a result of this. If you pick up any signs, you may be wrong, right? It's, it, you may have overestimated it, but if you feel that a patient is depressed, please don't hesitate to refer. You must do that because don't think that psychiatry patients are only in the psychiatry wards. Actually, more patients are in other wards and in the community than inside the psychiatry wards. And you know, each and every hospital has a, has a fantastic team of psychiatrists attached to it. So I would suggest that you do not hesitate to contact your psychiatric team and offer help. Isn't it? Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Perra. If you don't mind hanging on, hanging uh, around for about five minutes, there sure. might be some questions in the chat and you can type in them or if you have got personal messages. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start no the next session uh, in five minutes. So you'll have a five minute break.
Okay, and um, let's move on to the next session, which is very important uh, and uh, excellent participation uh, by you all. You all are sending in a lot of questions and interacting. So please continue that. We are happy to take any of your questions, uh, which will help you in your internship. Uh, the next topic is about uh, from Dr. Dulangi Dahanayaka, who's a senior lecturer and consultant, child, child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Lady Ridgeway Hospital, Colombo, and uh, at the uh, University of Faculty of Medicine, University, University of Colombo. And uh, many of you, I mean, the 50% of you all will uh, possibly work in uh, pediatric wards. And it will be a difficult job. And to work with ill children is a very difficult thing. And all these children uh, and their mothers or fathers will be psychologically affected by their condition as well. So it's very important that you not only treat the pediatric aspect of it, but the psychological aspect as well. And this is what Dr. Dulangi Dahanayake will talk to you about, about mental illness in a pediatric ward. Uh, over to you, Dr. Dahanayake. Thank you, Dr. Chamara. Uh, so uh, I will, uh, I hope that uh, it was very nice to hear that you have been actively participating and I hope that we can continue that during my session because this is all about how to apply the knowledge that you have already gained from your five or six or seven years in medical faculty in actual practical settings. So you will be faced with different types of challenges as opposed to your uh, medical student days when you are working in a pediatric setting. And I will uh, sort of uh, guide you through some of the things that uh, you might you know, come across and how you can uh, make certain, um, uh, active, act take certain actions in order to uh, help the uh, little kids that you see, as well as their parents. Because like uh, Dr. Chamara mentioned, it's very important that we work with the parents because um, they are also in a lot of distress when children are unwell. And unless we have the support from the parents, it's very difficult for us to look after a little child. Yes, yeah, so, and uh, while I'm doing the lecture, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat box or even like unmute yourself and ask questions. That's perfectly fine. Because this is all about obtaining those practical skills that you will need as uh, intern house officers and you will have a lot of questions and I'm happy to sort of uh, make this uh, into a discussion as we go along. Yeah, so what I thought I'll uh, speak to you briefly about is uh, what a child's experience is like when they visit or stay in the hospital. And then uh, we'll touch briefly about the common mental health disorders in children. I'm sure you would have all, all learned about the common mental health uh, disorders that can occur in kids. Uh, but um, what I want you to really get from today's session is about when you should be concerned, when you see a child with a behavior or emotional uh, difficulty or difference, how do you decide whether you should be concerned about this, whether this needs referral to a mental health uh, clinic or whether this is something that's transient and uh, age appropriate. So we might, uh, we will discuss briefly on that. And then uh, I'll also touch on how to support children's mental well-being when they are in a hospital setting, because that is also uh, an aspect that is uh, very much needed. Because in BC pediatric settings, we can, um, at times when we are really, you know, working hard and we have had a lot of uh, issues and a lot of work to do that we might sometimes not pay a lot of attention to the mental well-being which is of course extremely important for the physical well-being of children and also the parents. So what do you think it is like for a child to come to the hospital? So I think uh, you would have all seen this sort of setting in our hospital where we have the beds and the kids are in the, I mean, lying on the bed. Sometimes they are also like 
maybe two per bed or even on the floor. So it's a very different environment. Just imagine if you are a little, say, a toddler, three to four year old. So you are not tall enough to see what's happening on top of the beds. And you are standing in the ward when you come in with your mother. So it's all very overwhelming for a child. Uh, there's a lot of new information, a lot of input, a lot of noise, a lot of people, changes in the environment. So all of it can really overwhelm a child, especially uh, toddlers and uh, children who are very young. Um, like a 10, 11 year old may understand what uh, this is about, but a very small child may become very overwhelmed and um, extremely distressed when they are first brought to the ward. So that would be like a normal reaction. Because uh, if the child, uh, you know, it's when whenever you expose a small child to a new situation, there will be a bit of an adjustment period. So the child is physically unwell when they come to a pediatric ward. And on top of that, there's all this new information to process and become used to. And then it can be, and especially if they also have like memories of, um, you know, being given vaccinations or other injections or other procedures, they might have even uh, uh, more difficulty adjusting when they come to the ward setting. And even the clinics are like that, very crowded, a lot of people milling around and the kids would have uh, difficulty uh, engaging with you in the clinic setting sometimes because we sometimes get referrals where the kids have behaved very erratically in the clinic settings. But if you take a history, the mother would say that uh, there have not been any major issues in terms of the behavior at home and the teachers have also not made any complaints. So then it's more likely that the kids had some difficulty adjusting to the situation when they came for the clinic visit. And if, as if these issues were not enough, now our kids are also faced with people wearing these moon suits. So like when people are in PPE and wearing shields and masks and everything, then it's even more traumatic for the children. So there's a lot of uh, trauma involved in coming to the hospital for a little child, especially if you also like admit the child, then there's a lot of adjustment and new things for the child children to learn. And some of these experiences might even be a bit traumatic. So you have to really weigh all these when you decide whether a child needs admission or not. I know that you may not be the like the primary uh, person deciding on the admission, but it's always best to manage children as much as possible in their naturalistic settings rather than admitting unless absolutely necessary because all this can be very overwhelming and traumatic and children might have a lot of behavioral and emotional disturbances when they are admitted in the hospital. So that is to be expected. So you might see kids who are crying, who are angry and who are just, you know, refusing to engage with anything you want them to do. So there are a lot of behavioral challenges. If say if you are trying to get uh, blood sample or if you are trying to give an injection or if you are at least you know trying to do the basic physical examination it might prove very challenging in some kids because they are really in distress they may cry they may get angry they may throw things at you so there can be a lot of challenges so what we need to develop is the understanding that these sort of challenges are normal and we need to work on work with the parents and other staff members to create a, as friendly atmosphere as possible so that we try to sort of uh, minimize this sort of thing from happening in the uh, pediatric wards. So if you see this sort of kid, does this mean that this child has a mental illness? So what are your thoughts on say a child is screaming, kicking, making a big fuss in the ward. So how would you decide whether this child is having a mental illness or whether this is like a, a behavioral adjustment phase for this particular admission? What are the what are some pointers that you might uh, identify? Yes, Sarindu, you have raised your hand. Sarindu Dantanara? Yeah, that's uh, accidental, uh, Dulangit. Ah. Like ah. that for a while. Yeah. Ah, all right. Okay. Take the questions at the end, they'll type it in. 
Ah, okay. All right. So what, uh, will you be able to let us know what your thoughts are on how to differentiate a child with a mental illness as opposed to a child who's struggling uh, to adjust to the environment in the world? Any thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sorry, your name is not there. So some uh, one, uh, one person has said that um, we should ask about uh, whether the similar behavior is there at home. Yes, we have to get the history from parents. We have to ask the parents what the children are usually like. And also, yes, Tanya has mentioned whether the behavior is similar at school. So we need to see whether this behavior is uh, occurring across different settings. What else can we ask about? What are the other pointers towards to suggest that this may be a mental illness? Yeah, so we should ask whether it's occurring across settings and whether, sorry, yeah, so whether it's uh, occurring across settings and we should also look at the, uh, whether there are any develop, associated developmental concerns. So we should get a good developmental history from the parents because uh, say a child with a, uh, global developmental delay or intellectual developmental disorder would struggle more than a child with uh, typical development to adjust to the new environment. So we will need to look into developmental concerns and also see whether this is a developmentally appropriate reaction. Say if a 10-year-old comes to the world setting and kicks up a big fuss just when we uh, suggest admission, then that is a bit concerning as opposed to a 2-year-old with a similar tantrum. So we have to look at the developmental level and the uh, concerns and uh, see whether the child's uh, development is age appropriate and uh, whether the behavior is appropriate for the developmental level. And then we have to look into uh, the pattern of symptoms. So when we diagnose uh, psychiatric disorders, there are specific diagnostic criteria that we used to say that this is a disorder as opposed to a uh, behavioral or emotional reaction. So then we need to look into those patterns. For example, say if we are thinking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, then we have to look at the uh, whether the child is having features of hyperactivity, inattention, impulsivity, when was the onset and also the duration. So duration criteria are also important when we are uh, considering whether this is actually a uh, mental health disorder. And then we also need to look at the distress and impairment and occurrence across settings. So if the child has significant uh, distress, like there is a lot of distress in the child or in the family because of worries or anxieties or other behavioral issues or emotional issues, then again, we have to consider whether there is an underlying mental health disorder. And then we also need to look into the level of impairment, the functional impact this has on the child. So for example, say there's a, you see a six year old who appears to be very hyperactive in the clinic. So if you ask the mother about what uh, sort of impact this has on the child, if the mother says that the teacher is hitting the child always because he wouldn't follow commands, if, if all the other kids are rejecting him because he's, you know, pulling their things and poking them and being very impulsive. And if the child isn't doing his schoolwork because he can't concentrate for adequate period of time to sort of um, get to it, then we have to consider uh, uh, that there is significant uh, associated impairment, functional impact from this symptom. Then, of course, these things will... Uh, prompt us to refer a child to the psychiatric unit. So like I mentioned initially, when a child comes to a hospital setting, there are a lot of problems that they face. So it could be related to the physical illness. Sometimes the child might be in a lot of pain or discomfort that he, or maybe because of associated vomiting or 
some other symptom they might be you know very irritable and cranky because they are in uh, distress due to the physical illness and sometimes uh, i think you would have had session had a session on delirium and things so children can also present with features of delirium due to uh, different uh, insults and then uh, this can also lead to uh, difficulties in the uh, behaviors and emotions and difficulty in engaging them in uh, necessary therapeutic interventions in a pediatric ward and then they may also have pre existing mental health difficulties that may impact on their behavior like i said if they have an element of intellectual developmental disorder they may struggle to comprehend what's happening when they come to the ward and then they might behave in a erratic manner because they have they have struggles they may also have issues with their communication so they may not be able to communicate say even if the child is 10 years in age if the cognitive age is around 4 5 years they may not have the ability to communicate appropriately for a 10 year old and they may not understand what we are trying to express and those things can also create challenges for children in hospital setting and then we some of these kids may have impaired ability to process information because of cognitive capacity emotional distress and they may also be getting different information from different sources sometimes uh, the doctor might say that you know we need to give you this medication and then the parent might feel distressed when the child is told that because the child doesn't like to take medication and then the mother might you know lie and say no nothing is wrong with you and then there's that uh, uh you know the conflicting information that the child is getting so all that can affect the child's emotions and behaviors and of course the disturbance in routine when they come to the ward their normal routine at home is totally disrupted so that can also lead to problems and then yeah like i said this uh new uh, things happening in the hospital environment may be difficult for the child to process and families may also struggle because they are worried they are confused and they may be physically exhausted like we are we see pay mothers who have been sitting near the child's bed for several weeks in a row who are physically really exhausted and then um, there might also be issues with siblings so when the uh, child is in the hospital there are lot of uh, in there's a huge impact on the mental well-being not only of the child but also the family and the sibling so all these can lead to uh, emotional and behavioral disturbances in children so like i discussed how we differentiate these from mental illnesses is we need to look at the we need to get a very good development history and we need to uh, identify whether the patterns of typical uh disorders are there in the child whether it's occurring across settings the duration the level of impairment and also the level of distress so we need to consider all these when we think about whether there is actually a mental illness or whether this is a reaction to being in the hospital so before we move on to the next part on the common disorders that we see do you have any questions you can either unmute yourself and ask or put it as a put it on the chat uh, box okay so if there are no questions from that part we can move on so um again we should uh, have an idea about the common mental health uh, disorders in children so we generally divide it into three broad categories also like these are not mutually exclusive there's a lot of overlap also but we tend to describe in three broad categories developmental disorders emotional disorders and behavioral disorders so when we look at the developmental disorders we need to get a good history like i mentioned to identify whether there is any developmental delay and sometimes there are also deviations in development 
for example in children with autism spectrum disorder there are certain uh, differences in their development and then they have some added features on top of the developmental uh, delay like the uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests so we need to uh, in in when you are working in a pediatric setting you cannot overlook the importance of getting a good developmental history because that will if there are issues there then that will definitely point towards uh, different uh, problems and diagnosis that the child may be having so generally under developmental disorders these are what we consider so i wouldn't uh, want to go into each one of them separately because uh, of time constraints plus you have already had this sort of input so i don't think it's necessary to repeat all this information again and again um so what you need to uh, know and identify is the different patterns of developmental disorders so you need to know about uh, how what are the features of global developmental delay so when you take a good developmental history you have to look into the motor development fine motor gross motor speech and language social development cognitive aspects so all these need to be looked into when you see a child and then uh, you need to also have a you know be when you are seeing a child in your interactions with the child you also need to be aware about uh, features of autism spectrum disorder so there are, we have issues mainly with social communication and social interactions as well as restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests so when we look into social communication and social um, interactions uh, again like i said because this is a different setting there might be different behaviors in children but if there is any suspicion that the child's social behavior is different that he does not he or she does not exhibit uh, appropriate communication then you need to go into a detailed history about this and if you have any suspicion it's always better to like ask your seniors or do a mental health referral because we don't want to miss uh, this sort of thing because early identification is extremely important for the for all child psychiatric disorders especially for the developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder because um, you need to start intervening as early as possible if we are if you are to improve the prognosis for the child and then children may present with what we call specific learning disorders so they may have issues they are like intellectual capacities may be okay but they may have issues with their uh, mathematics skills or their um, their writing reading comprehension so then that is what we call specific learning disorder so if there are concerns about poor school performance uh we need to uh look into whether there are any issues there but of course uh, the expectations of the parents teachers and the abilities of the child may also you know vary widely so it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a psychiatric or like a developmental disorder if the parents complain of poor school performance but if there are any parental concerns we need to look into those and then elimination disorders commonest of which is nocturnal neurosis and then of course uh, tic disorders may also be there so you need to be vigilant for these features emotional disorders again um you have to go by those criteria about the um, occurrence across uh, settings the severity impact duration and also whether it's appropriate or not for the developmental age because certain types of anxieties are uh, seen as a normal developmental phenomena at certain ages for example say separation anxiety is a normal developmental phenomenon that occurs between around 8 uh, to 9 months of age to uh, up to 3 years of age but if there is but if it sort of uh, goes beyond 3 years and if it's very uh, significantly impairing the child's function then we we need to see whether there is a 
and uh, like uh, a mental health disorder. Uh, uh, so whether this um, whether the child's symptoms meet criteria for separation anxiety disorder, rather than it being the separation anxiety that is experienced by norm typically developing children without any major psychiatric uh, issues. So when we uh, look at, look at the uh, emotional disorders, we have to be mindful of the child's developmental age, and also environmental factors are important. Uh, for example, if there's uh, significant uh, domestic violence or other significant uh, traumatic events in the child's life, then uh, they can present as trauma-related disorders uh, like PTSD and other emotional problems. So we need to be uh, very we need to be mindful about the child's environment because when we think of a child, uh, we have to always uh, consider what is happening in the environment around the child because um, the child because children are very vulnerable and dependent on their parents and other adults in their lives they are extremely vulnerable and sensitive to what is happening in their immediate environment at home as well as at school and with the peer group also so you need to be mindful and uh, take the necessary information if you suspect there's a there's any like environmental triggers for emotional problems in the child. So we need to think about, uh, there are different types of emotional disorders. Um, so we see a fair number of these disorders in our clinic settings, and you will come across these in uh, the hospital setting, especially in children with uh, chronic medical illnesses. Uh, or with significant disability due to their uh, an impairment due to their medical illnesses, we might come across a lot of emotional disorders in the pediatric setting. And of course, we cannot forget the trauma-related disorders. Behavioral disorders, again, you have to go by the principles that I mentioned, the pattern of symptoms, severity, occurrence across, across settings, duration, and we have to always judge these against their developmental age and also take into what is happening in the environment around them. For example, uh, say a child is behaving in a very hyperactive manner. So if this is only at home and if there are like significant stressors at home, then it's more likely to be an emotional reaction to whatever the trauma that the child is experiencing rather than it being uh, something like ADHD. So we have to be very uh, mindful of the environment uh, surrounding the child because children are extremely vulnerable to the even the minor changes. So these are the common behavioral disorders that we come across. And I think uh, we are also getting a lot of behavioral addictions these days screen addiction, internet gaming disorders, because the kids are at home and there's a lot of uh, like um, differences in their behaviors related to screen usage and not having the normal peer relationship that they would have had. Like if they were having their normal routines and going to school and all, then uh, things would have been quite uh, different. But being... Uh, being at home, staying in front of screen for hours on end, there are uh, other behavioral addictions that are really coming up. Yeah. So, any questions or clarifications or comments so far on what I have spoken on? So, I didn't really want to go into details about each and every child psychiatric disorder, but you have to remember that there are these three broad categories. So if there are any significant developmental concerns, developmental delays or deviations, if there are any significant and prolonged and uh, severe and distressing emotional issues, and if there are behavioral problems occurring across settings which are distressing and which are, you know, impacting negatively on the child's life, 
then you have to have a high index of suspicion and uh, refer as appropriate. And on uh, top of this, uh, you will also see children who are like having a pre-existing mental health diagnosis. So these children, when you get when you admit to pediatric ward for a physical illness, uh, if they are on medications or other behavioral management regimes, please make sure that you try to continue those as much as possible, because otherwise uh, there would be uh, added difficulties for the child as well as the family. For example, sometimes uh, we see when they come for a acute medical illness, um, unless the intern house officer has taken a good history and you know added to whatever medication and behavior uh, medic modification patterns that are occurring into the management plan, that are the pre-existing plans into the current sort of ward management, this may be overlooked and the child might develop emotional and behavioral issues in the ward setting again. And then that would be challenging for both the child, the parents, as well as the treating team. So just remember if there's a history, just look into it. Uh, and the other thing to remember is uh, children with psychiatric disorders can also present with uh, medical uh, problems so sometimes say for example if they are complaining of recurrent abdominal pain and stuff uh, there is a bit of a you know propensity to think whether this is due to their emotional distress yes it could be but that doesn't mean that you can exclude the child from the normal uh, pediatric care that is offered for children without a pre-existing mental health diagnosis so there's a question, uh, if a child is addicted to mobile phones and games and parents ask for a solution, how can we address that? So there's no hard and fast rules here. Really. So it's mainly about you need to look into uh, the pattern, uh, whether there's actually an element of uh, significant uh, behavioral addiction because sometimes the parents are also very anxious and they may be worried that there's a behavioral addiction, whereas it may be that the child is not using it to like a, an extent that the parent is worried about. And then, of course, we need to look at the age of the child uh, to see what sort of, uh, uh, whether this is uh, developmentally, the amount of screen time and all, because the recommendation from the American uh, College of uh, Pediatrics um, which was the American Association of Pediatrics a uh, few, like before the pandemic was that less than two years, we shouldn't give any screens. Two to seven years, it should be about half an hour. And uh, above uh, um, age seven years, then you can give around one hour until children are 12. And then above 12 is, of course, a bit more uh, flexible. But uh, in having said that, uh, it, especially in the smaller kids, uh, it has to be with parental supervision. So there's no simple answer to like say if the parents say they are worried, uh, how you can address that is of course you need to get a history and see what's happening. You can ask parents to, to sort of set limits uh, on what sort of screen time the child can child has access to and then offer alternative activities for the child to do because sometimes uh, when there's nothing else to do also the child might just spend his time on the like on screens so you need to get that history and uh, find out what's happening but some of the like the broad principles are of course you need to right near like screen time should be uh, uh, you know there should be limits there it and it should uh, ideally be supervised by the parents and um, there should also be like, it should not impact on the child's uh, functional level. So the schoolwork and all those should be, you know, uh, they should have adequate time to spend on those. And um, we have to also look into whether the parents are aware about the different, uh, you know, applications and all that the children are using because sometimes the parents are unaware and there are incidents where children are, you know, uh, victims of exploitation and all. 
So there's another question whether there's a specific medication for ADHD. Yes, we do use medications for ADHD. Uh, we can use stimulants and non-stimulants. So we have methylphenidate, which is fairly widely available. Um, atomoxetine is a non-stimulant medication that is available at LRH and also certain other centers, but it might not be available in like peripheral hospitals. Those are the two main uh, medications that we use in ADHD, but of course, uh, it has to be uh, it is uh, it has to be used in conjunction with behavioral modification plan. It cannot be used on its own. Yeah, so there's another question. If we identify your doubt that parents also may be having some psychological issues like depression, how crucial is it is for us to address? And maybe make referrals for them too. Yes, please refer. Uh, if there, are, if you feel that there is a psychological issue in the parent, please do the appropriate referrals and take appropriate action because sometimes they might not get another, you know, opportunity or chance for uh, the for them to be detected. So if we miss it now, we might uh, not get another chance to uh, see those uh, parents. So we please make sure that uh, if you have any concerns, talk to your seniors and do the appropriate referrals. You can, of course, refer parents. But um, yeah, I mean, it has to be done to adult psychiatric services. But uh, even if you are working in a children's hospital, you can discuss with the mental health uh, unit there and uh, see how you can uh, make the appropriate referral for parents. Yeah. Yeah, so like we discussed, we have to do the appropriate referrals and uh, support the child as well as the parents. So Tanya's question is very pertinent because uh, we, especially if, uh, even if the child's illness is, say, some acute febrile illness, if the parents are having a psychiatric disorder, it's important that we support them and make appropriate referrals because parental mental health is extremely important for the child's well-being. So if the mother is significantly depressed and emotionally unavailable, then there can be, like there are then issues in their uh, relationship with the kids and then that can uh, also impact uh, on the child's uh, life. So there's another question, how long do we follow up children with ADHD? Yeah, so uh, with the ADHD, we have to uh, like a uh, fair number of children's hyperactivity improve and inattention also tends to improve but of course there are some uh, children whose disorder the especially the ability to sustain uh, the impairment in ability to sustain attention may persist into adulthood so there are again is no hard and fast rule as to how long we need to follow up but usually with the diagnosis like ADHD it will be long-term support and follow-up. We can, uh, even if we, we can, like, when we have a behavior management plan, we will need to offer regular follow-up, see how the child is faring. If we start on medication again, we need to assess uh, periodically to see whether the medications are still needed because medications used for ADHD are mainly for symptom relief pros, uh, uh, purposes rather than curative. So we need to be mindful about uh, how long we continue these medications for. So usually the children who are diagnosed as having ADHD will continue long-term follow-up in our units. Yeah, so I just wanted to touch briefly on how to manage an aggressive child in the ward setting because now as an intern house officer, this is another situation you will come across. So the most important thing is that we prepare and prevent escal escalation of violence. So if you know that this child has a history of violence or if there is a uh, high risk for things like delirium, we have to be, you know, we have to prevent and uh, prepare for this sort of management if possible, you know, uh, keep this child in a, like a separate, like if there's a seclusion, like a separate room for, uh, in the unit then that is another thing that we can use to make sure that the child is away from other kids uh, so even if the you know, even if there is an aggressive outburst it can be contained more easily as opposed to if we talk in an open world setting 
So we have to have a plan. We have to discuss with the team, our seniors, the nursing staff, and the supportive staff in the ward. To we have to have a sort of a plan to what to, on what to do if the behavior escalates. Then we have to go through the basic principles of management of an aggressive uh, child. We first we need to try and talk to the child, just validate the child's feelings, um, and support the child to move to a like a calmer space in terms of the mental health. And we can use distraction techniques in children, um, but uh, chemical and geographical restraints are of course like uh, last resorts. We need to try and manage the aggressive behavior as much as possible using behavioral like environmental changes, distractions, as well as verbal de-escalation. Uh, yeah, there's another question. Can we diagnose ADHD or autism in a baby with cerebral palsy? Yes, those can coexist. Mm, yeah, and there's another question. Can we prescribe medications for childhood psychiatric disorders like depression or do we have to refer all times to the psychiatrist? Uh, it's best to refer to the psychiatrist because uh, sometimes uh, childhood depression and especially the childhood mental health illnesses uh, can have various presentations uh, and children might react in so many different ways to what is happening around them. And it might can be very difficult to make a clear demarcation between whether this is a uh, you know reaction to stressors or whether this is actually a, a mental health whether this meets criteria for a mental health disorder or whether this is a transient you know behavioral or emotional issue. So it's always best to refer as much as possible uh, because uh, especially if you think that medication is warranted, it's best to refer because we try to manage as much as possible with behavioral and psychological interventions, especially for the minor cases. So if you feel that medication is warranted, it's always best to refer. Um, yeah, so then we have to like for child abuse, we need high index of suspicion. We have to get support from our senior colleagues and prompt action is necessary. So if you think there's an element of abuse, please have a very high index of suspicion, you know, low threshold for intervention uh, because uh, we don't want to miss uh, uh, an uh, event of, uh, or like the occurrence of child abuse. If, there's, if it's happening, we cannot afford to miss that. So we really need to act very uh, quickly. That's uh, the main thing about child abuse is that we don't miss it and that we take the necessary actions as early as possible. So like we discussed what we need to do as uh, interns working in a pediatric setting is we need to educate ourselves we, and we need to make uh, our, the environment as child friendly as possible. Then of course, like we discussed the appropriate referrals and treatment for mental illnesses then we need to always work together with the parents and carers. And last but not least, we have to always uh, make sure that we are, you know, we are also in a good place physically and mentally. Otherwise, we will not be in a position to help other people. So yes, we, you need to know all this about normal development, common mental health problems, uh, then the importance of environment, then, of course, you need to have some basic skills in communication, counseling, and also you need to always have a very professional approach in all your dealings with patients, families, and your team, and also be aware of the ethical principles underlying uh, pediatric care. Yeah, so when you're communicating with the child, uh, you have to make sure that you offer age-appropriate information, uh, that the child is able to grasp what you are saying. You might need to like offer the information repeatedly and also uh, use other methods to deliver information like drawings and uh, you might uh, you know use dolls to show what you are going to do, like if you are going to do a procedure. So you might need to spend a bit more time communicating. And I think uh, communicating with parents, I think Dr. Sairi's session would have covered about, you know, 
how to communicate with adults, breaking bad moves, all those things. So those principles also we have to adhere to in pediatric settings as well when we are communicating with the parents. And then, like I said, the environment is also extremely important. So we try to, you know, make it as child friendly as possible. Um, and our approach has to be very friendly. We have to sort of, I know with the COVID gear and all things, the PPEs and all, it might, you know, be a challenge. But if we are very, you know, if we offer reassurance support, if we are very consistent in our approach, and if we make an attempt to build a rapport with the child and the family, that goes a long way. And then, like I mentioned, we have to always work together with parents. And please feel, refer parents if you do have suspicion that they are having mental health issues. And we have to always allow them to ventilate their emotions, listen to their concerns, and acknowledge the difficulties they are having so that they feel supported. And we have to have a non judgmental approach. And we have to offer them choices and information. Otherwise, if they feel that we are, you know, very paternalistic, we are not being supportive, they will, you know, be very aversive to our interventions. And then, like I mentioned, we have to also take care of ourselves if we are to support the others. And there is support available for you also. So if you have any concerns, if you feel it, uh, the if you feel overwhelmed when you start, I mean, you will feel overwhelmed when you start your internship. Um, but if you feel that, uh, you know, your struggle is very difficult and that you really can't cope, please don't feel shy to uh, request for support and help from your seniors as well as from the mental health unit in the hospitals that you're working. Yeah. So um, there was another question. Dr. Chamara, do we have time to sort of go through that? Uh, so if you don't mind, Kulangi, they've, been, they've had a session, they've been going on from 8 o'clock. So ah, if you okay. can uh, answer the questions on the main chat, that will be nice and they can take a break. Ah, okay. Break? okay. Uh, if yeah. you could uh, hang around for about five minutes just to see if there are other questions which you might ah. have so they are there. Yeah. Yeah. Type yeah. it so everyone sees. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dhanayaka. Uh, and that was a session with a lot of questions. So please uh, have a bit of a break. You all are doing well. And uh, join us at 12.45 sharp. We'll be talking about psychiatric emergencies in the general hospital wards, medicine, surgery, uh, and gene and OBS. So at 12.45, we will start again. Enjoy your lunch. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dilangi.
Good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me? Can somebody who hears me just type on chat that you can hear me? Okay. Thank you very much. I didn't want to, you know, there's no one to moderate now and I didn't want to talk for 45 minutes and find out that uh, you all can't hear me. Uh, <coughs> so once again, well done. Well done for being here. Uh, not just for finishing school and finishing medical school and being doctors. Also, well done for being in this session after four hours of psychiatry. You all have come back for more. Um, so you all seem to like a bit of punishment. So internship will be uh, easy for you. right? Uh, so we are going to talk about some psychiatric emergencies. I understand this is post-lunch. The post-lunch session is difficult. You all might doze off a bit. Uh, it's good that the mics, uh, the videos aren't on. Uh, but what we'll try to do is, I'd like you all to interact a bit more in this session. Don't worry. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist, so I should understand how you all feel. You all here to be asked questions and answer, most of you all. So what I want you all to do is use the chat as your answer sheet. And for every patient, we will discuss five patients here. For every five patients, there will be questions, and I'd like you to type in your answers, all right? Uh, no marks given, uh, but I would like to see your answers, and then we'll uh, discuss accordingly. Uh, all of us are very competitive people, so I hope uh, you would like to give your answers. No need to type it directly to me. You can type it uh, on the main chat as well, but if you want to send it directly, uh, as a message, that's fine. Okay, so let's take these five patients and let's see how much knowledge you have retained and how ready you are uh, to be great interns. The first patient we'll discuss is a laborer who becomes aggressive in a surgical ward or a surgical intern. Somebody, somebody is very aggressive. Then we'll talk about while you all are in the medical ward, a farmer has suddenly been brought very unsteady, having tremors. What do you do? A patient with a young girl with an overdose has come in, trying to manage, save her life. You notice muscle twitching. There's a patient being treated for gastroenteritis. And suddenly, uh, the eyes roll up and behaving very oddly. What's going to happen here? You see a patient in a medical ward who's very stiff and has high fever spikes. These are all actual patients uh, who have been seen during our on-calls uh, in psychiatry at Ragama and sent from medical and surgical wards. And the initial management of these patients was done by interns like yourself. So these are situations which will you will come across in your internship. So <clears throat> Let's concentrate and see what how we can help these five patients in your ward. This is the first patient. Okay, read carefully. A 45-year-old laborer is brought by his co-workers and admitted to the surgical ward after being assaulted at work. Nurses inform you that the new patient who was admitted is talking to himself and laughing. When you ask the patient what happened, he says that all people are jealous of him, but God will punish them as he is the son of God. No collateral history is available when you come to clock the patient. His vital signs are normal and a tachycardia is there. Pupils are equal and reacting to light and no head injury appears to have occurred. You are in the process of writing the basic investigations. When you suddenly see him assault, an attender, right? So this is the scenario, right? Now what I want you to do is, I'm going to give you some options of how to manage this patient, right? And each option will have a letter. I want you all to type in the order in which you will use these methods. Most of them are correct. Some might not be correct, but you will have to do all of these or some of these in an order. So what I want is, look at this. 
these are all options available for you to manage this patient right i want you to type in your answer what do you do first do you do f first c second h then your answer will be f c h and so on so can i see your answers the alphabetical order you will help this patient okay 2 minutes starts now So I'm looking for an answer like I D B A K D like that, not exactly, but in that way. One minute more. Some good answers are coming in. Excellent. Keep going. okay so well done right so we'll see how uh, ideally you can manage this patient emergency situations are difficult you have to do everything together right so this is the order which would be most recommended right g is first g is call other staff and go in with numbers to resolve the situation all right a lot of you all have at least some of you all have gone with a prominent d d is rushing to save the attendant very nice everybody all our staff together we work as a multidisciplinary team but you have to realize you have to maintain your own safety you have to go in but with other people all right so make sure i have not put d in the answers even all right sometimes we need to understand our own abilities here is a laborer who is psychotic who has assaulted people at work and come and now assaulted an attendant right you are a doctor right you can compete with him on anything other than a physical fight right so look after yourself call other staff once you are with other staff attempt to de escalate lot of you all have given i as the first answer correct i is what you do try to settle the situation ai me ka ga ne mokadda me prashne api udaw karanna koddak inda hari man gedara ayata anda gahanna baya wenne pa talk nicely calmly firmly but don't do it alone that is the most important call your senior house officer or registrar immediately once 
you are trying to once you have de-escalate even if you can't de-escalate you try to tell them nurse kenetta kiyana ikmanta registrar ta hari sho ta hari kiyanne get security right all hospitals will have security ask a nurse somebody to call ask them get numbers uniforms tend to uh, solve this problem even as a doctor they will have more respect to you so you can settle it but don't go alone once you have spoken to a sho or a registrar once the situation is under control if it is it is psychotic you can proceed with medication the medication you will give will start with oral medication you don't go in with the im first you try to give orally and see if oral is not settling you go for im or if he says mata athi ledan na man ganna behetak na kiyala he is trying to hit somebody else you can give im right this patient needs a psychiatry referral but uh, the psychiatry referral won't happen immediately so may attendant ga ga in that the psychiatry will to call kala therumak ne he will continue to fight it has to happen after the initial management has occurred so you as a doctor based on the risks having spoken to your sho registrar has every right to give im haloperidol there's a question can does he need im most likely yes but always try to see if they can be verbally deescalated and they take order you have to inform the direct and police post these can happen later alimma police post ekata kiwa kiyala egolan hadagena enne right security you might be able to if a sister calls or somebody calls tie the patient to a bed this is a very tricky one if you are ever there in a md exam or a psychiatry exam never give this answer uh, but in a practical sense in a ward this patient has already got assaulted by other people he has hit a staff member right if you can't control the situation i am hello peridol nurses lagawa ne eka gena ka for a short time you might do this this is not a nice thing to do it's not something we recommend but sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures on your on call you can have a myocardial infarction a bronchial asthma patient a covid in isolation and suddenly you won't have staff one staff would have gone with a transfer in ambulance the other staff might have gone to the lab or for a x ray you might have to tell staff to do this for a very short time in a human way when you control a patient like this you need five people all right uh, one for each leg and one for the head as the doctor take the head right that's the easier that's the least chance of them attacking you uh, rather than taking a leg or something so try to control the situation do the other urgent work only after resolving this situation right so i hope you all have a rough idea this is not uh uh hard and fast everything has to happen together right somebody has asked for the dose i will tell the doses right the lessons to learn are look after yourself right you all have studied come this far you all have so much potential you all have to help a lot of people you can't get injured right that's not being selfish right that is being sensible right kogalanta kiyanne suwa viruwan kiyala kam rana viruwan neme ne hari metana fight karanda leddu bera ganda e wage weda walta yanne plan ekak athuwa right seek assistance sometimes we are confident and when you go into a ward you will realize that ogala medical students la hatiyata hamogema benun ahapu kattiya doctors la hatiyata giyama there is a lot of respect for you which is very nice a dostara maathya avilla right dostara no na avilla kiyala right and patients will respect you but remember if somebody is in delirium or if they are in psychosis right they will not exactly know who you are so you lose that sight and you will go mokada mokada me kaya ganne dan inda ganna wage kiyana eka won't work for these patients so always use your other staff the patient bystanders are there there will be other patients willing to help you ah me me doctor mukut karanne pa kiyala egola wata wenawa e udaw ganda if you are in a teaching hospital 
medical students, very useful. Security police, if needed. Inform the seniors and treat. If you have any injections, it might be delirium. You have to at least tell over the phone. If you have any questions, you have to ask me if you have any questions. You have to inform the SHO and give them. Look after yourself. Learn from experience and then you will know that this won't uh, happen again. Right? Uh, so that is important. The other thing is how could you have prevented this? Before managing things, we must learn how to prevent things. Right? An important thing which could have been done is this person was brought by his workmate. They have left him and gone. When they came, you would have been clocking another patient. But the patient came, you know, the first thing you do is nurse let a candle, gena poet in the can. Right? You will realize that there are two types of bystanders. Apita history own a vela, apita blood report, take a kickment, urgent, tavagan, don't let a cow root there. Api punta the patient manage karna, but further around the prasna and the make a hurry, make a drip, take an azila kila ki and the kaki. No, you know, Eva gave, you know, there's nothing, no harm in them. But it would be nice, lazy. So what you have to do is nurse like you know, I'm a doctor, can I make my lady cava doctor, may me allagin ave al hari. Mama in a kangi all one day and a park yan. Right? Mother than me, me on a second dress a cone, get the takataka la whole lateral history a cone. May a bono other than do you come a hagan don't. So if he had two colleagues there, attendant a gahanda kali, a gula navataga. Right? So that is important. Have those measures ready. The moment the nurses say, Dr. May Leda Thani and Kata Karnakil or Q and Hina Minakila, get the opinion. Right? Mithana Vadi Kata Karagana, a Kelima behead them. A Kelima psychiatry opinion near Gamuda, rather than you spend letting them be, he's getting agitated in the ward, you're clocking the patients, asking questions, that might have been too long. Risk a Thibba Gama, sometimes. You don't have to do everything properly <coughs> based on the risk. You don't have to do a few full examination. You have to eventually do it. You could have started the medication early. All right? The moment you know they are psychotic, you can tell the nurses attendance. You give the leadership. So everybody is ready. Attendant, it's very sad. But then he would have been looking at this patient, not letting him attack him. Right? So these are the things you could have practically done to prevent the situation. <clears throat> Once we are treating, how do we treat? So the method we treat patients like this is called rapid tranquilization. Rapid tranquilization means <clears throat> giving antipsychotic medication fast. It doesn't mean only IM or IV. It means giving anything at higher doses quickly, rapid. <laughs> the antipsychotics were usually in the past called major tranquilizers. So that's why the term comes from. Always try oral, right? Petta tena ganda product samsung meno monkey and hinda make a ganda go. Mama doctor, what a kissy mahani akarana, by vende papi udaukarana. Kela, you try to give it. Oral haloperidol. Haloperidol comes in usually 1.5 milligram tablets. Uh, some sectors there is 5 as well, but usually 1.5. Give about three to six milligrams stacked. You can combine it with the benzodiazepine in your ward. In our ward in Raghavan these days, the fast acting benzodiazepine we have is clonazepam. Books will say lorazepam. It's not available these days in the health sector in Sri Lanka. Diazepam, clodazepoxide are long acting benzodiazepines. They won't help the acute situation. Right? So look for the fast-acting benzodiazepine in your ward. When you go to the ward also, find out what is available. Right? Mula dawasi giyama, let a color balloon arm is haloperidol tiyanoad, olanzapine tiyanoad, benzodiazepines, clonazepam, lorazepam, monoad tiyanoad. Put it kole kona liya ganda. Put it in your phone. Right? If you put it on your phone or you write it down, even later, when the situation comes, it has been got into your memory. So you don't actually need to look at the phone because you have written it down. It's in your memory. So oral olanzapine is also an option, 5 to 10 milligrams, combine it with clonazepam. If he's a bit calmer, if he's not hitting anybody, if he's not trying to run out of the ward, jump out of the balcony, you can wait and repeat it in about an hour oral. 
that is rapidly or giving it time to work and repeating it right so that is important if the patient says mata ati behetak ne oya doctor kenek wenne kohomada ogolla tinne ma vinashaya karanna thamai avilla tiyenne right so like that if they say that uh, you know this is not going to be happen you ask the staff to hold in and you administer or you ask the nurse to administer im medication the im medications available now in ragam and in most hospitals are im haloperidol is available everywhere that is the main stay of treatment im haloperidol im midazolam is there in most units there is no major respiratory depression in a young fit person right you can monitor pulse bp respiratory rate you don't need icu settings the books say respiratory depression it is there but it's very rare and uh, it is unlikely to happen at this dose right so don't be a worry you are giving it based on the risk so based on the risk benefit mea kaatari gahala panla gihilla maranota wadiya im bens midazolam dila monitor karne ka is better im promethacin 25 you can combine all three together right and once again you can repeat this in half an hour right when you are repeating what you have to remember is the total dose so the total daily dose of haloperidol is 30 so you can see that you can give 5 to 10 mg of haloperidol multiple times to control the situation somebody has asked how long does it take to act oral haloperidol should act in about an hour im should act within about uh half an hour right uh there are no major contraindications somebody has asked this question right uh so uh if a past history of very bad reactions are there and it's documented if they have serious arrhythmias in a cardiac setting you will give lower doses still you have to realize somebody in a cardiac unit pulling out his monitors jumping out of the icu and trying to run he will get a heart attack so it's better to calm them down so there's no absolute contraindication but in the elderly in the physically unfit you will give lower doses maybe im haloperidol 2.5 a covid patient with encephalitis who is on oxygen you won't give im midazolam right because that respiratory depression we are worried about they are already pulmonologically compromised so there you won't give im midazolam so it's always a depending on the patient just know the basic rules oral haloperidol oral olanzapine first with oral clonazepam these doses try to repeat always try to de escalate the situation failing which inform seniors and go in with the im medications but you have to monitor pulse bp respiratory rate and temperature okay so that is uh uh the trap the first patient now we go to the second patient a 36 year old farmer is brought to the ward after falling down while working in the fields his father says he had worked harder than everyone the last few days and hadn't stopped work even for lunch but they noticed him to be swaying while walking that they know he mentioned that the son had an illness a snayu amarwa for which he takes treatment and has regular blood blood test done on examination you notice prominent tremors of the hand the patient is disoriented in time and place he is afebrile vital signs are normal and the rest of the cns examination is unremarkable okay these are your questions what is the reason for current presentation what is the underlying diagnosis what is the most important investigation to arrive at a diagnosis what is the most important treatment you would administer you have 2 minutes type in your answers
Okay, y'all are doing well. Just one minute more. Well, can I answer anything? I won't scold y'all. I only scold Ragam students. So they have to be careful. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's see your answers. Yeah. yeah. Dehydration leading to lithium toxicity, bipolar affective disorder present, current episode, manic blood lithium level. Very good. And uh, some people have said most important step in the management is normal saline infusion. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So the answers are the reason for the current presentation is working in the farm. Sri Lanka is very hot, right? You're sweating a lot. So the advice to the patients, we as the doctor should have advised him. If he's working in the fields, so that advice would not have been given. He seems to have relapsed, working hard, not stopping for lunch, working more than everybody, right? Bipolar affective disorder is the underlying cause, most likely a manic episode, like you all have said. That you have to do a lot of investigations, including renal function tests, full blood counts. But if you had one investigation to do, it would be a Serum lithium level. The most important steps in the treatment, uh, the treatment to give is IV normal saline. Stopping the lithium is also uh, very important, right? So your answers are almost perfect. Uh, so well done. So we'll talk a bit about lithium toxicity, right? It's a dose related side effect of treatment with lithium, right? So it's usually at higher doses. It's most likely in patients with renal impairment because the lithium is not excreted. In the elderly, it's seen if lithium overdoses are taken. If some people miss the dose and take two doses, uh, some people are like this patient can be dehydrated. Certain medications like antihypertensives, uh, diuretics can cause lithium toxicity. The symptoms are ataxia. Here, the family noted the farmer to be walking side to side and falling. Poor coordination, muscle twitching, slurred speech, and confusion. If you don't treat it, you can go on to a comatose state and even have fits with prominent neurological and renal damage. So this is the importance of identifying it early. How will you manage it? Stop lithium immediately, right? Sometimes these things happen, right? You know, the family, sometimes you uh, do everything you manage and somebody, a bystander who is nearby, is giving the lithium. Because he, you don't know these things. Nurses might uh, give it. So you have to always make sure that the lithium is stopped. Urgent lithium level. A lithium level of over 1 is worrying. If it's over 1.5, you know it's toxicity. Hydrate them well. Say line drip, can you like a danda kaling, you can't go through a bunda pulwana, nikam, vatura denda, or juice, water, something. A normal saline drip is the most important thing. You need to monitor input and output. If you can get a good output, the chances are this is going to settle. You do an urgent serum lithium level and repeat it daily to see that the level is coming down. Dialysis is rarely required. I have never seen it being given. Once I had a patient who took a large overdose and the lithium level went up to 4 or 4.5, very high. Still the physician, you make a medical referral. That's the most important. I haven't mentioned this. You have to make a medical, you're in the medical ward. If it's psychiatric, you make a medical referral. At that time, the physician said, clinically is okay. We'll observe for a day or two daily and uh, it uh, settled. Yeah. Somebody has uh, said if he has a significant tremor, can we take this as delirium tremens? Yes. All right. But the history doesn't suggest otherwise. Right. He's working in the fields. Uh, the father is there. You're going to do a lithium level. 
So the history is important, but yes, your DD in a confused patient with uh, tremors is delirium tremens as well. So you quickly get a history. Now, bone connect. Bone anti matter view ekawa thada. Yet view ana not delirium tremens. The was tuna view ana yes, you are worried, right? Can house officers order serum lithium levels? Certainly, yeah. You can order anything, right? You can't give anything, but if you order something, you can. You might get scolded if you order an MRI. You can't order an MRI. You can't sign for it. But big tests, invasive tests. If you order, the house of the consultant might say, "Don't do that." But still, in the patient's best interest, if you can write a serum lithium level, uh, there's no harm in that. You know. Don't worry, y'all are doctors now. Y'all are not medical students. Uh, within reason, be confident if you are doing it with the right intentions, and you can back yourself. So I noticed tremors. I thought it's an emergency. That's why I did it. Perfectly fine, and I would prefer you to do that uh, rather than uh, uh, wait for somebody else to tell. But have boundaries. Don't go and. or the invasive things or give serious medications right so that's the treatment of lithium toxicity this is the third patient a 25 year old garment factory worker is brought late at night by her friends in a hostel to the hospital she has been receiving treatment for 6 months from a clinic since she had sleep problems after breaking up with her boyfriend The friends have noticed her fallen on the floor, unconscious, and an empty bottle of pills near her. She has written a note to her parents saying, "Goodbye, I'm sorry," and that she loves them a lot. On examination, as the medical house officer, you notice she is confused. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't give a proper history. She is febrile. You notice muscle twitching. on general examination her pulse and blood pressure are fluctuating markedly while being monitored your questions as the medical house officer are what is the most likely cause for current presentation what medications could she have been on list 3 what is her underlying diagnosis what is the single most important thing you will tell this patient's friends who brought her okay 2 minutes Okay, excellent. So most of you have got it. You are doing very well. You are the excellent interns. I don't think I had this knowledge when I was a pre-intern. So what is the most likely presentation? Serotonin syndrome, right? An increase in serotonin. So the theory of depression. One of the theories is that a low serotonin level causes depression. So all the medication, the antidepressants, increase serotonin levels. It's just not the SSRIs of fluoxetine or paroxetine. or certainly any antidepressant if they are on amitriptyline imipramine fluoxetine sertraline venlafaxine they increase the venla, uh, sertraline levels 
So an overdose of any of these can cause serotonin syndrome. The underlying diagnosis, based on the fact that she's taken on a serious overdose, it's not one day after the boyfriend broke up, six months, a long duration. It's not just an adjustment. It's probably severe depression. The suicide note suggests high risk, like Dr. Gihan mentioned earlier. She seems to have guilt, saying, I'm sorry. All these suggest a severe depressive risk. What do you tell the friends? Yeah. You have to tell them a few things, and including get the family down, which is also important. The other thing is, stay in the ward till somebody comes. Till the family comes, please stay with this patient. Your ward can be on the fourth floor. In Raghama, the unit medicine is on the topmost floor. This girl has had a breakup of a relationship. She is depressed. Now, she is in a ward without anybody. People are examining her, putting cannulas, activated charcoal. Life has got worse for her. People are scolding her for taking the overdose. Now she is at high risk. She will jump from that balcony. You need somebody. We don't have enough staff to keep with somebody. So ask the patient, the friends to stay so she knows she has somebody. Also to manage the initial risk. Right. So your answers are right. Somebody has said, can it be neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Yes, they are very similar and we'll discuss that as well, right? So serotonin syndrome, just talking a bit about it. It's a neurotoxicity syndrome uh, when serotonin SSRIs are given. It happens when high dose antidepressants are used, when antidepressant combinations are used, when refractory depression is there, we treat with two antidepressants sometimes. Not ideal. That can cause it. So look at their past records. A sudden increase in dose. Not settling comes to the clinic. We increase the dose suddenly. An overdose like this patient. There are neurological, psychological and other symptoms. Myoclonus, that's the twitching. Nystagmus, headache, tremors, rigidity, seizures can occur. Psychologically, irritability, confusion is prominent, they can be agitated or even go to a coma. Fever, sweating, diarrhea, postural instability, which you noticed, are there. So these are the symptoms. How do you manage? You avoid combinations of antidepressants. If you think this is a SSRI overdose, you have a high degree of suspicion. Distinguished from NMS, NMS will have high fever, rigidity. This, you will have muscle twitching. The fever won't be so high. Slight differences in the history. NMS patient would have taken antipsychotics. This patient would have taken uh, antidepressants. Stop the medication immediately. Understand that SSRIs have a half-life, so the symptoms might take long. You will keep the patient in the ward. Supportive management is the mainstay. Monitor the pulse, blood pressure, get medical opinion, control those, hydrate well, input, output. And as the drug gets washed out, they will improve. There are few specific treatments you can discuss with your consultant and find the medicine if it's there. Ciproheptidine, propanolol also helps symptomatically, right? So these are things uh, you can use. The fourth patient is a 20-year-old university student has been treated for severe gastroenteritis with fever. He is on oral ciprofloxacin, IV saline, IV metoclopramide and paracetamol. You are informed that the patient is behaving abnormally. When you examine him, you notice his eyes are rolled up and he is in distress. His neck muscles are extremely tight and he is unable to speak. The patient is thinly built. He has a tattoo on his forearm. And on the admission notes, you notice alcohol and cannabis occasionally used mention. This is your patient. These are your questions. What is your most likely diagnosis? A, cannabis-induced psychosis. B, epilepsy. C, viral encephalitis. D, alcohol withdrawal. E, acute dystonic reaction. One minute.
Yeah. So most of you all are going with E, which is the right answer, an acute dystonic reaction. So here you see, sometimes people think acute dystonic reactions only occur in the context of psychiatric treatment. Mostly antipsychotics are incriminated, but a lot of medications can cause it and metaclopramide is one of them, which we commonly use, right? It's the symptoms that are important. And the other thing is, don't we shouldn't be as interns or any doctor, we shouldn't be judgmental. This is a university student. He has every right to get a tattoo. Uh, there are doctors with tattoos as well. That doesn't really mean they're bad or good. It just means they like tattoos. Uh, the fact that they have misused alcohol and cannabis, you need to take it into consideration. But not everybody is a drug addict or an alcoholic. And you shouldn't stigmatize them. Uh, you should treat the symptoms and the patient. So the answer is acute dystonic reaction. What is the most important thing to do on discharge? You mention on your diagnosis card in bold red letters that he developed an acute dystonic reaction to metaclopramide. So as interns, one thing that will be very important is your diagnosis cards. This patient will go home the next day after diarrhea. Right? You cannot, some of you all might not give a card. Some of you all will give a card with diarrhea. That is not going to help him in the future. But you might be saving his life if you write that in big red letters and he's a university student, he might keep it and not take metaclopramide again. So things like that are very important. Acute dystonic reactions occur soon after treatment with antipsychotics, but not only antipsychotics. Young males like this are more prone. Typical and intramuscular antipsychotics are more likely to cause it. The features are torticolis, tongue protrusion, ophisthotonus, grimacing. It can be easily mistaken for bad behavior, psychotic behavior, right? He's acting strange. The treatment is stop the offending agent as it's the, that's the most important step. The ideal management, if it's available, is IM benzotropine, 2 milligram stat. That's what we have in our body in Ragama. But IM promethacin helps. If they can take orally, if they can swallow only, oral benz, benzexol can be used. Documentation is very important. We're running out of time. Dr. Madhubhashan is waiting. We'll finish this in two minutes. The last patient, a 23-year-old patient with polysubstance misuse becomes aggressive on the medical ward. You are the medical lecturer. Your consultant tells to give him IEM halopridol 5 milligram stat to control the situation and the patient calms down and to make a psychiatry referral. The psychiatry MO calls and stays, start him on oral haloperidol 3 milligrams DD and to transfer to the nearest psychiatry unit as soon as possible. Prior to transfer the next day, everything is ready. The nurses mention his temperature is 101 and he is not moving or speaking. What are you concerned that the patient may have developed? What other signs will you look for to confirm your diagnosis? What one investigation would support your diagnosis? Name three medications which would assist in the supportive management in this patient. Two minutes. So this is your scenario. And these are your five questions. Last five questions from me. Okay, so excellent. Your answers are, all of you all have got this right. We have sent in the answers. Uh, the answer is, he has developed most likely neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Uh, fever is mentioned. The other, the triad of symptoms is high fever, altered consciousness. So you will assess for disorientation in time, place and person. Dr. Dulshika mentioned how you mention, assess for orientation and there'll be a generalized rigidity. If it's a, something like a meningoencephalitis, which is a DD, there'll be neck stiffness, but unlikely to have generalized rigidity. Your differential diagnosis will include meningoencephalitis, cerebral malaria, serious illnesses like this, but given he has got IEM haloperidol, this is the most likely diagnosis. You confirm your diagnosis at the CPK level. If it's over 1,000, it's important. And you do serial CPK levels to assess the improvement. Specific treatment 
you can give clonazepam or a benzodiazepine short acting bromocriptin is useful <coughs> dantrolene is a muscle relaxer it's given according to the body weight i have mentioned the bnf don't worry as interns you don't know have to know everything i have, i also don't know the dantrolene dose uh, it's not an emergency i mean it's a emergency but you have time to look up find it and give so understand but certainly the im haloperidol 5 mg you need to know but not everything is needed keep bnfs on your phone and if needed uh, find them and treat so neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a <coughs> rare but life threatening condition very rarely it occurs within the first 10 days and symptoms we discussed the complications are important as you treat them you have to monitor them for pneumonias aspiration pneumonias they can have thromboembolism cardiovascular collapse due to the postural instability and due to the generalized muscle rigidity they will have uh rhabdomyolysis which can proceed to acute tubular necrosis and renal failure so we'll monitor the renal functions and the output very well <clears throat> there's high mortality 10% if untreated uh it can last a while if you can get an icu it will be good in this day and age with covid you're never going to get an icu for this patient so you have to manage in the ward uh it's supportive management reduce the temperature with antipyretics and tepid sponging right uh, hydrate well and maintain a good urine output stop the antipsychotic and support the pulse blood pressure and the patient should improve with time we mentioned bromocriptin dantrolene and benzodiazepine you can treat the psychiatric illness and also the nms with ect that is not for you you would have made a psychiatric referral and your consultants will decide that restarting the antipsychotic is also in two weeks i'm just telling that that is also as an intern there are certain things you can give to other people so in summary all intern house officers should be well adept at managing an aggressive patient predicting and preventing risk can stop aggressive acts occurring look after yourself so you can help others look after yourself if there's one message we'll take from this keep yourself safe with ppe avoiding assault avoiding harassment look after yourself there are psychiatry related side effects of medication in ms lithium toxicity serotonin syndrome and acute dystonia you need to be aware of the symptoms and manage once you identify them speak to your seniors and manage so thank you very much and all the best uh, you are in a nice stage of your careers uh, internship will be tough i won't lie but that's good all good things in life are a bit tough right and uh, it will be a excellent time which you will remember fondly once you finish it so all the best congratulations for getting here and you will do well okay thank you i'll answer the questions on the chat and i will now hand over you to professor uh madhubashini daya bandara who's a professor in psychiatry at you know faculty of medicine kalambo and she is going to talk on a very important topic almost 50% of you all will do gin knobs for your internship and uh patients who are pregnant and in their postpartum have very specific needs and she will discuss psychiatric illnesses during pregnancy and the postpartum thank you madhubashini and sorry for taking a bit of your time Madhu, are you there? Right. Yeah. I just managed to unmute myself. Okay. You can share your screen as well. You're a co-host. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chamra.
right good afternoon everyone um, after a very interesting session uh, by uh, dr cham ravite singh um, i am uh, professor madhubashi dayabandara from the faculty of medicine kalambo um, i suppose uh, uh, there are around 450 odd participants and some of you might be uh, all of you might be from different faculties um, and uh, the session today from me is on uh, psychiatric illness in pregnancy and postpartum period and uh, i have shared the screen and i hope that you can uh, see my screen uh, at this time uh, so almost 50% of you would be very likely to do, take up genenops uh, for 6 months in the uh, during your internship period uh therefore uh, you would see many uh, mothers either in their pregnancy or in the postpartum period who might have mental health issues so um, how do you deal with that uh, maybe you know during your uh, professorial appointments you might have seen a few mothers who were uh, having mental health issues but maybe not very often um let's have a discussion because you are actually at the uh, the best place uh, to help these mothers at the end of this session uh, you should be able to uh, identify what are the risk factors for mental illness uh, in pregnancy and postpartum period and uh, be able to identify somebody who is suffering from maternity blues somebody uh, be able to differentiate uh, postpartum psychosis depression and we'll talk a little bit about the principles of treatment let's start off with a case history this is a 28 year old primary uh, mother who was referred from uh, the nearest uh, uh, hospital the disolza maternity hospital on the second day postpartum uh she had had a, a normal vaginal delivery and uh, uh, however when the doctors were uh, you know uh, ready to discharge her uh, they noticed and the nurses also complained that the patient was very frequently crying very anxious you know star easily startled did not sleep at all the, uh, the night uh, before and um, during the interview she complained that i feel rather confused and um, and she was uh, her mood was very labile at one time during the interview she was crying and then at the other time she was uh, laughing and reactive normally to uh, the conversation that she had with the doctors and uh, when she was uh, explored for any possibility of uh, psychotic symptoms uh, there were no delusions or perceptual disturbances however she was worried that uh, she was uh, whether whether she stopped uh, able to look after the baby properly uh, she was saying that i am not used to this and um, i i don't know if i uh, could uh, look after uh, the baby satisfactorily and that uh, her mother is not there to help so um, how am i going to uh, uh, you know look after the baby uh, 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 and make sure that the baby is healthy uh, and uh, there was no family history or past history of psychiatric illness so take a moment and think what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient is it uh, is it normal uh, is this normal behavior for a, a mother on the second day of postpartum is it uh, postpartum depression is it uh, uh, maternity blues is it uh, postpartum psychosis um, and what would you do if you were the intern doctor working in that ward just one moment to think about it and then once we go through the presentation at the very end let's again go through the various possibilities okay let's proceed with the rest of the presentation 
recently i saw uh, I'll, I'll share one experience that i had recently with you um i, I there was a post intern doctor who had just delivered her first baby uh, in the same ward that she used to work and uh, the baby was delivered by an elective cesarean section and the um, on the day that she was ready to be discharged the baby was found to be having fever and jaundice uh, the mother was referred uh, for psychiatry assessment because she was noted to be very distressed and uh, was uh, crying and feeling very anxious uh, baby was in the uh, uh, was in the uh, neonatal uh, unit um, during the conversation with this young doctor she mentioned something which i think was a good lesson for her as well as for me uh, she mentioned the fact that you know everybody was kind to her but the staff with whom she used to work previously um, were very matter of fact and uh, that uh, they were caring but uh, she did not feel at all supported by or that they understood what she was going through uh, however she mentioned that the patient the mother who had just delivered on the other side of uh, in the bed which was next to her her family when they came to see the baby actually uh, comforted her and said uh, I, you are the, I, we heard that you are the doctor who is work, who was working in the unit we heard that your uh, baby was uh, taken ill um, and uh, being of a different religion they said uh, we would be praying for your baby um, uh, let us know if there is anything that uh, uh, you need to uh, need us to do uh, she said that those words were very helpful for her and that she felt that you know uh, that somebody cared for her and she said um, if i had known that uh, mothers felt so upset during this time when there were problems with the baby i wish i had spoken a little bit more with the uh, mothers that i cared for during the internship so the last six months of internship she had worked in the same ward now this is something i would like you to remember um, you are best placed in a unit where you are closest to the patients this is irrelevant of the discipline that you are uh, you know attending to whether it is medicine or surgery or gynecology or pediatrics uh, patients identify you as the you know podi dostara mahatya or you know uh, podi doctor ara chuti doctor kiwa kela tama kiyanne but you are the closest and they know that you know they appreciate the fact that you are the person who is working hardest in that unit and you are the person who would be most caring uh you would be working very very hard you would be having a really busy time the busiest time ever in your life but you would be the person who is able to make a difference in these people's lives uh, you would never again have that chance because uh, registrars consultants they will come and go but you unlike uh, them you would be actually spending a long time in that unit therefore you are better placed to identify people who are at risk or who are already having features which suggest that they are having a mental health problem we think often that um, motherhood is an easy thing and that you know like a swan takes to water that it's a biological thing and you know the motherly instincts come along uh, naturally no uh it's a new experience for all human beings it's a learning experience and there is a learning curve to it and for all mothers this might be the very first time that they are you know having a young person whose sole responsibility is for them therefore they need to get used to it therefore they are at risk then there might be pain from you know cesarean section or from an episiotomy so that will also bother them and would affect their quality of life very often the baby might be you know uh, you you have to get up from every two or three hours when the baby is uh, crying and uh, you know have to feed the baby and this is not something 
that ever a young female is used to uh, unless you know it might be the second or a later pregnancy some mothers have difficulty in establishing breastfeeding you know it, it takes some time even for uh, doctors even for nurses who might have been giving advice to uh, uh, other mothers about breastfeeding they themselves when they have that experience they they find that it is difficult and they need a little bit of help then sometimes the baby might be ill like in this young doctor that we were talking about and you know as our culture goes there are lots of interferences by various people who are giving various advices you should eat this you should do that you should steam you should not steam this is the way to look after the baby this is the way to feed the baby therefore there is a lot of you know different messages confusing messages coming in their way therefore mothers are not having an easy time it's a very difficult time and they need a lot of support because of that what are the risk factors for developing psychiatric illness in the pregnancy and the postpartum period there are few indicators that you can be Uh, vigilant about and if any of these mothers are having these risk factors then it might be good to ask a few questions regarding their mental health you can ask a few questions like you know are you okay are you doing well are you coping with this situation how is your sleep are you having enough help at home and those few questions might be quite enough to screen in unwanted pregnancies and if there is any past history of psychiatric disorder you know that there is a very high chance that either during the pregnancy or even higher risk during the postpartum period that they might have a relapse if there is any family history of medical illness and especially if there have been medical comorbidities like gestational diabetes or other severe medical illnesses during the pregnancy period if there are mothers with substance use very often these days you have mothers with maybe opioid dependence or other you know sometimes even amphetamine use uh, who present in during their pregnancy and you know that uh, these mothers will have a lot of psychosocial issues and mental health issues during their postpartum or pregnancy period if they are coming from a poor socio economic background if they are experiencing domestic violence then again these are indicators that you need to be a little bit more careful about their mental health so why you are be worried about mental illness in pregnancy and postpartum it's not because it will affect the mother and the family it will affect fetal growth it will affect the cognitive and emotional development of the child and of course some of the medications we might give might be teratogenic therefore you need to be careful about identifying and treating mothers with mental illness during their pregnancy and postpartum period we will start off with stillbirth now very often in sri lanka um sometimes spontaneous abortions and then stillbirths after 28 weeks neonatal deaths um it's not it's not something that people consider as very serious or uh, that uh, that it might affect the parents but very often this bereavement uh, affects the couple very much if they have been if it might have been a very precious uh, pregnancy or on the other hand it might have been the first child in that family and or even maybe a later uh, pregnancy maybe the second third or fourth child but still it's a bereavement for the mother and the father it's a loss to them therefore there is a possibility that it might lead to depression and it might sometimes lead to uh, post traumatic stress disorder therefore it's important that you support these mothers and the father also and manage that uh, appropriately ask them if they want to see the child if they want to see the neonate's body Uh, don't force them to see the child now one of the most um, one of the most bad, one of the worst experiences i've had during my internship was an instance where the mother was actually forced to see the child 
I, I couldn't prevent it and I wish I had prevented it at that time and um, I, I really regretted uh, not being able to intervene at that time uh, because I remember it was a, a mother who had delivered in maybe second or third pregnancy. It was not her first pregnancy. The, uh, it was a yeah, intrauterine death but very quickly the baby was delivered. A beautiful baby, but you know, uh, the uh, both lower limbs were hypoplastic and they were not uh, developed at all. Then staff, uh, I, I, maybe, you know, this was 20 years ago, but uh, the staff uh, actually uh, uh, decided that the mother will have to see the child because actually the uh, scan had not shown any significant abnormalities and only uh, after the birth the child was uh, they detected that the child had abnormalities and you know they suddenly gave the uh, baby to the mother and said your child uh, they has some abnormalities and i can remember how uh, the mother who dealt with the fact that you know it, it was a stillbirth uh, but uh, when was he, she was shown the child she she became really upset and was you know howling and screaming in pain so it is good to prepare the mother to ask just you know sit down with her and say look the baby is delivered there are some problems with the baby um, do you want to see the child uh, you you might be you, it might not be a good experience for you but you, do you still want to you know hold and see the child and sometimes you know i've had mothers which have come and told me i wish i held the child i i wish that you know it was my baby and i wish that you know i had seen the child ask the parents if they want to have a proper funeral for the child so sometimes uh, uh, the uh, uh, they might want to hold some funeral rites and that might actually be good to go through a normal grief process maternity blues is the other common condition that we encounter in postpartum mothers you can see that it occurs in 50 to 66% of the cases, so half to two thirds. That's a quite high percentage, isn't it? And then the common complaints are mood swings. The mother complains that, you know, they, they, the mood is changing all the time. You notice that the mood is very labile. One moment the mother is crying, the other moment she might be okay, she might be laughing. And the mothers usually have good insight into this. They will say, I, I don't know what's happening to me, doctor. I seem to be, you know, having changes in my mood ever so often. Then, of course, they might get angry, irritable. Um, in Sinhalese, the mothers might come and say, Then some of the mothers might come and say, I feel a little bit confused. I feel as if, you know, I am, um, I, I don't know what's happening around me. I'm very well aware of what is happening around me. I am, can, if you check their orientation, they will orient it to, you know, time, place and person. But they will say, I, I feel as if I'm dazed. The onset is very early. So it might be the day one or the day two of postpartum period. And it will be on the third or the fourth day. And it will completely resolve within a few days time. So usually within one week, the mother is completely okay. We see the mother within the first or the second day when the uh, OBSWAT becomes concerned about their mental health. But then when they, you know, send them back in two or three days, the mothers are usually completely okay. What is the intervention needed? Usually there is no medication needed. You should help the mother sleep a little bit, maybe a little bit of support with breastfeeding the baby and letting her have some uh, sleep uh, is uh, enough. Uh, some support maybe, uh, sometimes we encourage the mothers or the wards. These days it's not uh, very feasible, but sometimes we ask the mothers to get down their family, maybe their uh, uh, parents or somebody to help them with the baby's work and reassure that you know it will be okay you are just going through some mood changes it's normal uh, a few days after uh, giving birth to a child and it'll get better as you go along most of these things get uh, you know they it spontaneously they it gets better sometimes if the mother's sleep is affected you might have to give a small dose of maybe promethazine or sometimes we use clopromazine because we can't give a benzodiazepine because it will actually be with the breast milk it will go to the baby whereas these are fairly 
you know, uh, safe drugs and you can help the mothers to uh, relax and reduce the anxiety and manage sleep. In contrast to maternity blues, postpartum psychosis is rare. So they say either one in 500 or one in 1000 live births, a mother would develop a postpartum psychosis. Usually, the mother would have either a family history or a past history of mental illness. It's uh, more often in primary gravita and uh, not being married is also a risk factor. And unlike maternity blues, the postpartum psychosis occurs within the first few days, usually within the first two weeks of postpartum period. And the symptoms are uh, of insomnia, overactivity, and the mood. We saw that in maternity blues, uh, the mother's mood was labile. They would be crying and laughing and euthymic mood. The mood would change. But here, uh, the mood changes are more towards maybe irritability, more perplexity. They, they don't uh, quite, uh, uh, can't make sense of what is happening around them and some confusion also. Uh, if you go through, uh, if you go through, uh, sorry, if you go through uh, uh, the mother's mental state, there would often be delusions and hallucinations. These delusions might be related to the pregnancy, might be related to the to self, uh, might be related to something else that is happening around them, and it's important that you elicit any thoughts regarding the baby. So uh, once I saw a patient who was uh, very upset and very anxious and agitated, and the mother was complaining that uh, board staff were actually conspiring to harm uh, the mother and the baby. And therefore she was very guarded about telling her uh, uh, thoughts to the ward staff. However, the ward staff had noted that she was very agitated and anxious and uh, 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 referred the mother to psychiatric care. Uh, it's very important that you ask these mothers if there are any, what, what do they think about their baby? And um, in the next slide, we'll go through questions about how to exclude any suicidal risk and if there is any risk towards the baby. Um, very often, postpartum psychosis would point towards a diagnosis of either a depressive or manic episode. So therefore, postpartum psychosis and overall, you know, diagnostic, um, it, it's a group, it's a group of, uh, you know, illnesses, where lots of illnesses with psychotic symptoms are under this rubric. And the dia particular diagnosis can actually be either a, a depressive, severe depressive episode with psychotic symptoms, or it can be a bipolar affective disorder, manic episode with, or a depressive episode with psychotic symptoms. And rather rarely, it can be a, the first episode of a schizophrenia or a schizophreniform disorder. Okay. Um, it's very important in postpartum psychosis to exclude the risks. So if it's a depressive episode, there is a risk of suicide in the patient. So you need to clearly ask the mother, how do you feel? Do you feel as if there, that there is uh, nothing for you to go on? And uh, do you feel as if there is no point in living anymore? Have you thought of harming yourself? So excluding risk of suicide is very important. And especially in a mother who has a risk of suicide, you need to ask the mother whether there are any thoughts regarding the baby. What will happen if you do something to harm yourself? What will happen to the baby? Sometimes the mother might say, because you know the baby will be helpless, then it's better that the baby dies with me. So in that sort of a case, there is a very high risk towards the baby. Um, on the other hand, in a mother who is having psychotic symptoms, it's always good to ask a few other questions regarding the baby. Do you have any difficulties in managing the baby? How are you coping with the baby? How do you feel about the baby? Do you think that the baby is doing okay? Do you worry that there is something wrong with the baby? 
then somebody sometimes a mother who is having a severe depression might believe that the baby is you know suffering from a serious illness or that the baby is you know uh, baby is you know not uh, is malformed so therefore the mother might you know believe that she needs to put the baby out of misery so those are extreme cases but anyway it's good to make sure that there is no risk towards the baby sometimes a psychotic mother might believe that somebody else might actually try to harm the baby or herself therefore they might try to take various uh, you know measures to prevent harm to the baby while at the same time they might think it's better to die rather than you know being harmed by somebody else um a psychotic mother on the other hand might have a risk of aggression towards staff towards baby towards other people who is around them and um i'm pretty sure that you know how to assess these risks by various questions okay what is the management that we need for postpartum psychosis you need to ensure that the mother is managed in a calm environment make sure that there are not a lot of visitors uh, manage her in a portion of the ward where you can uh, give some extra care to the uh, mother and the baby maybe nearer to the nursing station you can keep an eye on what is happening uh, it's very important that you manage the risk so if the suicidal risk is high till the patient is seen by the psychiatric team and a proper intervention is done you can make sure that you observe the mother and the baby carefully if there is no risk to the baby then of course don't prevent the mother from breastfeeding the child and looking after the child if you are not very sure then may give the child initially under observation so ask one of the uh, midwives or the nurses to make sure that they are observing while the mother is breastfeeding uh, antipsychotics are the preferred uh, uh, you know uh, management for the psych uh, psychotic symptoms and of course electroconvulsive therapy we know is indicated in most of the cases because you want to ensure that the mother gets well soon and bonds with the baby as soon as possible so electroconvulsive therapy is given because postpartum psychosis is actually a psychiatric emergency you need the mother to get well you need the mother to be able to look after the baby and there is a whole lot of other people family also who is involved and who are in distress and who are uh, you know uh, who are uh, having problems because there is a mother and a baby involved uh, and they need to get better soon the mother baby unit there is only one mother baby unit in the country and that is in the national institute of mental health in sri lanka some of you may have gone there and once we say that you know uh, the mother and the baby is going to be transferred there there is a lot of stigma attached to it but you know it's a very if you know how it is you know that it is a very nice place uh, where there are individual rooms for the mothers of course you can't accommodate a lot of mothers in there i think their capacity is somewhere between um, 7 to 10 patients at a time the mother can stay with the baby and uh, usually somebody else who is a bystander maybe a family member can also stay with them and uh, there are nurses who would actually do the observation regarding the baby and it's a, a very nice place to be so encourage your patients talk about that and make sure uh, to address any uh, you know wrong uh, beliefs and attitudes they might have regarding the national institute of mental health because the optimum care would be given to them um, uh, in that place keep a responsible bystander to support the patient and make sure that the mother is supported at all time um i'll take this opportunity to uh, answer one question uh there is one question are there any programs going on for nurses and midwives who are working in obstetrics and postnatal wards to understand these psychological conditions because we have seen some of them being rude to mothers yes actually training in assessment of mental health and especially postpartum depression is part of the training of public health midwives and nurses of course you know uh, they do uh, uh, training in psychiatry 
and they do uh, train in um, identifying um, psychiatric illnesses in mothers and how to support them. And I know, you know, uh, in most of the uh, units that uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, in obstetric units, um, the, the staff is very busy and there's always a lot of work going on. And because they, they work hard and they work night shifts and, you know, you really can't uh, uh, say at what times uh, the mothers might be delivering. It's usually, you know, overnight work and by the time the shift is over, you would be really, really tired. Um, so therefore, you know, uh, I have noticed that, you know, they might be irritable, they might, be, they might not be very polite to the patients. But I think, you know, always if you see somebody being rude or impolite, just uh, tell them in a very nice way that, you know, it's good to, you know, be kind and, you know, this is the way that maybe we should uh, talk to them. And it's always, uh, you know, it always pays off when you are um, kind and, uh, you know, compassionate towards somebody else. Because very often you need to understand that uh, young mothers particularly, they, they have difficulty in adjusting to these situations. When it is the second or the third baby, then of course the mothers have learned um, how to breastfeed, how to establish breastfeeding, how to look after the baby, how to change the nappies, how to uh, you know identify when the baby is hungry or when the baby has you know uh, wet themselves or uh, they need a nappy change. But then of course a young mother might not be so sure about all these things, and very often she might need a lot of support. Okay. So we discussed about how to support a mother through stillbirth. We discussed about maternity blues. We discussed about postpartum psychosis. And next is, and the last is actually postpartum depression. Now, maternity blues is very common. Postpartum psychosis is uh, not that common. Uh, whereas postpartum depression falls in between. So it's around 10% uh, uh, of live births. Uh, not as uncommon as postpartum psychosis, but uh, uh, not as common as maternity blues. Postpartum depression occurs in the early weeks. And, you know, the symptoms are fairly uh, similar to maternity blues. The uh, mother might initially complain of irritability, anxiety, feeling a little bit confused, feeling tired. And it's important that patients with maternity, whom you think uh, are having maternity blues, are followed up uh, and make sure that they are, are not actually uh, uh, postpartum mothers who would go on to develop postpartum depression. Uh, very often, these mothers would not complain of depressed mood. They would complain more of not being able to cope, feeling angry or irritable most of the time, or anxious and, you know, apprehensive. Uh, the management is very often giving adequate sleep. So make sure that, you know, if the mother is at home, ask somebody else, maybe a family member, to help the mother get some sleep. So when the baby is crying, to take the baby and help the mother to breastfeed. Uh, uh, try to, you know, help with some of the activities with regards to the baby. And where antidepressants are concerned, sertraline is the recommended medication. We'll go through what antidepressants you should use or you should not use, you should avoid in time to come. Um, give a little bit of support in looking after the baby. And if it's a mother with psychosocial issues, for example, maybe alcoholism in the uh, partner, or uh, uh, poverty, other economic issues, then it or accommodation problems. It's very important that uh, some of these issues are uh, helped with. You know that there is a Mithuru PSA in almost all the hospitals, big hospitals in Sri Lanka. And uh, this is where sometimes for mothers with uh, mental health issues, if they have psychosocial issues, you can actually uh, refer the mother for some um, uh, social interventions and um, uh, psychosocial issues. And of course, if the mother is having a psychiatric illness, and if you refer to a psychiatry unit, you know that there might be a social worker who might be there to help the uh, mother with those issues. I'm sure that you have seen this in Sri Lanka at one month postpartum, 
uh, most of the mothers would go through the Edinburgh postpartum depression rating scale. Uh, the public health midwives are well trained in this and they would ask the mother to carry this out and score this. Um, in Sri Lanka, in other countries, of course, the cutoff is different, but the total score which is possible, there are 10 questions here. The total score is, the maximum score for each question is three. So the total score will be 30. And in Sri Lanka, the cutoff, which gives a good sensitivity and specificity is nine. So if somebody scores above nine, you have to refer the patient to a psychiatry unit. And that's very carefully done uh, by the public health midwives when the mother leaves the ward and is seen at home. However, if you find that you have some difficulty in identifying is this depression, is this something else, even during pregnancy and in early postpartum period, you can use the Edinburgh uh, postpartum depression scale. You can ask the mother to fill it and get an idea um, what are the problems in this mother and it might be easy for you because you can ask the mother to fill it and then you can quickly score it when you are busy working in a busy clinic and see if the mother really requires a psychiatry referral or not. What are the things that you can do as good practice in pregnancy and postpartum, in pregnant and postpartum mothers? Ask about their mental health in people who are having risk factors. For example, how are you doing? Are you sleeping okay? Um, are, you, are you coping okay with this situation? Do you have any fears, any worries, any anxieties? Just when you are clerking, just ask a few questions. Have you ever taken treatment for a psychiatric problem? Um, are there any problems at home? How is your husband? Uh, is he using any substances? Are you having any uh, economic problems? Where do you live? So all these questions that I asked would not take more than two to three minutes to screen. Uh, if there are any psychosocial problems, you need to support. So make sure that uh, uh, you, uh, you can make a referral yourself uh, to Mithurupias or some other organization, or you can support them yourself by, you know, maybe educating them, asking the partner to come and educating the partner about their, how they can support the mother. Always refer for a psychiatry opinion if you find that the mother has a past history of psychiatric illness. Because earlier, it used to be thought that pregnancy is a protective factor for psychiatric illness. But now we know, no, uh, actually, uh, uh, there is some risk of, you know, especially if the mother has a past history of psychiatric illness, there, it, there is a high risk that they might actually uh, suffer a relapse, particularly during the postpartum period, and particularly if the diagnosis is bipolar disorder. If the mother is currently on medication, then again, definitely make a psychiatry referral and uh, be vigilant in high risk mothers. We talked about the various risk factors. If you find any of these risk factors, make sure you screen their mental health. Once you identify somebody to have had a mental health problem, for example, maternity blues, um, uh, and if you find that, you know, the symptoms are not resolving, but still, you know, you need to be a little bit vigilant, uh, make sure that you call the public health midwife or the MOH of the area. At least make sure that you make a note in the antenatal record that this mother had these, these, these symptoms and maybe a psychiatric referral was done and the mother needs follow up because what happens is often when they go home, they get lost to follow up. And the PHM wouldn't know that they had this issue. And unless, you know, the, uh, the problems are detected by someone uh, till a very risky issue happens, the mother actually might go undetected. Very often, if you refer the mother to a psychiatry unit, they would actually call the public health midwife or the MOH and inform that this mother needs some extra care and support. And they will make a note that the mother needs to come for review in the psychiatry service. Uh, so these are the good practices. Um, what uh, I have one another question. What is the ideal time to perform the Edinburgh uh, postnatal depression scale in uh, mothers? 
uh, of course in primary health care they have identified various times so usually in one month definitely in two weeks and one month in the second and the third visits i think by the public health midwife the uh, uh, in imbara scale is done if however if you have any suspicions you can do that in at any time it doesn't matter uh, but remember you are better placed than a public health midwife to make a diagnosis of depression because uh, the uh, edinburgh uh, uh, depression scale is actually a screening tool um, some of these mothers who are scoring more than nine on the scale might be actually having psychosocial issues therefore you know they might be anxious or distressed so they might score higher but you as a clinician you as a doctor would be able to screen for the other depressive symptoms and make sure whether the patient is suffering from depression or not uh, the scale should be done if you find it difficult to screen a lot of patients uh, and do a clinical interview but if you have time to do a clinical interview then you can do the uh, diagnostic interview you can you know you can screen for depression and make sure uh, that the patient is either okay or is suffering from depression but uh, uh, if you find that you don't have time then it's always good to give the uh, screening tool and make sure that the patient doesn't score high on the screening tool okay uh, the last uh, slide actually so how do you prescribe in during pregnancy and postpartum antipsychotics the first generation and the second generation antipsychotics they hardly have been identified to have any teratogenic effects so they are fairly safe especially the first generation antipsychotics but risperidone and olanzapine which is freely available uh, in the government sector as second generation antipsychotics they also don't have any significant teratogenicity so you can safely prescribe during pregnancy and postpartum of course clozapine we don't start during pregnancy and postpartum but if a mother has been on clozapine then it's always good to refer the mother to a uh, psychiatry for a psychiatry review uh, if you find that uh, it's a female who is planning a pregnancy or if the mother is actually uh, pregnant at that time so are you because we prescribe clozapine for uh, patients with uh, resistant schizophrenia sometimes after a, a discussion with the psychiatrist they might actually uh, continue the clozapine uh, during the pregnancy but it depends individually and that individual decision must be made by a psychiatrist antidepressants the safest we know is sertraline and we know that fluoxetine also doesn't cause a lot of problems but we definitely know that paroxetine will cause various uh, uh, paracetamol is teratogenic and it will cause many cardiac malformations uh, the tricyclic antidepressants are fairly all right but you know both antipsychotics and antidepressants are associated with a higher incidence of spontaneous abortions and miscarriages lithium if a mother is on lithium first thing to do is refer to a psychiatrist and uh, you must know during internship that the lithium levels will fluctuate in different stages so the lithium level uh, will go down with the same dose with uh, uh, increased uh, retention of fluids and immediately postpartum if a mother is on lithium you know with the loss of volume uh, the mother can actually go into lithium toxicity and that's the time if a mother is on lithium you have to really hydrate the patient well and make sure the mother's lithium levels are done and the mother doesn't go into toxicity and uh, screen the child also for lithium levels and usually when a mother is on lithium these days uh, uh, we don't uh, advise them to breastfeed but it's not an absolute contraindication uh, there are times that you know due to certain difficulties mothers can actually be on lithium and continue to breastfeed Uh, there are different you know methods by which you can manage that if a mother is on sodium valproate definitely refer to a psychiatrist because you know the risk of uh, uh, malformations is you know risk of teratogenicity is very high 
Benzodiazepines, we avoid in pregnancy as much as possible because we know uh, there is a higher incidence of cleft lip and palate with benzodiazepines. And in postpartum period, you give a benzodiazepine, then the baby would be hypotonic and you know you would have breastfeeding issues. And therefore, uh, it's best avoided if the mother is actually breastfeeding. So those are the basic things regarding psychiatric medications. And now, I hope you remember that uh, uh, young mother who presented with uh, some anxiety, feeling as if you are confused, um, liability of mood, there were no poor sleep, there were no um, psychotic symptoms. It was a primary, um, uh, uh, it was her first pregnancy. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Please send me on chat and, uh, uh, and think about, you know, from what you have learned today, what is the best uh, management for this mother? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Madhubashini. Uh, there might be some more questions, uh, Madhu, uh, if you can just... Uh, over time. No, no, I gave you late, so that's okay. Sajeevana will hopefully be okay with it. Uh, there will be some more questions on the chat. If you can answer them, that will be great. And I think that's a very... Yeah. yeah. If you can type in the answer, that will be fine, Madhu. Yeah. Uh, if antipsychotics... Uh, no, so if you can, can you type in the answer, Madhu? I will type in the answers, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next topic, uh, which is on liaison uh, psychiatry. Very important topic, uh, uh, which will be done by uh, Dr. Sajeevan Amar Singh from the consultant psychiatrist at the National Institute of Mental Health, Angoda. Uh, over to you, Dr. Amar Singh. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Chandra. Can, can you increase the size, uh, make it a, a slideshow so it's a bit larger? Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Yeah, it to the bottom or? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Can't. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Chamara, for inviting me to do this lecture. And I would also like to thank Madhubashini for the kind words you said about uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and the Mother Baby Unit. Uh, I'm sure you are at the end of a long day. And um, fortunately, the, the colleagues who spoke before me have done most of my job. So I'm really left with very little to say. So I will uh, make this quick. Uh, and uh, so let's start off with, you know, the role, my, my topic was... Uh, liaison psychiatry and uh, so and what is the role of a uh, house officer and i'm sure in this lecture you know where you're working uh, as a house officer mostly in teaching hospitals base hospitals and general hospitals and you may come across many patients with psychological or psychiatric or mental health issues depression anxiety substance abuse dementia and of course this category of unexplained medical symptoms and I think especially in the non-teaching hospitals where there are no registrars it will be uh, mostly up to you as interns to pick these up and um, you know do the needful perhaps refer to the psychiatry team uh, or if the consultant or sometimes to a Medical Office of Mental Health in the case of base hospitals. So um, I will be, some of the topics have already been covered, but I will be talking about depression, anxiety, and also about unexplained medical symptoms. Substance abuse and dementia and organic issues are probably covered so far. Right. Right. But, but we also need to remember, those who have studied in Sri Lanka would know that some of the general hospitals and many of the base hospitals still don't have psychiatry wards. And also some of the psychiatry wards may not take direct admission. Sometimes they may take direct admission only during the daytime. So uh, many patients with serious psychiatric illnesses may present to your casualty wards. Right? 
and uh, although i mean now with many of you have done psychiatry uh in the final year diagnosing especially the, the patients with bipolar affective disorder or manic episodes schizophrenia may present uh, or drug induced psychosis may present to you and you may have to do the initial management i'm sure most of you are well equipped having done final year psychiatry but i think during the course of the day most of these would have been covered and especially emergency psychiatry management would be quite uh, useful and as of course you may have to the medical teams or this may have to initially exclude organic causes so all that has been covered so uh, let me move on uh, some of some of you but of course this is at the consultant level may not be at the house officers level you may have to seek psychiatric help you know some, sometimes patients may not have the capacity may be working in a surgical ward or maybe in a medical ward they, the, some of the patients may not have the capacity uh, to consent to medical and surgical treatment and they may be delusional or they may be demented or severely depressed learning disabled so that is another time where you may need to help seek the help of the psychiatric team but of course this kind of decision probably taken up at a higher level senior registrar consultant level and sometimes as an intern you may have you may have come across patients with social issues or homelessness right and in that situation you may need some support from from the social services sector and in that situation you may get the, uh, you can get the help of the psychiatric social workers who are working in the psychiatry unit so in that situation too you may um, you can get the support of the psychiatry unit but most of all uh, i will be talking about some of the common uh, not common to or not to common conditions that you might come across and when you talk of psychiatric illnesses one of the perhaps the commonest of the major psychiatric illnesses is depression and you know at least 15% of people will get depression sometime during our life and most of the patients with depression present to general practitioners to clinics and also many of the, many patients in your medical or surgical or obstetric wards or even pediatric wards may be having depression so as young house officers sometimes you are the one who has the most contact with the patient and it may be up to you to diagnose these patients and uh, get them help and most hospitals will have psychiatry in patient or at least an outpatient nowadays at the base hospital level even if they not have a inpatient unit they will have a outpatient team and definitely they will have a liaison team who will see your referrals now depression the classic i'm sure most of you who have done final year psychiatry would be familiar with the classical presentation of depression the low mood as you know It is not the ordinary sadness. There is a pervasive low mood lasting throughout the day, and not improving in pleasant events, and sometimes worse in the morning. And of course, the other classical symptoms reduce energy, loss of interest and enjoyment. If somebody has raised the hand, Tilini Nanayakar, want to say something? No, I think some of them accidentally do it. They'll type in the questions, Sajivan. All ah, right. I mean, you are you are welcome to stop me and ask, right, and also to interact. Yeah, if there are any questions, are there any questions so far? Camera, no, no, not yet. Uh, not yet, but uh, we'll take them at the end. Oh, okay, okay, right, right. So, uh, um, reduced energy, loss of interest and enjoyment. negative thoughts where you know everything becomes negative you feel full of pessimistic thoughts associated with low self esteem feeling guilty feeling that you are a burden to everybody then feeling hopeless hopeless and you know getting suicidal thoughts and of course poor memory or which is probably the result of poor attention and concentration now if everybody presents like the classical symptoms diagnosing of depression would be quite easy but unfortunately it's not so in addition of course um, they describe disturbed sleep 
the classic description, of course, is early morning wakening. You wake up about two, three hours earlier than usual and have depressive thoughts. And uh, then, of course, there's disturbed appetite and weight loss. But of course, you can get atypical symptoms. Sometimes the appetite may be increased in some people, or some people might present with increased sleep, but this is just going to be the classical presentation. But I, what I want to emphasize is that presentation can vary. And most patients don't have all the textbook symptoms. And especially the Sri Lankan patients are very reluctant to accept psychological symptoms. And, and many believe in Sri Lanka and that depression symptoms is a sign of weakness. And this is especially so among men. And um, they will not accept that they are depressed. And people might focus more on the somatic features. So they may come and talk of lack of sleep and they will not come up, you know, they might, they may be more likely to tell of things like lack of sleep or lack of appetite and lack of energy and loss of weight rather than the core depressive symptoms as they feel they're more acceptable and they may deny the psychological symptoms initially. So you may, you may have to be a little vigilant and um, try to um, uh, elicit these psychological symptoms. But of course, many present with somatic symptoms. I'm sure in your medical career, you come across people coming repeatedly with somatic symptoms. And some of them may be having underlying depression, headaches, sometimes uh, pain in the back, neck, shoulders, burning sensation all over the body, abdominal and chest discomfort, or gastritis as they might tell, constipation, fatigue, excessive worry about body function, excessively worrying about physical illnesses like cancer and HIV are some of the common presentations. And you need to have a high index of suspicion. And I think nowadays house officers are more equipped with their psychiatry training because I think during our time, people just ignored these patients or just thought that they were, you know, they were just lying and they, they, they were, medically there was nothing wrong with them. Right? So they were just discharged without any uh, further uh, clarifications, right? But I think nowadays the house officers and the doctors are more uh, knowledgeable about psychiatric conditions. So, of course, depression may also present with anxiety-related symptoms like panic attacks, phobias, and irritability, and obsessional thoughts and compulsions. So always look for underlying depression. And substance use, patients with substance use may have underlying depression. It's very common in alcohol dependence. Now, you may know that if you take depression, uh, it's more, more common in females than males. There are many reasons for that. And one of it is, of course, that many males are diagnosed as alcohol dependence rather than as depression. And so, of course, you can't diagnose, I'm sure the medical, you would have been taught in medical school, you cannot diagnose alcohol depression when the patient is intoxicated or in withdrawal. You know, you need to detox the patient and you need to assess your assess the mood. And especially in substance abuse and uh, alcohol dependence, the depression might be missed. And deliberate self-harm. As a house officer in a medical unit or in an you will become across so many patients with deliberate self-harm. I think it's better to always look for underlying depression. I'm sure I had a lecture on suicide and the details would have been told, but generally we have two kinds of in Sri Lanka. Uh, you get two, there are those who make impulsive suicidal attempts who probably do not have any underlying mental illness. And there are those who are quite seriously depressed, especially the older cohort, the older people and so they in these patients it is important to diagnose the underlying depression and refer for psychiatric help. So depression, the presentation of depression may differ in the elderly. They might come with either prominent psychomotor retardation when it might be quite easy to diagnose or 
they might come with agitation, what we call agitated depression. In that situation, sometimes you may think it is rather more psychotic than depressed. Uh, and also they may have very prominent somatic or hypochondriacal symptoms. So they may come about with fear of illness or with other somatic features. And another common presentation is pseudodementia, where the conspicuous difficulty in concentrating and remembering. It, is, it presents with poor memory, and, but the deficit here is mainly in attention and concentration. So in this situation, it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate from early dementia. And this might, of course, this needs specialist assessment. Depression can occur in children. I'm sure Dr. Dulangi would have covered this and the core symptoms are the same. The presentations may vary and children find it difficult to describe sadness and the mood may be predominantly irritable. And you know, one of the good indicators may be a recent deterioration in the child's school performance. The child may start putting temper tantrums and this may be an indication that there's underlying psychological disturbance, maybe depression, maybe some anxiety, right? And they also can present with headaches and somatic symptoms like abdominal pain, headaches, right? And also OCD symptoms and anxiety symptoms. I will not go into that too much. And of course, there can be milder depressions, which may not be obvious. The patient may not be obviously dejected and slowed, right? And that's what you call the mass depression or the smiling depression. The symptoms are there, but less intense. And the biological symptoms like poor appetite and weight loss and low libido may be absent. In addition, so most probably what they might say is irritability, fatigue and poor concentration may be prominent. And this may lead to a lot of conflicts at workplace, conflict in the family. And uh, if it goes undetected, uh, it will lead to complications. And of course, severe depressions, all the symptoms occur in greater severity. This would of course be, the diagnosis would be much easier to make. And their social and occupational decline and the patients might even neglect their food and hygiene. They may be psychomotor retarded and they may need immediate psychiatric attention. As you probably can remember, depression can occur with severe psychotic symptoms as well. And this is important because some of the psychotic symptoms, and I mean, you know, the, um, there will be mood congruent delusions and hallucinations of derogatory nature, but some of the psychotic symptoms might present to medical units, like they may be having hypochondriacal delusions where the patient is convinced that he's ill, right? Usually of something like an STD or cancer, and they may, uh, they may come to medical attention or surgical attention. And of course, the nihilistic delusions, where they believe that their bubbles are blocked or their internal organs are not working. So that kind of um, uh, nihilistic delusions may also present to medical units. So, and as I told you, depression can come with agitation, especially in the middle age and the elderly. And of course, the retarded depression, where there's extremely psychomotor retardation, and at the extreme end, the patient might be stuporous. So, the initial assessment of a depressive disorder will uh, consist of diagnosis, including the severity, including the suicidal risk, the causes, and the patient's so social resources. And of course, the effect on other people. So the severity and the, the, the setting of the management would depend on the severity of the illness as well as the patient's social resources, the risk factors like risk of suicide and the risk of physical health and risk to dependent. I have not, now I'm not going to describe the management of depression or antidepressants in my presentation. Uh, but of course, if there are questions, I'm more than happy to talk about it, but I thought I will not unduly uh, prolong it by discussing the management. So, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Then we move on to another common 
there is the anxiety disorders. And um, uh, of course, there are three types of anxiety disorders. The generalized anxiety disorders, where the anxiety is continuous, of course, may fluctuate in intensity. And uh, the phobic anxiety disorders, where the anxiety is intermittent, especially occurring in particular circumstances, and panic disorder. Again, the anxiety is intermittent, but unrelated to any circumstances. And I think when it comes to liaison psychiatry, the generalized anxiety and the panic disorder may be probably of interest to you all. So in anxiety disorders, the, the patients commonly focus on the physical symptoms and may present to medical clinics and emergency departments. And now these are the psychological symptoms like fearful anticipation, irritability, sensitivity, noise, restlessness, poor concentration and worrying thoughts. But more than that, anxiety disorders can have a wide range of physical symptoms like dry mouth, difficulty in swallowing, epigastric discomfort, excessive wind and frequent or loose motions, respiratory constriction and difficulty in inflation, cardiovascular symptoms like palpitations and chest discomfort, the urinary symptoms, frequent urgent micturition, erectile failure and menstrual discomfort, muscle tension, leading to tremors, headaches, aching muscles where the patients complain of body aches, hyperventilations, ventilation with the result in dizziness and tinging of the extremities, feeling breathless, and uh, sleep disturbances, insomnia, and night terrors. And this, especially this hyperventilation, anxiety leading to hyperventilation, is becoming a very much concerned because of the fears of COVID and pneumonia, so just uh, lead a lot of people to become extremely worried. So generalized anxiety disorder, the symptoms are persistent and not restricted to any circumstances. And the characteristic by kind of a worry and apprehension. The worry is more prolonged than in healthy people. The worry is a widespread nature, not focused on a particular issue. And they find it very difficult to control the worries. And of course, they're psychologically aroused, irritable, concentration is poor, they're sensitive to noise, and because of the poor concentration, they may always complain of poor memory. So especially when the young people come and talk to you, tell you that their memory is poor, and that they can't study as well as they used to, and that they, can, they can't remember, their brain is not working as well as they used to. One of the commonest reasons is poor concentration, either due to anxiety or mild depression. And the sleep disturbances in generalized anxiety is usually different from depression. We have the difficulty in falling asleep and leading to persistent worrying and also they can play up intermittent, unrefreshing sleep and un unpleasant dreams. Of course, these anxiety and depression in real life, sometimes they're not as neatly compartmentalized as they are in the textbooks. They might come together. You may get depressive symptoms, you may get obsessive symptoms in these patients. And phobic anxiety disorder is something that occurs on these specific circumstances, avoidance, and associated avoidance and anticipatory anxiety. The common examples being social phobia, agoraphobia, or specific phobias. I will not go that much into it because the chances of fine, I mean, presenting them in medical units uh, in, your, in the medical or surgical setup is not that high. Uh, and panic disorder, you get, you get the sudden attacks of anxiety with physical symptoms predominate and fear of serious medical consequences. And this will be quite common presentation at medical casualties. Patients come with shortness of breath, choking, sensations, palpitations, chest comfort, discomfort of pain, sweating, dizziness, unsteady feeling of faintness, nausea or abdominal distress, depersonalization or derealization, where you feel that you are not your own person, derealization, numbness and tingling sensation. In addition, you can get trembling, flushing, fear of dying, or sometimes fear of going out of control or fear of going crazy. So that's why they describe these things. And in this situation, 
the attack occurring suddenly and they might occur recurrently. And in this situation, I obviously will have to do your basic medical things like pulse or maybe an ECG. And then I think psychoeducation, education of the patient plays a big role in panic disorder. So um, telling the patient that what they're having is actually not a heart attack. And that uh, once the patient learns exactly what is happening, his fear and anxiety reduce. So it's, it's like a vicious cycle. The patient starts, you know, the patient starts getting palpitations. Then he starts thinking that it's going to be a heart attack. If then the anxiety increases more, the palpitation increases more, right? So in that situation, explain to the patient that our mind and that our brain and our body are connected and sometimes fear and anxiety can cause physical symptoms like palpitations or hyperventilation and uh, and also explain to the patient and you know discuss with the patient what happened you know, the patient can tell that this would have happened so many times and nothing nothing bad has happened all the time right so if you if the, once the patient learns that this is no longer a heart attack and you know the patient understands that uh, the anxiety uh, can be controlled to a great extent. Of course, this needs um, psychiatric referral and also certain organic conditions like thyrotoxicosis or um, hormonal issues, other hormonal issues, cardiac problems, they need to be excluded. And um, once that is done, uh, we can refer them perhaps as outpatients to psychiatry units. And um, finally, I come up to another important uh, thing of patients with unexplained medical symptoms. Now, many patients repeatedly present with physical symptoms without any medical cause. And they may not have, as I told you earlier, some of them, of course, may be depressed or anxious, anxious, but some of these patients may not have any obvious depressive or anxiety disorders. But many will have underlying psychological or social issues. How do they handle these patients? I know in a BC medical clinic or a BC medical ward, and uh, you may actually become irritable with these people, right? But we need to understand that most of these symptoms occur because they are not, many or most of them are not malingering or lying. They, these symptoms arise from misinterpretation of normal bodily sensations as signs of disease. So they, for example, palpitation or normal heartbeat or the heartbeat just a little high or a little bit of pain in the chest, they will misinterpret as a sign of a heart attack. And this increased concern leads to increased attention. And that leads to increased apprehension and anxiety. And that leads to the maintenance of symptoms. So this over concern, paying over attention. Now, even any of us, if we really pay attention as you sit here and listen to this computer, I'm sure if you pay attention, there are pain in several areas of your body, but we ignore it, right? But if you keep paying attention to that pain, if you keep paying attention, that becomes a huge issue. And if you become anxious about it, then it becomes even worse. So some of the body sensations that are commonly misinterpreted are like sinus tachycardia or some benign arrhythmias, fatigue, and, uh, and nowadays, especially this post-viral fatigue, right? Which could be quite common with the virus infection. Um, autonomic symptoms of anxiety, effects of overeating, effects of prolonged inactivity or effects of lack of sleep. All these may lead to little, little physical symptoms, physical sensations that the patient uh, might misinterpret as signs of severe illness. So how do we handle these patients who repeatedly come with physical symptoms and all your x-rays and ESRs and CRPs and full blood counts, everything is normal, and but they keep coming. And how, you know, how what do we do with them? Well, an, an adequate medical assessment has to be done as usual an adequate medical assessment should be done and a clear explanation given to the patient that what were the results of the investigations, why they were done, and why do you think that there is no medical cause, right? 
So that explanation is quite important to the patient because otherwise the patient will not know. He will say, ah, Dr. Ava, and after one day I was discharged and sent home. So, and also we need to dis uh, explain it in a way that the patient can understand. But we also need to accept that the physical symptoms are real and that we should look for other causes. And don't, and the worst thing you can say is that you have no illness. So then you have no illness. And then the patient will think the doctor did not understand me, right? So you need to empathize. You need to accept that he has some real physical symptoms. Although there may not be a physical explanation for these symptoms. And we may try to explain the role of psychological factors in these medical illnesses. Now, what you need to know, I am going into the management in this case, is that what you, referring these patients to psychiatrists is going to be very difficult. Right? Many of them, at least initially, will not accept a psychiatric referral. So at the primary care level, you do have the, some of, you can try to help them. So we need to quietly get into their minds that these symptoms may be due to some psychological uh, issue. So that's what we try to call the broaden the agenda. Discuss the possibility of a psychological explanation for these symptoms. You know, and then we may gently probe the patient to see whether you have any psychological problems. Right? And, uh, and sometimes patients may come out with it. And, um, and you may be sometimes by just listening to them or simple problem solving, supportive psychotherapy or counseling, you might be able to help them to some extent. And if they are, and then at that time, you might be in a better position to refer them to a psychiatrist or a professional in the uh, psychiatrist uh, clinic. And definitely the chronic and the recurrent patient, we need to try to offer psychiatric referrals difficult to get them down. But of course, in a general hospital, the advantage is you can always get the psychiatry um, registrar or the MO to come and see the patient. So in that situation, um, it's easier. So especially when it's inpatient, it'd be probably easier because the, you can get the patient uh, seen by the psychiatry team because sometimes the patient may not voluntarily go. So at least try to refer them at least once because then the psychiatry um, team can make a build a rapport with them and try to do something for them. So I will uh, stop here for there are some other rare conditions that I did not touch on. I will stop here. I think I have stopped a little ahead of my time, but I'm willing to answer any questions or any particular thing that they want to talk about. Okay. Chama, are there any questions? There was a question in the chat. Uh, just trying to find it. Something happened to my. Ah yeah. Yeah. Can you find that? Yeah, I can't. Something. Ah, you have explained what lies in psychiatry. Is. Yeah, I did that. There was one more thing. Mm. Mm. No, that's all. No, I can't find anything. Okay. One second. If you can find anything, you can ask. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's all. Yeah. Uh, Sajivna, just uh, one more thing. I think uh, as an intern, uh, you mentioned panic attacks. Uh, <clears throat> practically, if they're coming and uh, let's say somebody comes with a panic attack, exactly how do you manage it? And also if once you give them a diagnosis that this is not cardiac, they sometimes go to other doctors not believing it. How would you deal with such a situation? And what would you tell the patient and the family? Right. I think uh, educating of the patient and the family is quite important. As I said, I think we need to explain to them the vicious cycle that happens in the panic attack. And, uh, and once... Uh, uh, the, explain to the family that this uh, the patient the symptoms are due to anxiety or in simple way that this is stress and that the, the beating heart the palpitations the hyperventilation and all that occurs due to 
to the psychological cause and they are not a heart disease or a lung disease or a respiratory disease and um, and try to initiate uh, i think you can start medication itself if maybe with your help of your seniors or uh, something of a short term maybe short term benzodiazepines not in the long term but i think uh, in the long run they need to be referred to a psychiatrist and i think the treatment would be um, in the long term the treatment for pharmacological treatment would be uh, uh, at least a low dose ben- uh, ssri probably something like sertraline or fluoxetine because benzodiazepines will probably be good only in the short run if you give benzodiazepines in the long term it will probably lead to uh, dependence and other issues so ssris uh, especially sertraline at 25 or 50 would be useful to uh, reduce this of, of course uh, if it is coming to a panic disorder level i think it's better to have a psychiatric referral and uh, allow the psychiatric team to take over so yeah okay right thank you so we've finished right on time at 3 uh, uh, if you all have any questions uh, you all can ask uh, us uh, yeah, somebody has asked by somatic symptoms in depression Oh yeah that's the question yeah yeah yes i couldn't find it right i mean you can get uh, i mean people in depression might get um, the symptoms like they might come with symptoms like body aches and right headache things like that and um, so they may not they do actually get such maybe due to muscle anxiety and muscle tension burning sensations so they come with such symptoms and um, and rather than uh, telling the depressive symptoms they might focus on those symptoms and then we need to understand and uh, see whether they have underlying depression i think that was what i meant by this uh, somatic symptoms right okay thank you very much uh, dr amara singh uh, so we've come to the end of the session uh, if you all have i mean anything else that you all know you all can contact us uh and we'll be happy to help you uh right and all the best for your careers uh it will uh, definitely be the start of a long and successful journey and hopefully uh we can be we will be colleagues soon uh and uh all the best thank you